The Code of Honor, or Rules for the Government of Principles and Seconds in Dueling, by John Lyde Wilson. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne. The Code of Honor, or Rules for the Government of Principles and Seconds in Dueling, by John Lyde Wilson. Chapter 1. The Person Insulted, Before Challenge Sent. 1. Whenever you believe that you are insulted, if the insult be in public and by words or behavior, never resent it there, if you have self-command enough to avoid noticing it. If resented there, you offer an indignity to the company, which you should not. 2. If the insult be by blows or any personal indignity, it may be resented at the moment, for insult to the company did not originate with you. But although resented at the moment, you are bound still to have satisfaction, and must therefore make the demand. 3. When you believe yourself aggrieved, be silent on the subject. Speak to no one about the matter, and see your friend, who is to act for you, as soon as possible. 4. Never send a challenge in the first instance, for that precludes all negotiation. Let your note be in the language of a gentleman, and let the subject matter of complaint be truly and fairly set forth, cautiously avoiding attributing to the adverse party any improper motive. 5. When your second is in full possession of the facts, leave the whole matter to his judgment, and avoid any consultation with him unless he seeks it. He has the custody of your honor, and by obeying him you cannot be compromitted. 6. Let the time of demand upon your adversary after the insult be as short as possible for he has the right to double that time in replying to you, unless you give him some good reason for your delay. Each party is entitled to reasonable time, to make necessary domestic arrangements, by will or otherwise, before fighting. 7. To a written communication you are entitled to a written reply, and it is the business of your friend to require it. Second's duty before challenge sent. 1. Whenever you are applied to by a friend to act as his second, before you agree to do so, state distinctly to your principal that you will be governed only by your own judgment, that he will not be consulted after you are in full possession of the facts, unless it becomes necessary to make, or accept, the amende honorable, or send a challenge. You are supposed to be cool and collected, and your friend's feelings are more or less irritated. 2. Use every effort to soothe and tranquilize your principal. Do not see things in the same aggravated light in which he views them. Extenuate the conduct of his adversary whenever you see clearly an opportunity to do so, without doing violence to your friend's irritated mind. Endeavor to persuade him that there must have been some misunderstanding in the matter. Check him if he uses opprobrious epithet toward his adversary, and never permit improper or insulting words in the note you carry. 3. To the note you carry in writing to the party complained of, you are entitled to a written answer, which will be directed to your principal and will be delivered to you by his adversary's friend. If this not be written in the style of a gentleman, refuse to receive it, and assign your reason for such refusal. If there be a question made as to the character of the note, require the second presenting it to you, who considers it respectful, to endorse upon it these words. I consider the note of my friend respectful, and would not have been the bearer of it if I believed otherwise. 4. If the party called on refuses to receive the note you bear, 
you are entitled to demand a reason for such refusal. If he refuses to give you any reason, and persists in such refusal, he treats, not only your friend, but yourself, with indignity, and you must then make yourself the actor, by sending a respectful note, requiring a proper explanation of the course he has pursued towards you and your friend. And if he still adheres to his determination, you are to challenge or post him. 5. If the person to whom you deliver the note of your friend declines meeting him on the ground of inequality, you are bound to tender yourself in his stead, by a note directed to him from yourself, and if he refuses to meet you, you are to post him. 6. In all cases of the substitution of the second for the principal, the seconds should interpose and adjust the matter, if the party substituting avows he does not make the quarrel of his principal his own. The reason for substitution is the supposed insult of imputing to you the like inequality which, if charged upon your friend. And when the contrary is declared, there should be no fight, for individuals may well differ in their estimate of an individual's character and standing in society. In case of substitution and a satisfactory arrangement, you are then to inform your friend of all the facts, whose duty it will be to post in person. 7. If the party to whom you present a note employ a son, father, or brother as a second, you may decline acting with either on the ground of consanguinity. 8. If a minor wishes you to take a note to an adult, decline doing so, on the ground of his minority. But if the adult complained of, had made a companion of the minor in society, you may bear the note. 9. When an accommodation is tendered, never require too much, and if the party offering the amende honorable wishes to give a reason for his conduct in the matter, do not, unless offensive to your friend, refuse to receive it. By so doing you may heal the breach more effectually. 10. If a stranger wishes you to bear a note for him, be well satisfied before you do so, that he is on an equality with you, and in presenting the note state to the party the relationship you stand towards him, and what you know and believe about him. For strangers are entitled to redress for wrongs, as well as others, and the rules of honor and hospitality should protect him. CHAPTER Two, THE PARTY RECEIVING A NOTE BEFORE CHALLENGE 1. When a note is presented to you by an equal, receive it, and read it, although you may suppose it to be from one you do not intend to meet, because its requisites may be of a character which may readily be complied with. But if the requirements of a note cannot be acceded to, return it, through the medium of your friend, to the person who handed it to you, with your reason for returning it. 2. If the note received be in abusive terms, object to its reception, and return it for that reason. But if it be respectful, return an answer of the same character, in which respond correctly and openly to all interrogatories fairly propounded, and hand it to your friend, who, it is presumed, you have consulted, and who has advised the answer. Direct it to the opposite party, and let it be delivered to his friend. 3. You may refuse to receive a note from a minor, if you have not made an associate of him, one that has been posted, one that has been publicly disgraced without resenting it, one whose occupation is unlawful, a man in his dotage, and a lunatic. There may be other cases, but the character of those enumerated will lead to a correct decision upon those omitted. If you receive a note from a stranger, you have a right to a reasonable time to ascertain his standing in society, unless he is fully vouched for by his friend. 4. If a party delays calling on you for a week or more after the supposed insult, and assigns no cause for the delay, if you require it, you may double the time before you respond to him, for the wrong cannot be considered aggravated, if borne patiently for some days, and the time may have been used in preparation and practice. 
Second's duty of the party receiving a note before challenge sent. 1. When consulted by your friend, who has received a note requiring explanation, inform him distinctly that he must be governed wholly by you in the progress of the dispute. If he refuses, decline to act on that ground. 2. Use your utmost efforts to allay all excitement which your principal may labor under. Search diligently into the origin of the misunderstanding, for gentlemen seldom insult each other unless they labor under some misapprehension or mistake. And when you have discovered the original ground or error, follow each movement to the time of sending the note, and harmony will be restored. 3. When your principal refuses to do what you require of him, decline further acting on that ground, and inform the opposing second of your withdrawal from the negotiation. Chapter 3. Duty of a Challenger and His Second Before Fighting 1. After all efforts for reconciliation are over, the party aggrieved sends a challenge to his adversary, which is delivered to his second. 2. Upon acceptance of the challenge, the seconds make necessary arrangements for the meeting, in which each party is entitled to perfect equality. The old notion that the party challenged was authorized to name the time, place, distance, and weapon has been long since exploded. Nor would a man of chivalric honor use such a right if he possessed it. The time must be as soon as practicable, the place such as ordinarily has been used where the parties are, the distance usual, and the weapons that which is most generally used, which, in this state, is the pistol. 3. If the challengee insist upon what is not usual in time, place, distance, and weapon, do not yield the point, and tender in writing what is usual in each, and if he refuses to give satisfaction, then your friend may post him. 4. If your friend be determined to fight and not post, you have the right to withdraw. But if you continue to act and have the right to tender still more deadly distance and weapon, he must accept. 5. The usual distance is from 10 to 20 paces, as may be agreed on, and the seconds in measuring the ground usually step 3 feet. 6. After all the arrangements are made, the seconds determine the giving of the word and position by lot, and he who gains has choice of one or the other, and selects whether it be the word or the position, but he cannot have both. Chapter 4. Duty of a Challengee and Second After Challenge Sent 1. The challengee has no option when negotiation has ceased but to accept the challenge. 2. The second makes the necessary arrangements with the second of the person challenging. The arrangements are detailed in the preceding chapter. Chapter 5. Duty of Principles and Seconds on the Ground 1. The principles are to be respectful in meeting and neither by look or expression irritate each other. They are to be wholly passive, being entirely under the guidance of their seconds. 2. When once posted, they are not to quit their positions under any circumstances, without leave or direction of their seconds. 3. When the principals are posted, the second giving the word must tell them to stand firm until he repeats the giving of the word in the manner it will be given when the parties are at liberty to fire. 4. Each second has a loaded pistol, in order to enforce a fair combat according to the rules agreed on, and if a principal fires before the word or time agreed on, he is at liberty to fire at him, and if such seconds principal fall, it is his duty to do so. 5. If after a fire either party be touched, the duel is to end, and no second is excusable who permits a wounded friend to fight, and no second who knows his duty will permit his friend to fight a man already hit. 
I am aware that there have been many instances where a contest has continued, not only after slight, but severe wounds have been received. In all such cases, I think the seconds are blamable. 6. If after an exchange of shots, neither party be hit, it is the duty of the second of the challengee to approach the second of the challenger and say, Our friends have exchanged shots. Are you satisfied, or is there any cause why the contest should be continued? If the meeting be of no serious cause of complaint, where the party complaining had in no way been deeply injured or grossly insulted, the second of the party challenging should reply, The point of honor being settled, there can, I conceive, be no objection to a reconciliation, and I propose that our principles meet on middle ground, shake hands, and be friends. If this be acceded to by the second of the challengee, the second of the party challenging says, We have agreed that the present duel shall cease. The honor of each of you is preserved, and you will meet on middle ground, shake hands, and be reconciled. 7. If the insult be of a serious character, it will be the duty of the second of the challenger to say, in reply to the second of the challengee, We have been deeply wronged, and if you are not disposed to repair the injury, the contest must continue. And if the challengee offers nothing by way of reparation, the fight continues until one or the other of the principals is hit. 8. In cases where the contest is ended by the seconds, as mentioned in the sixth rule of this chapter, the parties refuse to meet and be reconciled. It is the duty of the seconds to withdraw from the field, informing their principals that the contest must be continued under the superintendence of other friends. But if one agrees to this arrangement of the seconds, and the other does not, the second of the disagreeing principle only withdraws. 9. If either principle on the ground refuses to fight, or continue to fight when required, it is the duty of his second to say to the other second, I have come upon the ground with a coward, and do tender you my apology for an ignorance of his character. You are at liberty to post him. The second, by such conduct, stands excused to the opposite party. 10. When the duel is ended by a party being hit, it is the duty of the second to the party so hit to announce the fact to the second of the party hitting, who will forthwith tender any assistance he can command to the disabled principal. If the party challenging hit the challengee, it is his duty to say he is satisfied and will leave the ground. If the challenger be hit, upon the challengee being informed of it, he should ask through his second whether he is at liberty to leave the ground, which should be assented to. Chapter 6. Who Should Be on the Ground? 1. The principals, seconds, one surgeon, and one assistant surgeon to each principal, but the assistant surgeon may be dispensed with. 2. Any number of friends that the seconds agree on may be present, provided they do not come within the degrees of consanguinity mentioned in the seventh rule of chapter 1, 3. Persons admitted on the ground are carefully to abstain by word or behavior from any act that might be the least exceptionable, nor should they stand near the principals or seconds, or hold conversations with them. CHAPTER Seven, ARMS AND MANNER OF LOADING AND PRESENTING THEM 1. The arms used should be smooth-bore pistols, not exceeding nine inches in length, with flint and steel. Percussion pistols may be mutually used if agreed on, but to object on that account is lawful. 2. Each second informs the other when he is about to load, and invites his presence. But the seconds rarely attend on such invitation, as gentlemen may be safely trusted in the matter. 3. The second, in presenting the pistol to his friend, should never put it in his pistol hand, but should place it in the other, which is grasped midway the barrel, with muzzle pointing in the contrary way to that which he is to fire 
informing him that his pistol is loaded and ready for use. Before the word is given, the principal grasps the butt firmly in his pistol hand and brings it round, with the muzzle downward, to the fighting position. 4. The fighting position is with the muzzle down and the barrel from you, for although it may be agreed that you may hold your pistol with the muzzle up, it may be objected to, as you can fire sooner from that position, and consequently have a decided advantage, which ought not to be claimed, and should not be granted. CHAPTER Eight, THE DEGREES OF INSULT, AND HOW COMPROMISED 1. The prevailing rule is, that words used in retort, although more violent and disrespectful than those first used, will not satisfy, words being no satisfaction for words. 2. When words are used, and a blow given in return, the insult is avenged, and if redress be sought, it must be from the person receiving the blow. 3. When blows are given in the first instance and not returned, the person first striking be badly beaten or otherwise, the party first struck is to make the demand, for blows do not satisfy a blow. 4. Insults at a wine-table, when the company are over-excited, must be answered for, and if the party insulting have no recollection of the insult, it is his duty to say so in writing, and negative the insult. For instance, if the man say, You are a liar and no gentleman, he must, in addition to the plea of the want of recollection, say, I believe the party insulted to be a man of the strictest veracity and a gentleman. 5. Intoxication is not a full excuse for insult, but it will greatly palliate. If it was a full excuse, it might well be counterfeited to wound feelings or destroy character. 6. In all cases of intoxication, the seconds must use sound discretion under the above general rules. 7. Can every insult be compromised? is a mooted and vexed question. On this subject, no rules can be given that will be satisfactory. The old opinion, that a blow must require blood, is not a force. Blows may be compromised in many cases. What those are, much depends on the seconds. Appendix Since the above code was in press, a friend has favored me with the Irish Code of Honor, which I had never seen and it is published as an appendix to it. One thing must be apparent to every reader, viz., the marked amelioration of the rules that govern in dueling at the present time. I am unable to say what code exists now in Ireland, but I very much doubt whether it be of the same character which it bore in 1777. The American Quarterly Review for September 1824 in a notice of Sir Jonah Barrington's history of his own times, has published this code, and followed it up with some remarks, which I have thought proper to insert also. The grave reviewer has spoken of certain states, in terms so unlike a gentleman, that I would advise him to look at home, and say whether he does not think that the manners of his own countrymen do not require great amendment. I am very sure that the citizens of the states, so disrespectfully spoken of, would feel deep humiliation to be compelled to exchange their urbanity of deportment for the uncouth incivility of the people of Massachusetts. Look at their public journals, and you will find them, very generally, teeming with abuse of private character, which would not be countenanced here. The idea of New England becoming a school for manners is about as fanciful as Bolingbroke's idea of a patriot king. I like their fortiter in re, but utterly eschew their savatier in modo. The practice of dueling and points of honor settled at Clomnell Summer Assizes, 1777, by the gentlemen delegates of Tipperary, Galway, Mayo, Sligo, and Roscommon, and prescribed for general adoption throughout Ireland. Rule 1. The first offense requires the apology although the retort may have been more offensive than the insult. Example. 
A tells B he is impertinent, etc. B retorts that he lies. Yet A must make the first apology, because he gave the first offense. And then, after one fire, B may explain away the retort by subsequent apology. Rule 2. But if the parties would rather fight on, then, after two shots each, but in no case before, B may explain first, and A apologize after. Rule 3. If a doubt exists who gave the first offense, the decision rests with the seconds. If they won't decide or can't agree, the matter must proceed to two shots, or a hit, if the challenger requires it. Rule 4. When the lie direct is the first offense, the aggressor must either beg pardon in express terms, exchange two shots previous to apology, or three shots followed up by explanation, or fire on till a severe hit be received by one party or the other. Rule 5. As a blow is strictly prohibited under any circumstances among gentlemen, no verbal apology can be received for such an insult. The alternatives, therefore, are the offender handing a cane to the injured party to be used on his own back, at the same time begging pardon, firing on until one or both is disabled, or exchanging three shots and then asking pardon without the proffer of the cane. If swords are used, the parties engage till one is well-blooded, disabled, or disarmed, or until, after receiving a wound and blood being drawn, the aggressor begs pardon. N.B. A disarm is considered the same as a disable. The disarmer may, strictly, break his adversary's sword. But if it be the challenger who is disarmed, it is considered ungenerous to do so. In case the challenger be disarmed and refuses to ask pardon or atone, he must not be killed as formerly. But the challenger may lay his sword on the aggressor's shoulders, then break the aggressor's sword, and say, I spare your life. The challenge can never revive the quarrel. The challenger may. Rule 6. If A give B the lie, and B retorts by a blow, being the two greatest offenses, no reconciliation can take place until after two discharges each, or severe hit, after which B may beg A's pardon for the blow, and then A may explain simply for the lie, because a blow is never allowable, and the offense of the lie therefore merges into it. See preceding rule. N.B. Challenges for individual causes may be reconciled on the ground after one shot. An explanation, or the slightest hit, should be sufficient in such cases, because no personal offense transpired. Rule 7. But no apology can be received, in any case, after the parties have actually taken their ground, without exchange of fires. Rule 8. In the above case, no challenger is obliged to divulge the cause of his challenge, if private, unless required by the challenged to do so before their meeting. Rule 9. All imputations of cheating at play, races, etc., to be considered equivalent to a blow, but may be reconciled after one shot, on admitting their falsehood and begging pardon publicly. Rule 10. Any insult to a lady under a gentleman's care or protection to be considered as, by one degree, a greater offense than if given to the gentleman personally, and to be regulated accordingly. Rule 11. Offenses originating or accruing from the support of a lady's reputation to be considered as less unjustifiable than any other of the same class, and as admitting of lighter apologies by the aggressor. This is to be determined by the circumstances of the case, but always favorable to the lady. Rule 12. In simple unpremeditated rencontre with a small sword, or contu de chasse, the rule is, first draw, first sheath, unless blood be drawn, then both sheath, and proceed to investigation. Rule 11. No dumb shooting or firing in the air, admissible in any case. The challenger ought not to have challenged without receiving offense, 
and the challenged ought, if he gave offence, to have made an apology before he came on the ground. Therefore, children's play must be dishonourable on one side or the other, and is accordingly prohibited. Rule 14. Seconds to be of equal rank in society with the principles they attend, inasmuch as a second may choose or chance to become a principal, and equality is indispensable. Rule 15. Challenges are never to be delivered at night, unless the party to be challenged intend leaving the place of offence before morning, for it is desirable to avoid all hot-headed proceedings. Rule 16. The challenged has the right to choose his own weapon, unless the challenger gives his honour he is no swordsman, after which, however, he cannot decline any second species of weapon proposed by the challenged. Rule 17. The challenged chooses his ground, the challenger chooses his distance, the seconds fix the time and terms of firing. Rule 18. The seconds load in presence of each other, unless they give their mutual honours, that they have charged smooth and single, which should be held sufficient. Rule 19. Firing may be regulated, first by signal, secondly by word of command, or thirdly at pleasure, as may be agreeable to the parties. In the latter case the parties may fire at their reasonable leisure, but second presents and rests are strictly prohibited. Rule 20. In all cases a misfire is equivalent to a shot, and a snap or a non-cock is to be considered a misfire. Rule 21. Seconds are bound to attempt a reconciliation before the meeting takes place, or after sufficient firing or hits, as specified. Rule 22. Any wound sufficient to agitate the nerves and necessarily make the hand shake must end the business for that day. Rule 23. If the cause of meeting be of such nature that no apology or explanation can or will be received, the challenged takes his ground, and calls on the challenger to proceed as he chooses. In such cases firing at pleasure is the usual practice, but may be varied by agreement. Rule 24. In slight cases the second hands his principal but one pistol, but in gross cases two, holding another case ready charged in reserve. Rule 25. When seconds disagree, and resolve to exchange shots themselves, it must be at the same time, and at right angles, with their principles. If swords, side by side, at five paces interval. N.B. All matters and doubts not herein mentioned will be explained and cleared up by application to the committee, who meet alternately at Clonmel and Galway at their quarter sessions for the purpose. Crow Ryan, President. James Keogh. Amby Bodkin, Secretaries. Additional Galway Articles. Rule 1. No party can be allowed to bend his knee or cover his side with his left hand, but may present at any level from the hip to the eye. Rule 2. One can neither advance nor retreat if the ground be measured. If the ground be unmeasured, either party may advance at pleasure, even to touch muzzle, but neither can advance on his adversary after the fire, unless his adversary step forward on him. The seconds stand responsible for this last rule being strictly observed. Bad cases have accrued from neglecting it. This precise and enlightened digest was rendered necessary by the multitude of quarrels that arouse without sufficient dignified provocation. The point of honor men require a uniform government, and the code thus formed was disseminated throughout the island, with directions that it should be strictly observed by all gentlemen and kept in their pistol cases. The rules, with some others, were commonly styled the Thirty-Six Commandments, and, according to the author, have been much acted upon down to the present day. Tipperary and Galway were the chief schools of dueling. We remember to have heard, in travelling to the town of the former name in a stagecoach, a dispute between two Irish companions, on the point, 
which was the most gentlemanly county in all Ireland, Tipperary or Galway, and both laid great stress upon the relative dueling merits of these counties. By the same criterion, Tennessee, Kentucky, Georgia, and South Carolina would bear away the palm of gentility among the states of the Union. End of the Code of Honor or Rules for the Government of Principles and Seconds in Dueling by John Lyde Wilson Recorded by Marianne Spiegel, Elmhurst, Illinois, August 1, 2011Part 1 of U.S. Copyright Renewals, 1973, July to December. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. U.S. Copyright Renewals, 1973, July to December, by the U.S. Copyright Office. Renewal Registrations a list of books, pamphlets, serials, and contributions to periodicals for which renewal registrations were made during the period covered by this issue. Arrangement is by registration number. As renewal registrations are numbered continuously for all classes, there will be breaks in the sequence for any given type of material. Information relating to both the original and the renewal registration is included in each entry. R554644 War Injuries of the Extremities by Paul W. Roeder Copyright 20 July 45 AA488754 Seba Geige Corporation PWH 25 June 73 R554644 R554645 Major Pathology of the Small Intestine by Paul W. Roeder Copyright 20 August 45 AA 490935 Seba Geige Corporation PWH 25 June 73 R554645 R554655 Landlords and Farmers in the Hudson Mohawk Region 1790 to 1850 by David Maldwin Ellis copyright 20 June 46 a 4812 David Maldwin Ellis a 28 June 73 r 554655 r 554687 your personal plane by John Paul Andrews introduction by Henry a Wallace Illustrated by Robert Lindgren. Copyright 25 July 45. A188945. John Paul Andrews, A. 27 June 73. R554687. R554688. History in the Writing. Edited by Gordon Carroll, Richard de Rochemont, Stephen Laird. Aldridge, Johnston, and Wow, N.M. Compilation in New Matter. Copyright, 25 July, 45. A. 189389. Time Incorporated, P.C.W. 27 June, 73. R. 554688. R. 554692. Mad with Much Heart by Gerald Butler. U.S. Edition Publication, 22 August, 46, A5455, Copyright, 28 June, 45, AI29090, Gerald Butler, A, 28 June, 73, R554692, A Registration Entered Under British Proclamation of 10 March, 44, R554697, A Little Treasury of Modern Poetry, English and American, by Oscar Williams. Copyright 24 June 46, A6967. Strephon Williams, C. 28 June 73, R554697. 
are five five four six nine eight the heart has reasons by nona coxhead copyright twenty four june forty six a five two zero five nona coxhead a twenty seven june seventy three R five five four six nine eight R five five four seven one four Verse La Quatrime Republique by Francois de Menthon Copyright fourteen march forty six AF one two nine four Francois de Menthon A twenty eight june seventy three R five five four seven one four R five five four seven one five Le producteur de Le, guide du contrôle latier et bourrier, par André Max Leroy, Jacqueline Sentex and Rodolphe Stokel, copyright 21 February 46, AF 1301, André Max Leroy A, 28 June 73, R554715, R554716, Kitchener, Maréchal d'Empire Britannique, by Léon Le Monnier, copyright 14 March 46, AF 1438, Madame Le Monnier, née René Legrand, W, and Alice Le Monnier, C, 28 June 73, R554716, R554716, 5517, La France Bourgeoisie, Dix huitem victiem cycles, par Charles Maras, preface de Lucien Fevre, copyright 8 April 46, AF 2001, Charles Maras A, 28 June 73, R554717, R554716, 5 La Maison de Du Pigeon, par André de la Ternasse, Illustrated de A. Picode. Copyright 9 May 46. AF 2304. Andre de la Ternasse. A. 28 June 73. R554718. R554718. 554719. Botanique Agricole by Ernest Chansreen. Copyright 16 May 46. AF 2317. Madame Chasserine, ne Jean Léa de Moore, W. Emile Chasserine and Jean Chasserine, C. 28 June 73, R. 554719. R. 554720. L'Olivier, Bouillerie de et de Grinet. Par Pierre Bonnet et Joseph Bonnet. Copyright 29 May 46. A. F. 2344. Pierre Bonnet, A, 28 June 73, R554720. R554721, Job, by Paul Vialar, copyright 25 May 46, AF2355, Paul Vialar, A, 28 June 73, R554721. R five five four seven two two L'Empire du Levant History de la Question d'Orient by Rene Grousset Copyright twenty june forty six AF two five zero zero Jean Luc Pidog Peyo E twenty eight june seventy three R five five four seven two two R five five four seven two three La France de Louis Quatorze by Pierre Gatzot Copyright twenty seven june forty six AF two five zero three Pierre Gatzot A twenty eight june seventy three R five five four seven two three R five five four seven two four La Sequipage de Peter Hill by Rene Guillot Copyright twelve june forty six AF two five zero seven Madame Rene Guillot ne Giselle Merveau W. 28 June 73. R554724. R554725. Fabre de Glantine, Chef de Fripon, by Louis Jacob. Copyright 13 June 46. AF2519. 
Madame Louis Jacob, ne Genevieve Road, W. 28 June 73. R554725. R554726. L'Empire de Napoleon, by Louis Madeline. Historie du Consulat et de l'Empire, T. 10. Copyright, 16 May 46. AF 2537. Madame Louis Madeline, ne Marie Berthe Clavery, W. Madame Jean Marie Zeller, ne Beatrix Louise Marie Madeline, Olivier Paul Marie Louis Madeline, and Madame Pierre Joseph Jacques, ne Colette Marie Madeline, C. 28 June 73. R 554726. R 554727. Ravna chez le Lepon, par Estrid Ott, adopté du Danois per Marguerite Deal, illustrated de A. Picode, N. M., translation. Copyright, 9 May 46, A. F. 2616, Marguerite Deal, A. 28 June 73, R. 554727. R. 554728, Paris Pendant la Guerre, June 1940 to out 1944 by Pierre Audiat. Copyright 2 April 46. AF 2619. Madame Audiat, ne Solange Buisson, W. 28 June 73. R 554728. R 554729. Souvenirs de un ambassade à Berlin, September 1931 to October 1938, by André François Ponset. Copyright 20 June 46. AF 2643. André François Ponset, A. 28 June 73. R554729. R554732. R554732. Copyright 1931 to October 1938, by André François Ponset, A. 28 June 73. R554732. 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 R5 Copyright 20 June 46. AF 2643. R5 2643. R5 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 by Marcel Reinard. Copyright 29 May 46. AF 2714. Marcel Reinhard. A. 28 June 73. R 554730. R 554731. Rafales by Roger Versell, Roger Cretin. Copyright 5 June 46. AF 2727. Madame Roger Versell, ne Madeleine Adam, W. 28 June 73. R 554731. R 554732. Au Regne la Lumiere, by Georges Saunier. Copyright 5 June 46. AF 6479. Georges Saunier, A. 28 June 73. R 554732. R554749, NBC and U, August 1945. Copyright, 28 August 45. A189667, National Broadcasting Company, Incorporated, PWH, 2 July 73. R554749. R554750. A War Record, The Use of Records in the War Effort. Copyright 31 August 45, AA 492713, National Broadcasting Company, Incorporated, PWH, 2 July 73, R554750, R554732, AA 495657, National Broadcasting Company, Inc., PWH, 2 July, 73. R554751. R554759. Tikkun Lakorim, compiled by Fanny Scharfstein. Copyright 15 March, 46. A1719. Fanny Scharfstein, A. 2 July, 73. R554759. R five five four seven six six The School Teacher and the Cad by Margaret Cousins 
in good housekeeping april 1946 copyright 20 march 46 b 14268 margaret cousins a 5 july 73 r 554766 r 554767 p moran diamond hunter by percival wild in ellery queen's mystery magazine april 1946 copyright 19 march 46 b 14429 dana marie ross e 5 july 73 r 554767 r 554768 consuelo by margaret cousins in the american magazine may 1946 copyright 5 april 46 b 16113 margaret cousins a 5 july 73 r 554768 r 554769 p moran and the poison pen by percival wilde in ellery queen's mystery magazine march 1946 copyright 8 february 46 b 7316 dana marie ross e 5 july 73 r five five four seven six nine r five five four seven seven zero a pair of spectacles by davis grubb in collier's september fifteenth nineteen forty five copyright seven september forty five b six nine one seven seven four davis grubb a five july seventy three r five five four seven seven zero r five five four seven seven one the secret by margaret lee runbeck n m preliminary pages and page one copyright twenty six april forty six a five zero zero seven jessa d r scallon e five july seventy three r five five four seven seven one r five five four seven seven three shoot if you must by richard powell copyright fourteen june forty six a four nine six zero richard powell a five july seventy three r five five four seven seven three r five five four seven eight three lost continents by l sprague de camp in natural history may nineteen forty six copyright five may forty six b one nine three seven seven l sprague de camp a six july seventy three r five five four seven eight three r five five four seven nine nine a letter to five wives by john klempner in hearst's international cosmopolitan august nineteen forty five copyright one august forty five b six eight eight five nine six john bear c twenty two june seventy three r five five four seven nine nine r five five four eight one six little boy dance by elizabeth willis de huff artist gisela loeffler gisela loeffler lacquer copyright eighteen june forty six a four eight four two elizabeth willis de huff a five july seventy three r five five four eight one six r five five four eight three nine to five five four eight four one nine strings to your bow parts one to three by maurice walsh in the saturday evening post july fourteen to twenty eight nineteen forty five copyright eleven july forty five b six eight four five one five eighteen july forty five b six eight four five one six twenty five july forty five b six eight five nine seven one maurice walsh ian walsh and neil walsh c two july seventy three r five five four eight three nine to five five four eight four one r five five four eight four two nine strings to your bow part five by maurice walsh in the saturday evening post august eleventh nineteen forty five copyright eight august forty five b six eight seven nine three two 
Maurice Walsh, Ian Walsh, and Neil Walsh, C. 2 July 73. R554842. R554843. Nine Strings to Your Bow, Part 4. By Maurice Walsh. In the Saturday Evening Post, August 4, 1945. Copyright, 1 August 45. B688406. Maurice Walsh, Ian Walsh, and Neil Walsh, C. 2 July 73. R554843. R554844-554846. Nine Strings to Your Bow, Parts 6 through 8. By Maurice Walsh. In the Saturday Evening Post, August 18 to September 1, 1945. Copyright, 15 August 45. B688407, 22 August 45, B688408, 29 August 45, B689395, Maurice Walsh, Ian Walsh, and Neil Walsh, C. 2 July 73, R554844-554846, R554865, the Love Game Comedy by David Lloyd Stevenson. Copyright 10 May 46. A3159. David Lloyd Stevenson. A. 2 July 73. R554865. R554866. Voltaire Dryden and Heroic Tragedy by Trustin Wheeler Russell. Copyright 9 May 46. A3160. Trust in Wheeler Russell, A. 2 July 73. R554866. R554867. An Outline Guide to the Art of the South Pacific by Paul S. Wingert. Copyright 17 May 46. A3192. Paul S. Wingert, A. 2 July 73. R554867. R554868, Mademoiselle's Handbook for Bridal Consultants, by Roby Lyle, copyright 7 June 46, A3488, The Condé Nast Publications, Inc., PWH, 2 July 73, R554868, R554869, Street and Smith's Western Story Annual, 1946, Editor John Burr. Copyright 4 June 46. AA 15167. The Condé Nast Publications, Inc. PWH 2 July 73. R554869. R554870. Hollywood Patterns Catalog, July 1946. By Ruth Setter Cook. Copyright 3 June 46. AA 19418. The Condé Nast Publications, Inc., PWH. 2 July 73. R554870. R554871. Hollywood Patterns Pamphlet, July 1946. By Ruth Setter Cook. Copyright 3 June 46. AA 19421. The Condé Nast Publications, Inc., PWH, 2 July 73, R554871. R554872, Vogue Patterns Pamphlet, July 15, 1946, by Ruth Setter Cook. Copyright, 10 June 46, AA20044. The Condé Nast Publications, Inc., PWH. 2 July 73, R554872. R554873, Vogue Mid-Month Collection, July 1946, by Ruth Setter Cook. Copyright, 10 June 46, AA20045. The Condé Nast Publications, Inc., PWH. 2 July 73, R554873. R554874, Vogue Patterns Pamphlet, August 1, 1946, by Ruth Setter Cook. 
Copyright 25 June 46. AA 20322. The Condé Nast Publications, Inc., PWH. 2 July 1973. R554874. R554875. Vogue First of the Month Collection. August 1946. By Ruth Setter Cook. Copyright 25 June 46. AA 20323. The Condé Nast Publications, Inc., PWH. 2 July 73. R554875. R554876. Vogue Patterns Catalog, August 1946. By Ruth Setter Cook. Copyright 25 June 46. AA 20324. The Condé Nast Publications, Inc., PWH. 2 July 73. R554876. R554877. Junior Vogue Pattern No. 3107. By Ruth Setter Cook. Copyright 10 June 46. AA 26776. The Condé Nast Publications, Inc., PWH. 2 July 73. R554877. R554878. Junior Vogue Patterns, No. 3038-3108. By Ruth Setter Cook. Copyright 10 June 46. AA 26777. The Condé Nast Publications, Inc., PWH. 2 July 73. R554878. R554879. Junior Vogue Pattern No. 3106. By Ruth Setter Cook. Copyright 10 June 46. AA 26778. The Condé Nast Publications, Inc. PWH. 2 July 73. R554879. R554880, Junior Vogue Pattern No. 3104, by Ruth Setter Cook. Copyright 10 June 46, AA 26779, The Condé Nast Publications, Inc., PWH. 2 July 73, R554880. R554881, Junior Vogue Pattern No. 3105 by Ruth Setter Cook, 10 June 46, AA 26780, The Condé Nast Publications, Inc., PWH, 2 July 73, R554881. R554882, Junior Vogue Pattern No. 3109 by Ruth Setter Cook, Copyright 25 June 46, AA 26781, The Condé Nast Publications, Inc., PWH, 2 July 73, R554882. R554922, Donald Duck, June 16, 1946, by Walt Disney. Copyright 3 June 46, AA 15089. Walt Disney Productions, PWH, 9 July 73, R554922. R554923, Uncle Remus and His Tales of Br'er Rabbit, June 16, 1946, by Walt Disney. Copyright, 3 June 46, AA15090. Walt Disney Productions, PWH, 9 July 73. R554923. R554924. Donald Duck, June 17 to 22, 1946. By Walt Disney. Copyright 3 June 46. AA15091. Walt Disney Productions, PWH. 9 July 73. R554924. R554925, Donald Duck, June 23, 1946, by Walt Disney. Copyright, 10 June 46, AA15092, Walt Disney Productions, PWH, 9 July 73, 
R554925. R554926. Uncle Remus and His Tales of Br'er Rabbit. June 23, 1946. By Walt Disney. Copyright 10 June 46. AA15093. Walt Disney Productions, PWH. 9 July 73. R554926. R554927. Mickey Mouse, June 23, 1946. By Walt Disney. Copyright 10 June 46. AA15094. Walt Disney Productions, PWH. 9 July 73. R554927. R554928, Mickey Mouse, June 17-22, 1946, by Walt Disney. Copyright 3 June 46, AA15095, Walt Disney Productions, PWH, 9 July 73, R554928. R554929. Mickey Mouse, June 16, 1946, by Walt Disney. Copyright 3 June 46, AA15096, Walt Disney Productions, PWH, 9 July 73, R554929. R554930, Mickey Mouse, June 30, 1946, by Walt Disney. Copyright 17 June 46, AA 16133, Walt Disney Productions, PWH, 9 July 73, R554930. R554931, Mickey Mouse, June 24 to 29, 1946, by Walt Disney. Copyright 10 June 46. AA16134, Walt Disney Productions, PWH, 9 July 73, R554931. R554932, Mickey Mouse, July 1-6, 1946, by Walt Disney. Copyright 17 June 46, AA16135, Walt Disney Productions, PWH, 9 July 73, R554932, R554933, Mickey Mouse, July 7, 1946, by Walt Disney, copyright 24 June 46, AA16136, Walt Disney Productions, PWH, 9 July 73, R554933. R554934, Mickey Mouse, July 8-13, 1946, by Walt Disney. Copyright, 24 June 46, AA16137, Walt Disney Productions, PWH, 9 July 73, R554934. R554935. Donald Duck, June 30, 1946, by Walt Disney. Copyright, 17 June 46, AA16141. Walt Disney Productions, PWH, 9 July 73, R554935. R554936. Donald Duck, June 24 to 29, 1946, by Walt Disney. Copyright 10 June 46, AA16142, Walt Disney Productions, PWH, 9 July 73, R554936. R554937, Donald Duck, July 1-6, 1946, by Walt Disney. Copyright 17 June 46, AA16143. Walt Disney Productions, PWH, 9 July 73, R554937. R554938, Donald Duck, July 7, 1946, by Walt Disney. 
Copyright 24 June 46. AA 16144. Walt Disney Productions, PWH. 9 July 73. R554938. R554939. Donald Duck, July 8-13, 1946. By Walt Disney. Copyright 24 June 46. AA 16145. Walt Disney Productions, PWH. 9 July 73. R554939. R554940. Uncle Remus and His Tales of Br'er Rabbit. June 30, 1946. By Walt Disney. Copyright 17 June 46. AA 16150. Walt Disney Productions, PWH. 9 July 73. R554940. R554941. Uncle Remus and His Tales of Br'er Rabbit. July 7, 1946. By Walt Disney. Copyright 24 June 46. AA 16151. Walt Disney Productions, PWH. 9 July 73. R554941. R554951. Justin Morgan Had a Horse by Marguerite Henry. Illustrated by Wesley Dennis. Copyright 16 October 45. A190590. Marguerite Henry A. 29 June 73. R554951. R554952. Grandfather Objects But the Readers Won't. By Walter B. B. Wilder. In Doubleday Book News, July 1946. Copyright 28 June 46. A5 3116. Mrs. Harrison Wilder Taylor. Admin DBNCTA. 6 July 73. R554952. R554953. Hong Kong Holiday by Emily Han. Emily Han Boxer. Copyright 20 June 46. A4671. Emily Han Boxer. A. 6 July 73. R554953. R554954. The Psychopathic Dog by John Philip Sousa, third, illustrated by Barbara Sherman. Copyright 20 June 46. A4672. John Philip Sousa, third, A. 6 July 73. R554954. R554955. The Beacon by Sarah Ware Bassett. Copyright 20 June 46. A4710. Frederick B. Taylor, E. 6 July 73. R554955. R554956. Beer for Psyche. By Dorothy Gardner. Copyright 20 June 46. A4971. Dorothy Gardner, A. 6 July 73. R554956. R554957 to 554958. Dignified Meat, Part 1 and 2, by Robert Louis Taylor, in The New Yorker, June 15 to 22, 1946. Copyright, 13 June 46, B24833. 20 June 46, B25864. Robert Louis Taylor, A. 6 July 73. R554957 to 554958. R554959. Small Mouths for the Camera by Roy Chapman Andrews. In Field and Stream, July 1946. Copyright 26 June 46. B27067. Wilhelmina A Street, W. 6 July 73. R554959. R554960. Infrared and Ultraviolet Photography by Elliot G. Cranch. NM. Editions, Revisions, and New Illustrations. Copyright 26 June 46. 
AA16984, Eastman Kodak Company, PWH, 12 July 73, R554960. R554965, Physiographic Diagram of Africa, by Armin Cole Lobeck, copyright 1 July 46, AA21018, Elmeyer L. Michael, C., 5 July 73, R554965. R554969, Virus as Organism, Evolutionary and Ecological Aspects of Some Human Virus Diseases, by Frank McFarlane Burnett. Copyright 20 August 45, A189573. Frank McFarlane Burnett, A. 3 July 73, R554969. R554970, Dictionary of Education. Editor Carter V. Good. Copyright 30 July 45, A189075. Carter V. Good, A. 29 June 73, R554970, R554971, Introduction to Social Science, A Survey of Social Problems, Abridged One-Volume Edition, by George C. Atterbury and John L. Abel, forward by Lewis Wirth, N.M., New and Revised Material, Copyright 26 March 46, A1830, Ruby Atterbury and Andel Abel, W., and George C. Atterbury, Jr., Eleanor Hempel, and Robert W. Atterbury, C. of George C. Atterbury, 2 July 73, R554971. R554972, National Interest and International Cartels, by Charles R. Whittlesey, copyright 4 June 46. A3272, Charles R. Whittlesey, A, 2 July 73, R554972. R554973, The Brave Bantam, by Louise Seaman, Louise Seaman Bechtel, with pictures by Helen Sewell. Copyright 11 June 46, A3301, Louise Seaman Bechtel, A, 2 July 73, R554973. R554974, The Meeting of East and West, An Inquiry Concerning World Understanding, by F. S. C. Northrup. Copyright 18 June 46, A3361. F. S. C. Northrup, A. 2 July 73, R554974. R554975, See Over a Farm, by Robert P. Tristram Coffin, in New York Herald Tribune, June 22, 1946. Copyright 22 June 46, B22599. Richard N. Coffin, Margaret Coffin Halvosa, Mary Alice Westcott, and Robert P. T. Coffin, Jr., C. 2 July 73, R554975. R554976, Seed, by Robert P. Tristram Coffin, in Good Housekeeping, July 1946. Copyright 19 June 46. B25781, Richard N. Coffin, Margaret Coffin Halvosa, Mary Alice Westcott, and Robert P. T. Coffin, Jr., C. 2 July 73. R554976. R554977. To Two Main Boys Growing Up in Arizona by Robert P. Tristram Coffin. In Yankee, July 1946. Copyright 25 June 46. B27136. Richard N. Coffin, Margaret Coffin Halvosa, Mary Alice Westcott, and Robert P. T. Coffin, Jr., C. 2 July 73, R554977. R554988, Families in Trouble, by Earl Loman Coos. Copyright 27 May 46, A4619. Sarah G. Coos, Mrs. Earl Loman Coos, W. 9 July 73, 
R554988. R554989, The A Priori in Physical Theory, by Arthur Path. Copyright 22 April 46. AA13041. Mrs. Arthur Path, W. 9 July 73. R554989. R554995. Our New Friends, by William S. Gray and Mary Hill Arbuthnot. Artist, John Osibold. 1946-47 to edition. Copyright, 20 June 46. A4631. Scott Forsman and Company, PWH. 29 June 73. R554995. R554996. More Friends and Neighbors, by William S. Gray and Mary Hill Arbuthnot. Artist, Ellen B. Segner. 1946 to 47 edition copyright 26 june 46 a 4650 scott forsman and company pwh 29 june 73 r554996 r554997 think and do book to accompany more friends and neighbors by william s gray and marion monroe 1946 to 47 edition copyright 12 june 46 aa 20084 scott forsman and company pwh 29 june 73 r554997 r554998 guidebook for more friends and neighbors by william s gray and lillian gray N. M. Introduction, page 5 to 28, and Revision of Skill Building Exercises, pages 170 to 174. Copyright, 17 June 46. A. A. 20154. Scott Forsman and Company, P. W. H. 29 June 73. R. 554998. R. 554999. Number Stories Workbook by W. C. Findlay, J. W. Studebaker, and F. B. Knight. Artists John Olsebold and Virginia Bredendyke. 1946 to 47 edition. Copyright 21 June 46. A. A. 20405. Scott Forsman and Company, P. W. H. 29 June 73. R. 554999. End of Part 1 of U.S. Copyright Renewals, 1973, July to December, by U.S. Copyright Office. Words of Two Syllable from the English Spelling Book This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sue Anderson. The English Spelling Book by William Maver. Words of Two Syllable. Words accented on the first syllable. Observation. The double accent when it unavoidably occurs, shows that the following consonant is to be pronounced in both syllables. As C-O, double accent, P-Y, pronounced copy. Abba, abbot, abject, able, abscess, absent, abstract, accent. Acid, acorn acre acrid active actor actress adage adder addle advent adverb adverse after aged agent agile ague ailment airy alder alley almond aloe also alter alter alum always amber amble ambush ample anchor 
angel, anger, angle. Angry, ankle, annals, answer, antic, anvil, any, apple. April, apron, aptness, arbor, archer, arctic, ardent, ardor. Argent, argue, arid, armored, armor army errant arrow artful artist artless ashes asker aspect aspen assets asthma audit author awful axis azure babble babbler baby backbite backward bacon badger badness baffle baggage bailiff Baker, balance, baldness, baleful. Ballad, ballast, ballot, balsam. Bandage, bandbox, bandy, baneful. Banish, banker, bankrupt, banner. Banquet, banter, bantling, baptism. Barbed, barber, barefoot, bareness. Barkin, barking, barley, barren. Baron, barrow, barter, baseness. Bashful, basin, basket, bastard. Batten, battle, bawling, beacon, beetle, beamy, beardless, bearer. Beastly, beater, beauty, bedding, beehive, beggar, being, bedlam. Bedtime, belfry, bellman, bellow, belly, berry, be some better. Bevy, bias, bibber, bible, bitter, bigness, bigot, billet. Binder, binding, birchen, birdlime. Birthday, bishop, bitter, bittern. Blacken, blackness, bladder, blameless. Blandish, blanket, bleakness, bleeding. Bleeding, blemish, blessing, blindfold. Blindness, blister, bloated, bloodshed. Bloody, blooming, blossom, blowing. Blubber, blueness, blunder, bluntless. Bluster, border, boaster, boasting. Bobbin, bodkin, body, boggle, boiler. Bolster, bondage, bonfire, bonnet. Bonny, bony, booby, bookish. Boorish, booty, border, borrow bottle bottom boundless bounty bowels bower boxer boyish bracelet bracket brackish bragger bramble brandish bravely brawling brawny brazen breakfast breastplate breathless breeding brewer briar brickbat brick kiln bridal bridemaid bridal briefly briar brightness Brimmer, brimstone, bringer, briny. Bristle, brittle, broken, broker, brutal, brutish, bubble, bucket. Buckle, buckler, buckram, budget. Buffet, bugbear, bugle, bulky. Bullet, bulrush, bulwark, bumper, bumpkin, bundle, bungle, bungler. Burden, burgess, burner, burning. Burnish, bushel, bustle, butcher. Butler, butter, buttock, buxom. Buzzard, cabbage, cabin, cable. Caddy, cadence, calling, callous. Cambric, camlet, cancel, cancer. Candid, candle, canker, cannon. Canter, canvas, caper, capon. Captain, captive, capture, carcase. Carter, careful, careless, carnage. Carrot, carpet, carter, carver. Casement, casket, castor, castle. Caudal, cavil, causeway, caustic. Cedar, ceiling, cellar, censure. Center, sea rate, certain. Cauldron, chalice, challenge, camber. Cancel, chandler, changer, changing. Channel, chapel, chaplain, chaplet. Chapman, chapter, charcoal, charger. 
charmer charming charter chasten chattels chatter cheapen cheapness cheater cheerful chemist cherish cherry chestnut chiefly childhood childish children chimney chisel collar chopping christen chuckle churlish churning cider cinder cipher circle cistern citron city clamber clammy clamour clapper claret classic clatter cleanly clearness clergy clever client climate clinger cloggy cloister closer closet cloudy clover cloven clownish cluster clumsy clotty cobbler cobnut cobweb cockpit codlin coffee coldness collar collet college collop colon color combat comely comer comet comfort comma comment commerce common compact compass compound comrade concave concert concord concourse conduct conduit conflict congress conquer conquest constant consul contest context contract convent convert convex convict cooler coolness cooper copper copy cordage corner costive costly cotton cover Council, consul, counter, county. Couplet, courtly, coward, cousin. Cracker, crackle, crafty, creature. Credit, cribbage, crooked, crossness. Crotchet, crudely, cruel, cruet. Crumple, crumper, crusty, crystal. Cudgel, culprit, cumber, cunning. Cupboard, curate, curdle, curfew curling current curtsy current curry cursed curtain curved custard custom cutler cynic cypress dabble danger dagger daily dainty dairy dally damage damask damsel dancer dandel dandruff dangle dapper darkness darling dastard dazzle Dearly, dearness, deadly, deathless. Debtor, decent, deus, deluge, dibble, dictate, diet, differ. Dimness, dimple, dinner, discord. Dismal, distant, distant, doer. Dogger, donner, dormant, doublet, doubtful, doubtless, doughty, dower. Dowless, dawny, draggle, dragon, draper, drawer, drawing, dreadful. Dreamer, driver, dropsy, drubbing, drummer, drunkard, duel, dukedom. Dullness, durance, duty, dwelling, dwindle, eager, eagle, easter. Eater, early, earthen, echo, eddy, edict, effort, egress, either. Elbow, elder, emblem, emmet, empire, empty, endless, enter. Entry, envoy, envy, ephod, epic, equal, error, essay. Essence, ethnic, even, ever, evil, exit, eyesight. Eyesore, fable, fabric, facing, factor, faggot, faintness, faithful. Falcon, fallow, falsehood, famine, famish, famous, fancy, farmer. Pharaoh, farther, fasten, fatal, father, faulty, favor, fawning. Fearful, feather, feeble, feeling, feigned, fellow, felon, female. Fencer, fender, fertile, fervent, fester, fetter, fever, fiddle figure filler filthy final finger finish firmness fixed flabby flagon flagrant flannel flavor fleshly florist flower fluster flutter follow folly fondler foolish footstep forecast foremost 
foresight forehead forest formal former fortnight fortune founder fountain fowler fragrant freely frenzy friendly frigate frosty froward frowsy fruitful fuller fumy funnel funny furnace furnish furrow further furry fusty futile future gabble gainful gallant galley gallon gallop gamble gamester gammon gander gauntlet garbage garden gargle garland garment garner garnish garret garter gather gaudy gazer gelding gender gentile gentle gentry gesture getting goo ga ghastly giant gibbet giddy giggle gilder gilding gimlet ginger girdle girlish giver gladden gladness gleaner glibly glimmer glisten gloomy glory glossy glutton gnashing gobbit godly goer golden gosling gospel gossip gouty graceful grammar grandeur grassy gratis graver gravy grazing greasy greatly greatness greedy greenish greeting grievance grievous grinder griskin grisly grisly groaning grocer grotto groundless gruffness guiltless guilty gunner gusset gusty gutter guzzle habit hackney haddock haggard haggle hailstone hairy halter hamlet hamper handful handmaid handsome handy hanger hangings hanker happen happy harris harbor harden hardy harmful harmless harness harrow harvest hasten hatter hateful hatred haughty haunted hazard hazel hazy heady healing hearing hearken hearten heartless heathen heaven heavy hebrew hector heedful helmet helper helpful helpless hemlock herbage herdsman hermit herring hewer hiccup higgler highness hillock hilly hinder hireling hobble hoggish hogshead hold fast holland hollow holy homage homely honest honor hoodwink hopeful hopeless horrid horror hostage hostess hostile hothouse hourly household human humble humor hunger hunter hurry hurtful husky hyssop idler idle image incense income index infant inkstand inlet inmate inmost inquest inroad insect insult insight instance instant instep into invoice iron issue item jabber jagged jangle jargon jasper jealous jelly jester jesus jewel jewish jingle joiner jointure jolly journal journey joyful joyless joyous judgment juggle juicy jumble jury justice justly keenness keeper kennel colonel kettle keyhole kidnap kidney kindle kindness kingdom kinsman kitchen knavish kneeling knowing knowledge knuckle label labor lacking ladder lading ladle lady lambkin lancet landlord landmark landscape language languid lappet larder lather latter laughter lawful lawyer leaden leader leaky leanness learning leather lengthen leper level levy libel license lifeless lighten lightning limber limit limner linguist lion listed litter little lively liver 
lizard leading lobby lobster locket locust lodgment lodger lofty logwood longing looseness lordly loudness lovely lover lowly lowness loyal lucid luggage lumber lurcher lurker lucky lyric maggot major maker mallet maltster mammon mandrake mangle manly manor mantle minnie marble market marksman merrill marquis marshal martyr mason master matter maxim mayor maypole meanly meaning measure metal meekness mellow member menace mender mental mercer merchant mercy merit message metal method middle mighty mildew mildness millstone milky miller mimic mindful mingle mischief miser mixture mocker model modern modest moisture moment monkey monster monthly moral morsel mortal mortar mostly mother motive movement mountain mournful mouthful muddle muddy muffle mumble mummy murder murmur mushroom music musket muslin mustard musty mutton muzzle myrtle mystic nailer naked nameless napkin narrow nasty native nature navel naughty navy neatness neckcloth needful needle needy negro neighbor neither nephew nervous nettle newly newness nimble niceness niggard nightcap nimble nipple noble noggin nonage nonsense nonsuit nostril nostrum nothing notice novel novice number nurser nurture nutmeg oafish oaken oatmeal object oblong ochre odor offer office offspring ogle oil man ointment older olive omen onset open optic opal orange order organ other oral otter over outcast outcry outer outmost outrage outward outwork owner oyster pacer package packer packet paddle paddock padlock pagan painful painter painting palace palette paleness palette pamphlet pancake panic pantry paper papist parboil parcel parching parchment pardon parent parley parlor parrot parry parson partner party passage passive passport pasture patent pavement payment peacock pebble pedant peddler peeper peevish pelting pedant penman penny pensive people pepper perfect peril perish perjur parry person pertness pester pestle petty pewter file frenzy physic pickle picklock picture pieces pygmy pilfer pilgrim pillage pillbox pilot pimple pincase pincers pinching piper pippin pirate pitcher pittance pity pivot places placid plaintive planet planter plaster plated platter player playing pleasant pleasure plotter plumage plummet plumpness plunder plural plying poacher pocket poet poison poker polar polish pompous ponder popish poppy portal posset postage posture potent potter pottle poultry pounce box poundage pounder power powder practice praiser prancer prattle prattler prayer preacher 
preben precept prattle preface prelate prelude presage presence present presser prickle prickly priesthood primate primer princess private privy problem proctor produce product proffer profit progress project prologue promise profit prosper prostrate proudly prowess prowler prying prudence prudent psalmist psalter public publish pucker pudding puddle puffer pullet pulpit pumper puncture pungent punish puppy purblind pureness purpose putrid puzzle quadrant quagmire quaintness quaker qualmish quarrel quarry quartan quarter quaver queerly query quibble quicken quickly quicksand quiet quinsy quittle quit rent quiver quorum quota rabbit rabble racer racket radish raffle rafter ragged railer raiment rainbow rainy razor raisin rakish rally ramble rammer rampant rampart rancor random ranger rankle ransack ransom ranter rapid rapine rapture rashness rather rattle ravage raven rawness razor reader ready real reaper reason rebel recent reckon rector refuse rental restless revel riband riches riddance riddle rider rifle rightful rigor riot ripple rival river rivet roaring robber rocket roller roman romish roomy rosy rotten roundish rover royal rubber rubbish ruby rudder rudeness rueful ruffle rugged ruin ruler rumble rummage rumor rumple runlet running rapture rustic rusty ruthless sabbath sable sabre sackcloth sadden saddle safely safety saffron sailor salad sally salmon saltish savage salver sample sandal sandy sanguine sampling sappy satchel satin satire savage saucer savor sausage sawyer saying scabbard scaffold scamper scandal scarlet scatter scholar science scoffer scallop scornful scribble scripture scruple scruffle sculler sculpture scurvy seamless season secret seedless seeing seemly cellar senate senseless sentence sequel sermon serpent servant service setter settle shabby shackle shadow shaggy shallow shamble shameful shameless shapeless shapen sharpen sharper shatter shearing shelter shepherd sheriff sherry shilling shining shipwreck shocking shorter shorten shovel shoulder shower shuffle shutter shuttle sicken sickness sightless signal silence silent simper simple simply sinew sinful singing singer single sinner siren sister sitting skillful skillet skimmer slacken slander slattern slavish sleeper sleepy slipper silver sloppy slothful slubber sluggard slumber smelling smuggle smutty snaffle snaggy snapper sneaking snuffle socket sodden soften soulless solemn solid sordid sorrow sorry scottish soundness spangle sparkle sparrow spatter speaker speechless 
speedy spindle spinner spirit spittle spiteful splinter spoken sporting spotless sprinkle spongy squander squeamish stable stagger stagnate stall-fed stammer standish staple startle stately stating statue stature statute steadfast steeple steerage stickle stiffen stifle stillness stingy stirrup stomach stony stormy story stoutness straggle strangle stricken strictly striking stripling structure stubborn student stumble sturdy subject succor suckling sudden suffer sullen sully sultan sultry summer summit summon sunday sunder sundry supper supple surety surefit surly surname surplus swabby swaddle swagger swallow swanskin swarthy swearing sweaty sweeping sweeten sweetness swelling swiftness swimming system tabby table tackle taker talent tallow tally tamely tammy tamper tangle tankard tansy taper tapster tardy target terry tartar tasteless taster tattle tawdry tawny tailor teller temper tempest temple tempter tenant tender terrace terror testy tetter thankful thatcher thawing therefore thicket thievish thimble thinking thirsty thorny thornback thoughtful thousand thrasher threatened throbbing thumping thunder thursday ticket tickle tidy tighten tillage tiller timber timely tincture tinder tingle tinker tinsel tippet tipple tiresome title titter title toilet token tonnage torment torrent torture total totter towel tower township trading traffic traitor trammel trample transcript transfer treacle treason treacher treatise treatment treaty tremble trencher trespass tribune trickle trifle trigger trimmer triple tripping triumph trooper trophy trouble trousers truant truckle truly trumpet trundle trusty tucker tuesday tulip tumble tumbler tumid tumor tumult tunnel turban turbid turkey turner turnip turnstile turret turtle tutor twilight twinkle twitter timble tyrant umpire uncle under upper upright upshot upward urgent urine usage useful usher utmost utter vacant vagrant vainly valid valley vanish vanquish varlet varnish very vassal velvet vendor venom venture verdant verdict verger verges thurman versed vervain very vesper vestry vexed vicar victor vigor villain vintner vile viper virgin virtue visage visit vixen vocal volley vomit voyage vulgar vulture wafer waggish wagtail waiter wakeful wallet wallow walker walnut wander wanting wanton warfare warlike warrant warren washing waspish wasteful water watchful waver waylaid wayward weary wealthy weapon weather weeping weighty welfare wheaten whisper whistle wholesome wicked widow willing windward winter wisdom witness witty woeful 
wonder worship wrongful yearly yearning yellow yeoman yonder younger youngest youthful zany zealot zealous zenith zephyr zigzag entertaining and instructive lessons in words not exceeding two syllables lesson one the dog barks the hog grunts the pig squeaks the horse neighs the cock crows the ass brays the cat purrs the kitten mews the bull bellows the cow lows the calf bleats sheep also bleat the lion roars the wolf howls the tiger growls the fox barks mice squeak the frog croaks the sparrow chirps the swallow titters the rook caws the bittern booms the turkey gobbles the peacock screams the beetle hums the duck quacks the goose cackles monkeys chatter the owl hoots the screech owl shrieks the snake hisses little boys and girls talk and read end of words of two syllable from the english spelling book by william maver yeast this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Yeast by Thomas H. Huxley I have selected tonight the particular subject of yeast for two reasons, or rather, I should say, for three. In the first place, because it is one of the simplest and the most familiar objects with which we are acquainted. In the second place, because the facts and phenomena which I have to describe are so simple that it is possible to put them before you without the help of any of those pictures or diagrams which are needed when matters are more complicated, and which, if I had to refer them here, would involve the necessity of my turning away from you now and then, and thereby increasing very largely my difficulty, already sufficiently great, in making myself heard. And thirdly, I have chosen this subject because I know of no familiar substance forming part of our everyday knowledge and experience, the examination of which, with a little care, tends to open up very considerable issues as does this substance, yeast. In the first place I should like to call your attention to the fact with which the whole of you are, to begin with, perfectly acquainted. I mean the fact that any liquid containing sugar, any liquid which is performed by pressing out the succulent parts of the fruits of plants, or a mixture of honey and water, if left to itself for a short time, begins to undergo a peculiar change. No matter how clear it might be at starting, yet after a few hours, or at most a few days, if the temperature is high, this liquid begins to be turbid, and by and by bubbles make their appearance in it, and a sort of dirty-looking yellowish foam or scum collects at the surface, while at the same time, by degrees, a similar kind of matter, which we call the lees, sinks to the bottom. The quantity of this dirty-looking stuff that we call the scum and the lees goes on increasing until it reaches a certain amount, and then it stops, and by the time it stops, you find the liquid in which this matter has been formed has become altered in its quality. To begin with, it was a mere sweetish substance, having the flavour of whatever might be the plant from which it was expressed, or having merely the taste and the absence of smell of a solution of sugar. 
but by the time that this change that I have been briefly describing to you is accomplished, the liquid has become completely altered. It has acquired a peculiar smell, and what is still more remarkable, it has gained the property of intoxicating the person who drinks it. Nothing can be more innocent than a solution of sugar. Nothing can be less innocent if taken in excess, as you all know, than those fermented matters which are produced from sugar. Well, again, if you notice that bubbling, or as it were, seething of the liquid which has accompanied the whole of this process, you will find that it is produced by the evolution of little bubbles of air-like substance out of the liquid, and I dare say you all know this air-like substance is not like common air. It is not a substance which a man can breathe with impunity. You often hear of accidents which take place in brewers' vats, when men go in carelessly and get suffocated there without knowing that there was anything evil awaiting them. And if you tried the experiment with this liquid I am telling of while it was fermenting, you would find that any small animal let down into the vessel would be similarly stifled, and you would discover that a light lowered down into it would go out. Well then, lastly, if after this liquid has been thus altered, you expose it to that process which is called distillation, that is to say, if you put it in a still, and collect the matters which are sent over, you obtain, when you first heat it, a clear transparent liquid, which, however, is something totally different from water. It is much lighter, it has a strong smell, and it has an acrid taste, and it possesses the same intoxicating power as the original liquid, but in a much more intense degree. If you put a light to it, it burns with a bright flame, and it is that substance which we know as spirits of wine. Now these facts that I have just put before you, all but the last, have been known from extremely remote antiquity. It is, I hope, one of the best evidences of the antiquity of the human race, that among the earliest records of all kinds of men, you find a time recorded when they got drunk. We may hope that that must have been a very late period in their history. Not only have we the record of what happened to Noah, but if we turn to the traditions of different people, those forefathers of ours who lived in the highlands of northern India, we find that they were not less addicted to intoxicating liquids. And I have no doubt that the knowledge of this process extends far beyond the limits of historically recorded time. And it is a very curious thing to observe that all the names we have of this process and all that belongs to it are the names that have their roots not in our present language but in those older languages which go back to the times at which the country was peopled the word fermentation for example which is the title we apply to the whole process is a latin term and a term which is evidently based upon the fact of the effervescence of the liquid then the french who are very fond of calling themselves a latin race have a particular word for ferment, which is levure, and in the same way we have the word leaven, those two words having reference to the heaving up or the raising of the substance which is fermented. Now those words which we get from what I may call the Latin side of our parentage. But if we turn to the Saxon side, there are a number of names connected with this process of fermentation. For example, the Germans call fermentation, and the old Germans did so, garen, and they call anything which is used as a ferment by such names such as geist and geist, and finally in low German, jest. And that word you know is the word our Saxon forefathers used, and is almost the same as the word which is commonly employed in this country, to denote the common ferment of which I have been speaking. So they have another name, the word haif, which is derived from the word haben, which signifies to raise up, and they have yet a third name, which is also one common in this country. I do not know whether it is common in Lancashire, but it is certainly very common in the Midland countries. The word balm, which is derived from a root which signifies to raise or to bear up.
barn is something born up and thus there is much more real relation than is commonly supposed by those who make puns between the beer which a man takes down his throat and the beer upon which that process if carried to excess generally lands him for they are both derived from the root signifying bearing up and the one thing is borne upon men's shoulders and the other is the fermented liquid which was borne up by the fermentation taking place in itself Again I spoke of the produce of fermentation, of spirit of wine. Now what a very curious phrase that is, if you come to think of it. The old alchemists talked of the finest essence of anything as if it had the same sort of relation to the thing itself as a man's spirit is supposed to have to his body. And so they spoke of this fine essence of the fermented liquid as being the spirit of liquid. Thus came about that extraordinary ambiguity of language, in virtue of which you apply precisely to the same substantive name, to the soul of man, and to a glass of gin. And then there is still yet one other most curious piece of nomenclature connected with this matter, and that is the word alcohol itself, which is now so familiar to everybody. Alcohol originally meant a very fine powder. The women of the Arabs and other Eastern people are in the habit of tinging their eyelashes with a very fine black powder, which is made of antimony, and they call that coal. And the al is simply the article put in front of it, so as to say the coal. And up to the seventeenth century, in this country, the word alcohol was employed to signify any very fine powder. You find it in Robert Boyle's works that he uses alcohol for a very fine, subtle powder. But then this name of anything very fine and very subtle came to be specially connected with the fine and subtle spirit obtained from the fermentation of sugar. And I believe that the first person who fairly fixed it as the proper name of what we now commonly call spirits of wine was the great French chemist Laviosia so comparatively recent is the use of the word alcohol in this specialised sense so much by a way of general introduction to the subject on which i have to speak to-night what i have hitherto stated is simply what we may call common knowledge which everybody may acquaint himself of and you know that what we call scientific knowledge is not any kind of conjuration as people sometimes suppose but it is simply the application of the same principles of common sense that we apply to common knowledge carried out, if I may so speak, to knowledge which is uncommon. And all that we know now of this substance yeast, and all the very strange issues to which that knowledge has led us, have simply come out of the inveterate habit, and a very fortunate habit for the human race it is, which scientific men have of not being content until they have rooted out all the different chains and connections of apparently simple phenomena until they have taken them to pieces and understood the conditions upon which they depend i will try to point out to you now what has happened in consequence of endeavouring to apply this process of analysis as we call it this teasing out of an apparently simple fact into all the little facts of which it is made up to these certain facts relating to the balm or the yeast. Secondly, what has come of the attempts to ascertain distinctly what is the nature of the products which are produced by fermentation. Then what has come of the attempt to understand the relation between the yeast and the products. And lastly, what very curious side issues, if I may so call them, have branched out in the course of this inquiry, which has now occupied somewhere about two centuries the first thing was to make out precisely and clearly what was the nature of this substance this apparently mere scum and mud that we call yeast and that was first commenced seriously by a wonderful old dutchman of the name leeuwen hoek who lived some two hundred years ago and who was the first person to invent thoroughly trustworthy microscopes of high powers. Now Leeuwenhoek 
went to work upon this yeast mud, and by applying to it high powers of the microscope, he discovered that it was no mere mud such as you might find at first suppose, but that it was a substance made up of an enormous multitude of minute grains, each of which had just as definite a form as if it were a grain of corn, although it was vastly smaller, the largest of these not being more than the two thousandths of an inch in diameter, while, as you know, a grain of corn is a large thing, and the very smallest of these particles was not more than the seventh thousandth of an inch in diameter. Leeuwenhoek saw that this muddy stuff was in reality a liquid in which there were floating this immense number of definitely shaped particles, all aggregated in heaps and lumps, and some of them separate. That discovery remained, so to speak, dormant for fully a century. And then the question was taken up by a French discoverer, who, paying great attention, and having the advantage of better instruments than Leeuwenhoek, had watched these things and made the astounding discovery that they were bodies which were constantly being reproduced and growing, than when one of these rounded bodies was once formed, and had grown to its full size, it immediately began to give off a little bud from one side, and then that bud grew out until it had attained the full size of the first, and that in this way the yeast particle was undergoing a process of multiplication by budding, just as effectual and just as complete as the process of multiplication of a plant by budding. And thus this Frenchman, Cognard de la Tour arrived at the conclusion, very credible to his sagacity, and which had been confirmed by every observation and reasoning since, that this apparently muddy refuse was neither more nor less than a mass of plants, of minute living plants, growing and multiplying in the sugary fluid in which the yeast is formed. And from that time forth we have known this substance which forms the scum and the lees as the yeast plant, and it has received a scientific name, which I may use without thinking of it, and which I will therefore give you namely, Toyula. Well, this was a capital discovery. The next thing to do was to make out how this Torula was related to other plants. I won't weary you with the whole course of investigation, but I may sum up its results and they are these, that the terula is a particular kind of a fungus, a particular state, rather, of a fungus or mould. There are many moulds which, under certain conditions, give rise to the terula condition, to a substance which is not distinguishable from yeast, and which has the same properties as yeast, that is to say, which is able to decompose sugar in this curious way that we shall consider by and by so that the yeast plant is a plant belonging to a group of the fungi multiplying and growing and living in this very remarkable manner in the sugary fluid which is so to speak the nidus or home of the yeast that in a few words is as far as investigation by the help of one's eye and by the help of the microscope has taken us but now there is an observer whose methods of observation are more refined than those of men who use their eye, even though it be aided by the microscope, a man who sees indirectly farther than we can see directly. That is the chemist, and the chemist took up this question, and his discovery was not less remarkable than that of the microscopist. The chemist discovered that the yeast plant being composed of a sort of bag, like a bladder, inside, which is a peculiar, soft, semi-fluid material, the chemist found that this outer bladder has the same composition as the substance of wood, that material which is called cellulose, and which consists of the elements carbon and hydrogen and oxygen without any nitrogen. But then he also found the first person to discover it was an Italian chemist named Fabroni, in the end of the last century, that this inner matter, which was contained in the bag, which constitutes the yeast plant, was a substance containing the elements carbon and hydrogen and oxygen and nitrogen, that it was what Fabroni called a vegeto-animal substance, and that it had the peculiarities of what are commonly called animal products. This again was an exceedingly remarkable discovery. 
It lay neglected for a time, until it was subsequently taken up by the great chemists of modern times, and they, with their delicate methods of analysis, have finally decided that, in all essential respects, the substance which forms the chief part of the contents of the yeast plant is identical with the material which forms the chief part of our own muscles, which forms the chief part of our own blood, which forms the chief part of the white of an egg, that in fact although this little organism is a plant, and nothing but a plant, yet that its active living contents contain a substance which is called protein, which is of the same nature as the substance which forms the foundation of every animal organism whatever. Now we come next to the question of the analysis of the products, of that which is produced during the process of fermentation. So far back as the beginning of the sixteenth century, in the times of transition between the old alchemy and the modern chemistry, there was a remarkable man, von Helmont, a Dutchman, who saw the difference between the air which comes out of a vat where something is fermenting, and common air. He was the man who invented the term gas, and he called this kind of gas, gas sylvester, so to speak gas that is wild and lives in and out of the way places. Having in his mind the identity of this particular kind of air with that which is found in some caves and cellars, then the gradual process of investigation going on, it was discovered that this substance, then called fixed air, was a poisonous gas, and it was finally identified with that kind of gas which is obtained by burning charcoal in the air, which is called carbonic acid. Then the substance alcohol was subjected to examination, and it was found to be a combination of carbon and hydrogen and oxygen. Then the sugar which was contained in the fermenting liquid was examined, and that was found to contain the three elements carbon, hydrogen and oxygen, so that it was clear that there were in sugar the fundamental elements which are contained in the carbonic acid and in the alcohol. And then came that great chemist, Lavoisier, and he examined into the subject carefully, and possessed with that brilliant thought of his which happens to be propounded exactly apropos to this matter of fermentation, that no matter is ever lost, but that matter only changes its form and changes its combinations. He endeavoured to make out what became of the sugar which was subjected to fermentation. He thought he discovered that the whole weight of the sugar was represented by the carbonic acid produced, that in other words, supposing this tumbler to represent the sugar, that the action of fermentation was as it were the splitting of it, the one half going away in the shape of carbonic acid, and the other half away in the shape of alcohol. Subsequent inquiry, careful research with the refinements of modern chemistry, have been applied to this problem and they have shown that Laviosia was not quite correct, that what he says is quite true for about ninety-five per cent of the sugar, but that the other five per cent, or nearly so, is converted into two other things, one of them matter which is called succinic acid, and the other matter which is called glycerine, which you all now know as one of the commonest of household matters. It may be that we have not got to the end of this refined analysis yet, but at any rate I suppose I may say, and I speak with some little hesitation, for fear my friend, Professor Roscoe here, may pick me up for trespassing upon his province, but I believe I may say that now we can account for ninety-nine per cent, at least of the sugar. And that ninety-nine per cent is split up into these four things, carbonic acid, alcohol, succinic acid, and glycerine, so that it may be that none of the sugar whatever disappears, and that only its parts, so to speak, are rearranged, and if any of it disappears, certainly it is a very small portion. Now these are the facts of the case. There is the fact of the growth of the yeast plant, and there is the fact of the splitting up of the sugar. What relation have these facts to one another? For a very long time that was a great matter of dispute. The early French observers, to do them justice, discerned the real state of the case, namely that there was a very close connection between the actual life of the yeast plant and this operation of the splitting up of the sugar, 
and that one was in some way or another connected with the other. All investigation subsequently has confirmed this original idea. It has been shown that if you take any measures by which other plants of like kind to the terula would be killed, and by which the yeast plant is killed, then the yeast loses its efficiency. But a capital experiment upon this subject was made by a very distinguished man, Helmholtz, who produced an experiment of this kind. He had two vessels, one of them we will suppose full of yeast, but over the bottom of it, as this might be, was tied a thin film of bladder. Consequently, through that thin film of bladder, all the liquid parts of the yeast would go, but the solid parts would be stopped behind. The terula would be stopped, the liquid parts of the yeast would go. And then he took another vessel, containing a fermentable solution of sugar, and he put one inside the other, and in this way you see the fluid parts of the yeast were able to pass through with the utmost ease into the sugar. But the solid parts could not get through at all. And he judged thus, if the fluid parts are those which excite fermentation, then inasmuch as these are stopped, the sugar will not ferment, and the sugar did not ferment, showing quite clearly that an immediate contact with the solid, living terula was absolutely necessary to excite this process of splitting up of the sugar. This experiment was quite conclusive as to this particular point, and he had very great fruits in other directions. Well, then, the yeast plant being essential to the production of fermentation, where does the yeast plant come from? Here again was another great problem opened up, for as I said as starting, you have under ordinary circumstances, in warm weather, merely to expose some fluid containing a solution of sugar or any form of syrup or vegetable juice to the air, in order, after a comparatively short time, to see all these phenomena of fermentation. Of course, the first obvious suggestion is that the terula had been generated within the fluid. In fact, it seems at first quite absurd to entertain any other conviction. But that belief would most assuredly not be an erroneous one. Towards the beginning of this century, in the vigorous times of the old French wars, there was a Monsieur Apeur, who had his attention directed to the preservation of things that ordinarily perish, such as meat and vegetables, and, in fact, he laid the foundation of our modern methods of preserving meats, and he found that if he boiled any of these substances, and then tied them so as to exclude the air, that they would be preserved for any time. He tried these experiments, particularly with the must of wine, and with the wort of beer, and he found that if the wort of beer had been carefully boiled, and stopped in such a way that the air could not get at it, it would never ferment. What was the reason of this? That again became the subject of a long string of experiments, with this ultimate result, that if you take precautions to prevent any solid matters from getting into the must of wine or the wort of beer, under these circumstances, that is to say, if the fluid has been boiled and placed in a bottle, and if you stuff the neck of the bottle full of cotton wool, which allows the air to go through and stops anything of a solid character, however fine, then you may let it be for ten years, and it will not ferment. But if you take that plug out and give the air free access, then sooner or later fermentation will set up and there is no doubt whatever that fermentation is excited only by the presence of some terula or other, and that that terula proceeds in our present experience from pre-existing terulae. These little bodies are excessively light. You can easily imagine what must be the weight of little particles, but slightly heavier than water, and not more than the two thousandth or perhaps seven thousandth of an inch in diameter. They are capable of floating about and dancing like motes in the sunbeam. They are carried about by all sorts of currents of air. The great majority of them perish, but one or two, which may chance to enter into a sugary solution, immediately enter into active life, find there the conditions of their nourishment increase and multiply, and may give rise to any quantity, whatever of this substance yeast. And whatever may be true, 
or not be true about this spontaneous generation, as it is called in regard to all other kinds of living things, it is perfectly certain, as regards yeast, that it always owes its origin to the process of transportation, or inoculation, if you like, so to call it, from some other living yeast organism. And so far as yeast is concerned, the doctrine of spontaneous generation is absolutely out of court. And not only so, but the yeast must be alive in order to exert these peculiar properties. If it be crushed, if it be heated so far that its life is destroyed, that peculiar power of fermentation is not excited. Thus we have come to this conclusion, as a result of our inquiry, that the fermentation of sugar, the splitting of the sugar into alcohol and carbonic acid, glycerin and succinate acid, is the result of nothing but the vital activity of this little fungus, the terula. Now comes a further exceedingly difficult inquiry. How is it that this plant, the terula, produces this singular operation of the splitting up of the sugar? Fabroni, to whom I referred some time ago, imagined that the effervescence of fermentation was produced in just the same way as the effervescence of sedlitz powder, that the yeast was a kind of acid, and that the sugar was a combination of carbonic acid and some base to form the alcohol, and that the yeast combined with the substance and set free the carbonic acid, just as when you add carbonate of soda to acids you turn out the carbonic acid. But of course the discovery of Laviostia, that the carbonic acid and the alcohol taken together are very nearly equal in weight to the sugar, completely upset this hypothesis. Another view was therefore taken by the French chemist, the Nard, and it is still held by a very eminent chemist, Monsieur Pasteur, and their view in this, that the yeast, so to speak, eats a little of the sugar, turns a little of it to its own purposes, and by doing so gives such a shape to the sugar that the rest of it breaks up into carbonic acid and alcohol. Well, then, there is a third hypothesis, which is maintained by another very distinguished chemist, Liebig, which denies either of the other two, and which declares that the particles of the sugar are, as it were, shaken asunder by the forces at work in the yeast plant. Now I am not going to take you into these refinements of chemical theory. I cannot for a moment pretend to do so. But I may put the case before you by an analogy. Suppose you compare the sugar to a card house, and suppose you compare the yeast to a child coming near the card house. Then Fabroni's hypothesis was that the child took half the cards away. The Nard's and Pasteur's hypothesis is that the child pulls out the bottom card and thus makes it tumble to pieces. And Liebig's hypothesis is that the child comes by and shakes the table and tumbles the house down. I appeal to my friend here, Professor Roscoe, whether that is not a fair statement of the case. Having thus, as far as I can, discussed the general state of the question, it remains only that I should speak of some of those collateral results which have come in a very remarkable way out of the investigation of yeast. I told you that it was very early observed that the yeast plant consisted of a bag made up of the same material as that which composes wood, and of an interior semi-fluid mass which contains a substance identical in its composition in a broad sense with that which constitutes the flesh of animals. Subsequently, after the structure of the yeast plant had been carefully observed, it was discovered that all plants, high and low, are made up of separate bags or cells, as they are called. These bags or cells, having the composition of the pure matter of wood, having the same composition of broadly speaking as the sac of the yeast plant, and having in their interior a more or less fluid substance containing a matter of the same nature as a protein substance of the yeast plant. And therefore this remarkable result came out, that however much a plant may differ from an animal, yet that the essential constituent of the contents of these various cells or sacs of which the plant is made up, the nitrogenous protein matter, is the same in the animal as in the plant. And not only was this gradually discovered, but it was found that these semi-fluid contents of the plant cell had, in many cases, a remarkable power of 
contrast solicity, quite like that of the substance of animals. And about twenty-four or twenty-five years ago, namely about the year 1846, to the best of my recollection, a very eminent German botanist, Hugo von Moll, conferred upon this substance which is found in the interior of the plant cell, and which is identical with the matter found in the inside of the yeast cell, and which again contains an animal substance similar to that of which we ourselves are made up. He conferred upon this that title of protoplasm, which has brought other people a great deal of trouble since. I beg particularly to say that, because I find many people suppose that I was the inventor of that term, whereas it has been in existence for at least twenty-five years. And then other observers, taking the question up, came to this astonishing conclusion, working from this basis of the yeast, that the differences between animals and plants are not so much in the fundamental substances which compose them, not in the protoplasm, but in the manner in which the cells of which their bodies are built up have become modified. There is a sense in which it is true, and the analogy was pointed out very many years ago by some French botanists and chemists. There is a sense in which it is true that every plant is substantially an enormous aggregation of bodies similar to yeast cells, each having to a certain extent its own independent life. And there is a sense in which it is also perfectly true, although it would be impossible for me to give the statement to you with proper qualifications and limitations on an occasion like this, but there is also a sense in which it is true that every animal body is made up of an aggregation of minute particles of protoplasm comparable each of them to the individual separate yeast plant and those who are acquainted with the history of the wonderful revolution which has been worked into our whole conception of these matters in the last thirty years will bear me out in saying that the first germ of them to a very great extent was made to grow and fructify by the study of the yeast plant which presents us with living matter in almost its simplest condition then there is yet one last and most important bearing of this yeast question there is one direction probably in which the effects of the careful study of the nature of fermentation will yield results more practically valuable to mankind than any other. Let me recall to your minds the fact which I stated at the beginning of this lecture. Suppose that I had here a solution of pure sugar with a little mineral in it, and suppose it were possible for me to take upon the point of a needle one single solitary yeast cell measuring no bigger, perhaps, than the three thousandths of an inch in diameter, not bigger than one of those little coloured specks of matter in my own blood at this moment, the weight of which it would be difficult to express in a fraction of a grain, and put it into this solution. From that single one, if the solution were kept at a fair temperature in a warm summer's day, there would be generated in the course of a week enough to rely to form a scum at the top and to form lease at the bottom, and to change the perfectly tasteless and entirely harmless fluid syrup into a solution impregnated with the poisonous gas carbonic acid, impregnated with the poisonous substance alcohol and that in the virtue of the changes worked upon the sugar by the vital activity of these infinitely small plants. Now you see that this is a case of infection, and from the time that the phenomenon of fermentation were first carefully studied, it has constantly been suggested to the minds of thoughtful physicians that there was a something astoundingly similar between this phenomena of the propagation of fermentation by infection and congregation, and the phenomena of the propagation of diseases by the infection and contagion, out of this suggestion has grown that remarkable theory of many diseases which has been called the germ theory of disease, the idea in fact that we owe a great many diseases to particles having a certain life of their own, and which are capable of being transmitted from one living being to another, exactly as the yeast plant is capable of being transmitted from one tumbler of saccharine substance to another. And that is a perfectly tenable hypothesis. 
one which in the present state of medicine ought to be absolutely exhausted and shown not to be true until we take to others which have less analogy in their favour and there are some diseases most assuredly in which it turns out to be perfectly correct there are some forms of what are called malignant carbuncle which have been shown to be actually affected by a sort of fermentation, if I may use the phrase, by a sort of disturbance and destruction of the fluids of the animal body, set up by minute organisms which are the cause of this destruction and of this disturbance, and only recently the study of the phenomena which accompany vaccination has thrown an immense light in this direction tending to show by experiments of the same general character as to that which I referred as performed by Helmholtz, that there is a most astonishing analogy between the contagion of that healing disease and the contagion of destructive diseases, for it has been made out quite clearly by investigations carried out in France and in this country that the only part of the vaccine matter which is contagious which is capable of carrying on its influence in the organism of the child who is vaccinated is the solid particles and not the fluid by experiments of the most ingenious kind the solid parts have been separated from the fluid parts and it has then been discovered that you may vaccinate a child as much as you like with the fluid parts but no effect takes place though an excessively small portion of the solid particles, the most minute that can be separated, is amply sufficient to give rise to all the phenomena of the cowpox, by a process which we compare to nothing but the transmission of fermentation from one vessel into another. By the transport to the one of the terula particles which exists in the other, and it has been shown to be true of some of the most destructive diseases which infect animals, such diseases as a sheep pox, such diseases as the most terrible and destructive disorder of horses, glanders, that in these, also, the active power is the living solid particle, and that the inert part is the fluid. However, do not suppose that I am pushing the analogy too far. I do not mean to say that the active solid parts in these diseased matters of the same nature as living yeast plants, but so far as it goes, there is a most surprising analogy between the two. And the value of the analogy is that by following it out we may some time or other come to understand how these diseases are propagated just as we understand now about fermentation, and that in this way some of the greatest scourges which afflict the human race may be, if not prevented, at least largely alleviated. This is the conclusion of the statements which I wish to put before you. You see that we have not been able to have any accessories. If you will come in such numbers to hear a lecture of this kind, all I can say is that diagrams cannot be made big enough for you, and that it is not possible to show any experiments illustrative of a lecture on such a subject as I have to deal with. Of course my friends the chemists and physicists are very much better off, because they can not only show you experiments, but you can smell them and hear them. But in my case such aids are not attainable, and therefore I have taken a simple subject and have dealt with it in such a way that I hope you all understand it, at least so far as I have been able to put it before you in words, and having once apprehended such of the ideas and simple facts of the case as it was possible to put before you, you can see for yourselves the great and wonderful issues of such an apparently homely subject. End of Yeast by Thomas H. Huxley Umbrellas and Their History by William Sangster This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Seneca Souter Umbrellas and Their History by William Sangster Chapters 1 through 2 Munimum ad Imbrus Contents Chapter 1 Introductory Chapter 2 the Ancient History of the Umbrella. Chapter 3. 
The Umbrella in England Chapter 4 The Story of the Parachute Chapter 5 Umbrella Stories Chapter 6 The Regeneration of the Umbrella Chapter 1 Introductory Can it be possibly believed by the present eminently practical generation that a busy people like the English whose diversified occupations so continually expose them to the chances and changes of a proverbially fickle sky had ever been ignorant of the blessings bestowed on them by that dearest and truest friend in need and indeed the umbrella can you gentle reader for instance realize to yourself the idea of a man not possessing such a convenience for rainy weather why so much unmerited ridicule should be poured upon the head or handle of the devoted umbrella it is hard to say what is there comic in an umbrella plain useful and unpretending if any of the man's inventions ever deserved sincere regard the umbrella is we maintain that invention only a few years back those who carried umbrellas were held to be legitimate butts they were old fogies, careful of their health, and so on. But nowadays we are wiser. Everybody has an umbrella. It is both cheaper and better made than of old. Who then, so poor he cannot afford one? To see a man going out in the rain umbrella-less excites as much mirth as ever did the sight of those who first, wiser than their generation, availed themselves of this now universal shelter. Yet still a touch of the amusing clings to the gamp, as it is sarcastically called. What says Douglas Jared on the subject? There are three things that no man but a fool lends, or having lent is not in the most helpless state of mental crassitude if he ever hopes to get back again. These three things, my son, are books, umbrellas, and money. I believe a certain fiction of the law assumes a remedy to the borrower, but I know of no case in which any man being sufficiently dastard to give it his reputation as plaintiff in such a suit ever fairly succeeded against the wholesome prejudices of society. Umbrellas may be hedged about by cobweb statutes. I will not swear it is not so. There may exist laws that make such things property, but sure I am that the hissing contempt, the loud-mouthed indignation of all civilized society, would sibilate and roar at the bloodless poltroon who should engage law on his side to obtain for him the restitution of a lent umbrella. Strange to say, it is a fact, melancholy enough, but for all that too true, that our forefathers, scarce seventy years agone, meekly endured the pelting of the pitiless storm without that protection vouchsafed to their descendants by a kind fate and talented inventors the fact is the umbrella forms one of the numerous conveniences of life which seem indispensable to the present generation because just so long a time has passed since their introduction that the contrivances which in some certain degree previously supplied their place have passed into oblivion we feel the convenience we possess without being always aware of the gradations which intervened between it and the complete inconvenience of being continually unsheltered from the rain without any kind friend from whom to seek the protection so ardently desired fortunately a very simple process will enable the reader to realize the fact in its full extent he need only walk about in a pelting shower for some hours without an umbrella, or when the weight of a cloak would be insupportable, and at the same time remember that seventy years ago a luxury he can now purchase in almost every street was within the reach of but very few, while omnibuses and cabs were unknown. But apart from considerations of comfort, we may safely claim very much higher qualities as appertaining to the umbrella. We may even reckon it among the causes that have contributed to lengthen the average human life and hold it a most effective agent in the great increase which took place 
in the population of England between the years 1750 and 1850 as compared with the previous century. The Registrar General, in his census report, forgot to mention this fact, but there appears to us not the slightest doubt that the introduction of the umbrella at the latter part of the former and commencement of the present century must have greatly conduced to the improvement of the public health by preserving the bearer from the various and numerous diseases superinduced by exposure to rain. But perhaps we are a little harsh on our worthy ancestors. They may have possessed some species of protection from the rain on which they prided themselves as much as we do on our umbrellas, and regarding the new-fangled invention, as they no doubt termed it, as something exceedingly absurd, coxcombical, and unnecessary, while we, who are in possession of so many life comforts of which those of the good old times were supremely ignorant, among these we give the umbrella brevet rank, can afford to smile at such ebullitions as we have come across in those books of the day we have consulted, and to which we shall presently have an opportunity of referring. We can happily estimate the value of such a friend as the umbrella, the silent companion of our walks abroad, a companion incomparably superior to those slimy waterproof abominations so urgently recommended to us, for, at the least, the umbrella cannot be accused of injuring the health as they have been, as it appears, with very good reason. In fact, so long as the climate of England remains as it is, so long will umbrellas hold their ground in public esteem, and we do not believe that the clerk of the weather will allow himself to be bribed into any alteration, at least for trade considerations. Another remarkable proof of the utility of the umbrella may be found in the universality of its use. It has asserted its sway from the Indus to the Pole, and is to be met with in every possible variety, from the Napoleon blue silk of the London exquisite, to the coarse red or green cotton of the Turkish raya. Throughout the continent it forms the peaceful armament of the peasant, and no more curious sight can be imagined than the wide, uncovered marketplace of some quaint old German town during a heavy shower, when every industrial covers himself or herself with the aegis of a portable tent, and a bright array of brass ferrules and canopies of all conceivable hues which cotton can be made to assume, without losing its one quality of fast color, flash on the spectator's vision. The advantages of the umbrella being thus recognized, it must be confessed, that it has hitherto been treated in a most ungrateful and stepmotherly fashion. We fly to the umbrella when the sky is overcast. It affords a shelter in the hour of need, and the service is forgotten as soon as the necessity is relieved. We make abominable jokes upon the umbrella. We borrow it without compunction from any confiding friend, though with the full intention of never returning it. In fact, it has often been a matter of surprise to us that anyone ever does buy an umbrella, for where can the old umbrellas go to? Although that question has been asked often concerning the fate of pins, the fact as regards the former, looking at their size, is more curious, and yet, for all that, we treat it with shameful neglect, as if ashamed of a crime we have committed and anxious to conceal the evidence of our guilt." Let us then strive to afford such reparation as in our power lies, by giving a slight description of the umbrella and its history, making up for any deficiencies of our pen by the assistance of the artist's pencil. CHAPTER Two, THE ANCIENT HISTORY OF THE UMBRELLA The umbrella is derived from a stately family, that of the parasol, the legitimate use of the umbrella, though sufficiently obvious, being almost ignored in those countries whence it derives its being, since it was as a protection against the scorching heat of the sun that it was first used. The parasol, then, or umbrella, 
since for all practical purposes the two are really identical, dates from the earliest ages, some commentators of the Bible fancying they can discover it in places where a shade protecting from the sun is mentioned. This is not unlikely, but it is certain that the parasol has been in use from a very early period. Chinese history goes a very long way back inasmuch as it places the invention of these elegant machines many thousand years anterior to the mosaic date of the world's creation. Their antiquity among the Hindus is more satisfactorily proved by the following message from the dramatic poem of Sakantala, the date of which is supposed to be the sixth century of the Christian era. The cares of supporting the nation harass the sovereign, while he is cheered with the view of the people's welfare, as a huge umbrella, of which a man bears the staff in his own hand, fatigues while it shades him. The sovereign, like a branching tree, bears on his head the scorching sunbeams, while the broad shade allays the fever of those who seek shelter under him. The origin of the parasol is wrapped in considerable obscurity. Some profound investigators have supposed that large leaves tied to the branching extremities of a bough suggested the first idea of the invention. Others assert that the idea was probably derived from the tent, which remains in form unaltered to the present day. Dr. Morrison, however, tells us that the tradition existing in China is that the san, which signifies a shade for sun and rain, originated in standards and banners waving in the air. As this is a case in which we may quote the line, Who shall decide when doctors disagree? We may with safety assume that all are in the right, and that the parasol owed its origin to all or any of the above mentioned fortuitous circumstances. In the Ninevit sculptures, the umbrella or parasol appears frequently. Layard gives a picture of a bas relief representing a king in his chariot, with an attendant holding an umbrella over his head. It has a curtain hanging down behind but is otherwise exactly like those in use at the present time, the stretchers and sliding runner being plainly represented. To quote the words of that indefatigable traveller, the umbrella or parasol, the emblem of royalty so universally accepted by Eastern nations, was generally carried over the king in time of peace, and sometimes even in time of war. In shape it resembled very closely those in common use, but it is always open in the sculptures. It was edged with tassels, and was usually ornamented at the top by a flower or some other ornament. On the later bas-reliefs, a long piece of embroidered linen or silk falling from one side like a curtain appears to screen the king completely from the sun. The parasol was reserved exclusively for the monarch, and is never represented as borne over any other person. In Egypt again, the parasol is found in various shapes. In some instances it is depicted as a flabellum, a fan of palm leaves, or colored feathers fixed on a long handle resembling those now carried behind the Pope in processions. Sir Gardiner Wilkinson, in his work on Egypt, has an engraving of an Ethiopian princess traveling through Upper Egypt in a chariot. A kind of umbrella fastened to a stout pole rises in the center, bearing a close affinity to what are now termed chaise umbrellas. To judge from Wilkinson's account, the umbrella was generally used throughout Egypt, partly as a mark of distinction but more on account of its useful than its ornamental qualities. The same author is rather doubtful whether, in the picture given by him of a military chief in his chariot, the frame which an attendant holds up behind the rider is a shield or a screen, but the latter is the more probable supposition, as it has all the appearance of an umbrella without the usual handle. In some paintings on a temple wall, 
an umbrella is held over the figure of a god carried in procession and altogether we may perhaps consider it decided beyond dispute that the umbrella in its modern shape was used in egypt footnote to silence captious critics who may find fault with the designs of our artist we may once for all remark that an idealized conception of the figures is only is given the style of the ancient draughtsmen was by no means so perfect that we who live in a more civilized age should be entirely fettered by their conceptions and the records of ancient life are not nearly full enough to justify any one who may assert that the pictures in our pages are not as accurate as those in the british museum anyhow what they ought to have been rather than what the ancient were our artist has striven to delineate in persia the parasol is repeatedly found in the carved work of persepolis and sir john malcolm has an article on the subject in his history of persia in some sculptures of a very egyptian character by the way the figure of a king appears attended by a slave who carries over his head an umbrella with stretchers and runner complete in other scriptures on the rock at taktia boston supposed to be not less than twelve centuries old a deer hunt is represented at which a king looks on seated on a horse and having an umbrella borne over his head by an attendant this combination of business and comfort forcibly reminds us of a certain wet day in karlsruhe where we witness from the window of the hotel d'angleterre a stout martial-looking national guardsman marching to the exercising ground with an umbrella over his head and a maid-servant diligently tramping through the mud behind him bearing his musket as in assyria so in most other eastern countries this use of the parasol carried with it a peculiar and honourable significance the tradition relating to its origin in china has been already alluded to and we can trace notices of its use a very long way back indeed according to dr morrison umbrellas and parasols are referred to in books printed about a d three hundred but their use has been traced still further back than this a very ancient book of chinese ceremonies called chu li or the rites of chu directs that upon the imperial cars the dais should be placed the figure of this dais contained in the chinese edition of chu li and the particular description of it given in the explanatory commentary of lin hi yi both identify it with an umbrella the latter describes the dais to be composed of twenty-eight arcs which are equivalent to the whalebone ribs of the modern instrument and the staff supporting the covering to consist of two parts the upper being a rod three eighteenths of a chinese foot in circumference and the lower a tube six tenths in circumference into which the upper half is capable of sliding in the second tartar invasion of china the emperor's son was taken prisoner by the tartar chief and made to carry his umbrella when he went out hunting starting from the royal significance attached to the umbrella came a feeling of veneration for it very different from the contempt with which we are nowadays too apt to regard it it was represented by many ancient nations as shading their gods in the hindu mythology vishnu is said to have paid a visit to the infernal regions with his umbrella over his head one would think that in few places could an umbrella have been less appropriate but doubtless vishnu knew what he was about and had his own reasons for carrying his parapluie under his arm perhaps like mrs gamp he could not be separated from it so much for the ancient history of our subject in the east we may now go on to countries about which we know a little more than of ancient china and assyria in greece as becker tells us in his charicles the parasol was an indispensable adjunct to a lady of fashion 
it had also its religious signification in the Scioforia, the feast of athene scirius a white parasol was borne by the priestesses of the goddess from the acropolis to the phalaris in the feasts of dionysus in that at alia in arcadia where he was exposed under an umbrella and elsewhere the umbrella was used and in an old bas-relief the same god is represented as descending ad inferos with a small umbrella in his hand like vishnu before mentioned there was also another festival in which they appeared though without any mystical signification in the panathea the daughters of the metici or foreign residents carried parasols over the heads of the athenian women as a mark of inferiority tas parthenons ton metikon skidafe de forin and teus rompeus anankazan o ilian v h v i one footnote they compelled the maidens of the metici to act as umbrella bearers in the processions its use seems to have been confined to women in pausanias there is a description of a tomb near Pherae, a greek city on the tomb was the figure of a woman themapina de ote prosekeka skydan ferrosa pausanias lib v i i cap twenty two section six footnote and by her stood a female slave bearing a parasol aristophanes seems to mention it among the common articles of female use amen men garson eti kai nun tanchon o kanon oi kalathiokoi to sky deon aristophanes thesmoph eight twenty one footnote for now our loom is safe our weaving beam our baskets and umbrella it occurs frequently on vases and is in shape like that now used it could be put up and down ta de ota gaan son nay all except petanuto osper skydion kai pelen junageto arist ek thirteen forty seven footnote but your ears by jove are stretched out like a parasol and now again shut up which the scoliast explains ekatenatai decai systolatai proston katapeagonta keron footnote are opened and shut as need requires for a man to carry one was considered a mark of effeminacy as appears from the following fragment of anacreon skydiscaean elephantinian forae gunanexin autos athenius lib xii cap forty six section five three four footnote he carries an ivory parasol as women do plutarch makes aristides speak of xerxes as sitting under a canopy or umbrella looking at the sea fight cathinos hooped skiadi chrysae plut therm c sixteen p one twenty footnote sitting under a golden canopy and of cleopatra in like manner uposciaidi chrysopasto plut anton c twenty six p nine twenty seven footnote under a gold wrought canopy from greece it is probable that the use of the parasol passed to rome where it seems to have been commonly used by women while it was the custom even for effeminate men to defend themselves from the heat by means of the umbrella culum formed of skin or leather and capable of being lowered at will we find frequent reference to the umbrella in the roman classics and it appears that it was not unlikely a post of honor among maid-servants to bear it over their ma mistresses allusions to it are tolerably frequent in the poets virgil's munimen ad imbris 
footnote, a shelter for the shower. Probably has nothing to do with umbrellas, but more definite mention of them is not wanting. Ovid speaks of Hercules carrying the parasol of Omphal. Aria pelebant rapidos umbracula solis, qui tamen Hercule sustenere manis. Ove fast lib ii 131 i. Footnote A golden umbrella warded off the keen sun which even the hands of Hercules have borne. Marshall speaks of a servant carrying the parasol. Umbellium lusca lagdi ferris domine. Mart lib xi chapter 73. Footnote Mayest thou, Ligid, be parasol carrier for a pub-lined mistress. Juvenal mentions an umbrella as a present. En sui tu viridem umbellum sui succina mitas. Juve, IX, 50. Footnote. See to whom it is sent a green umbrella and amber ornaments. Ovid advises a lover to make himself agreeable by holding his mistress's parasol. Ipsi teni distentia suis umbracula virgis. Ove ars am ii 209. Footnote. Yourself hold up the umbrella spread out by its rods. This shows that the umbrella was of much the same construction as ours. A very common use for it was in the theatre, whenever, from wind or other cause, the valerium or huge awning stretched over the building, always open to the air, could not be put up. Asipi qui nimios vincent umbraculus solis sit licet et ventus tutua vela tegont. Mart lib xiv ep twenty eight. Footnote. Take this, which may shield you from the sun's excessive rays, so may your own sail shield you, even should the breeze blow. By tua vela is to be understood your own umbrella. And elsewhere the same writer gives the advice, Engrigier viam coelo licet usca sarino, Ad subitas nunquam scortia desit aquas. Man, lib, xiv, ep, 130. Footnote. Though with a bright sky you begin your journey, let this cloak ever be at hand in case of unexpected showers. It will be noticed from the above extracts that the umbrella does not appear to have been used among the Romans as a defense from rain, and this is curious enough, for we know that the theatres were protected by the valerium or awning, which was drawn across the arena whenever a sudden shower came on. Strange that this self-evident application of the umbrella should not have occurred to a nation generally so ingenious in the invention of every possible luxury. Possibly the expense bestowed on the decoration of the umbraculum was the reason for its not being applied to what we cannot but regard as a legitimate use. After the founding of Constantinople, the custom of great people carrying an umbrella seems to have arisen, but in Rome it appears only to have been used as a luxury, never as a mark of distinction. Pliny speaks of umbrellas made of palm leaves, but from other sources we may gather that the Romans, at all events in the days of the empire, lavished as much splendor on their umbrella as on all the articles of their dress. Ovid, as quoted above, speaks of an umbrella inwrought with gold, and Claudian in the same way has. Nu defensura calorum aurea submoviant rapidos umbracula solis. Claude, lib, v i i i. D. I. V. Cons. Honorie. 1. 340. Footnote. Nor, to protect you from the heat, let the golden umbrella ward off the keen sun's rays. 
From this we may conclude that the carrying an umbrella was in some sort a mark of effeminacy. In another place, carrying the umbrella is alluded to as one of the duties of a slave. Jam non umbracula tolunt virginibus, etc. Footnote. Now they do not carry girls' parasols. Gorius says that the umbrella came to Rome from the Etruscans, and it certainly appears not infrequently on Etruscan vases, as also on later gems. One gem, figured by Pacudius, shows an umbrella with a bent handle sloping backwards. Strabo describes a sort of screen or umbrella worn by Spanish women, but this is not like a modern umbrella. Very many curious facts are connected with the use of the umbrella throughout the East, where it was nearly everywhere one of the insignia of royalty, or at least of high rank. M. de Lubre, who was an envoy extraordinary from the French king to the king of Siam in 1687 and 1688, wrote an account entitled a new historical relation of the kingdom of siam which was translated in sixteen ninety three into english according to his account the use of the umbrella was granted to some only of the subjects by the king an umbrella with with several circles as if two or three umbrellas were fastened on the same stick was permitted to the king alone the nobles carried a single umbrella with painted cloths hanging from it the talipoins who seem to have been a sort of siamese monk had umbrellas made of a palm leaf cut and folded so that the stem formed a handle the same writer describes the audience chamber of the king of siam in his quaint old french he says pour tout mouble il n'y a quoi trois parasols en devant la fenêtre en offrande et deux receptrons aux deux côtés de la fenêtre le parasol est censé par la seque le des et la insulici tavernier in his voyage to the east says that on each side of the mogul's throne were two umbrellas and also describes the hall of the king of Ava as decorated with an umbrella. The Maratha princess, who reigned at Pune and Satara, had the title of Chahatrapati, Lord of the Umbrella. Chahatra, or Chata, has been suggested as the derivation of Satrapace, Extrapace, in Theompompus and it seems a probable derivation enough. The chata of the Indian and Burmese princes is large and heavy, and requires a special attendant who has a regular position in the royal household. In Ava it seems to have been part of the king's title, that he was king of the white elephant and lord of the twenty-four umbrellas. Persons of rank in the Mahatra court who were not permitted the right of carrying an umbrella, used a screen, a flat, vertical disc called A'a Abgir, carried by an attendant. Even now the umbrella has not lost its emblematic meaning. In 1855, the King of Burma directed a letter to the Marquis of Dalhousie, in which he styles himself his great, glorious, and most excellent majesty, who reigns over the kingdoms of Thanaparanta, Tapapanida, and all the great umbrella-wearing chiefs of the eastern countries. Thus we see that the same signification which was attached to the umbrella by the ancient people of Nineveh still remains connected with it, even in our own time. In the great exhibition of 1851 was the splendid umbrella belonging to His Highness the Maharaja of Najpur. The ribs and stretchers, sixteen in number, divided the umbrella into as many segments covered with silk, exquisitely embroidered with gold and silver ornaments. 
the upper part of the design was complete in each department but at the lower it was formed into a graceful running border to which a fringe was attached the handle was hollow and formed of thick silver plates in bengal it appears that no distinction is attached to the umbrella since the poorer classes there used a chata or small umbrella made of leaves of the lucerata peltata these are of conical form and have numerous ribs and stretchers the higher class in assam use a similar umbrella in china the use of the umbrella does not appear to have been confined as in india and persia to royalty but it was always as it is now a mark of high rank though not exclusively so there seems to have been no particular rule about it but it carried with it some peculiar distinction for on one occasion at least we hear of twenty-four umbrellas being carried before the emperor when he went out hunting here it is what it appears to be in no other eastern country a defence against rain rather than sun and while the richer people do not go out much while it is wet the poorer classes wear a dress that protects them from the weather in the rainy season for instance a chinese boatman wears a coat of straw and a hat of straw and bamboo such a dress of course renders an umbrella superfluous and it matters little to the wearer how hard the rain may pelt nevertheless great numbers of umbrellas are exported from china to india the indian ar archipelago and even south america in the eighteen fifty one exhibition two only were shown of them the report says they present nothing remarkable beyond the great number of ribs which amount to forty two the ribs are formed of wood and instead of being embraced by the fork of the stretcher as in the case of european umbrellas they have a groove cut out in the middle of their lengths into which the stretcher is secured by a stud of wood the head of each rib fits into a notch formed in the ring of wood which is fastened on to the top of the stick there being a separate notch for each rib the slide is of wood and has forty-two notches namely one for each stretcher which like the ribs is formed of wood the covering of the umbrellas exhibited is one of oily paper coarsely painted but the use of the umbrella travelled westward and with it the custom of regarding it as a mark of dignity amongst the arabs the umbrella was a mark of distinction niebuhr who travelled in southern arabia describes a procession of the iman of sanaa in it the iman and each of his princes of his numerous family caused a madala or large umbrella to be carried by his side and it is a privilege which in this country is appropriate to princes of the blood just as the sultan of constantinople permits none but his vizier to have his cake cheek or gondola covered behind to keep him from the heat of the sun the same writer goes on to say that many independent chiefs of yemen carried madalas as a mark of their independence in morocco according to a passage quoted by a writer in the penny magazine from the travels of ali bey the emperor alone and his family are allowed to use it the retinue of the sultan was composed of a troop of from fifteen to twenty men on horseback about a hundred steps behind them came the sultan who was mounted on a mule with an officer bearing his umbrella who rode by his side also on a mule the umbrella is a distinguishing sign of the sovereign of morocco nobody but himself his sons or his brothers dare to make use of it in turkey the umbrella is common a vestige of the reverence once attached to it remains in the custom of compelling everybody who passes the palace where the sultan is residing to lower his umbrella as a mark of respect and at all events some years back before the crimean war had introduced so many europeans to constantinople any one neglecting to pay the required reverence stood in considerable danger of a lively reminder from the sentry on duty 
Before concluding this chapter, it may not be out of place to make a few remarks as to the origin of the word umbrella, as we have done regarding the thing itself. The English name is borrowed from the Italian ombrella. The Latin term umbrella is applied by botanists to those blossoms which are clustered at the extremities of several spokes, radiating from the common stem like the metallic props of the umbrella. The name, as is seen, does not give the slightest idea of the use of the article designated, as is often the case with words we practical folk employ, and we might as well take a lesson from our cousins, German or French, who have invented distinct names for the weapon used to ward off the rays of the sun, and that employed against rain, namely, Rengenschirm, Parapluie, Sonnenschirm, Parasol. These are better than our names, even though both the French words labor under the disadvantage of being hybrids, half Greek and half Latin. Such, then, is the ancient history of the umbrella, as far as our research has enabled us to trace it, and indeed we are now not a little surprised at the result of these labors which have enabled us to discover so much. End of Umbrellas and Their History by William Sangster, Chapters 1 through 2. Recording by Seneca Suter, Denver, Colorado, August 2011. Let's Collect Rocks and Shells by the Shell Union Oil Corporation. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anne Boulay. Let's Collect Rocks and Shells by the Shell Union Oil Company. Introduction Millions of people throughout the world have found many hours of pleasure, adventure, and education by collecting either rocks or shells. This booklet won't tell you everything there is to know about rocks and shells. That would require many large volumes. We only want to arouse your curiosity about two delightful pastimes that are so broad and varied that they can lead to a career or a satisfying hobby. Shell Oil Company's interest in the subjects comes from its history and the nature of its business. The name, chosen by a company that was founded years before anyone thought of drilling for oil, comes from the seashells this company brought from the Orient for use in mother-of-pearl items such as buttons and knife handles. Now its world-famous emblem, the pectin, is recognized by millions of people in every walk of life. It's on service stations, trucks, buildings, oil derricks, and chemical plants. Even the company's industrial lubricants are named for shells because shells have the same scientific names everywhere in the world. For an oil company, rocks have a special interest. Crude oil is found not in underground lakes or pools, but in the tiny spaces between grains of sand or in the pores of rocks. Only certain types of rock formations are favorable to the accumulation of oil. Thus, oil men need to know everything they can about the right kind of rocks. Shell has scientists who work with rocks all day and laboratories filled with rock, mineral, and crystal specimens. We are always learning new things about them. The pages that follow provide basic information about two subjects that can be richly rewarding whether you follow them for profit, as Shell does, or for pleasure, as millions of people around the world do. Seashells. What are they? First, the seashell is one of the 100,000 species of backboneless animals belonging to the zoological group known as the mollusca. Mollusks include not only the familiar clams, scallops, and snails, but also the squids, octopus, and chambered nautilus. Other shells 
found in the ocean include those of crabs, lobsters, barnacles, and sea urchins. True molluscan shells come in two main varieties, bivalves and univalves. Bivalves have two valves, fitting together along a tooth hinge on one side, and kept closed by a means of adductor muscles. Univalves have only one shell, usually coiled, but sometimes shaped like a cap or miniature volcano. Some marine univalves conceal themselves inside with an operculum, which covers the open end of the shells like a trap door. Although shells take on many different shapes, they are much alike inside. Each has a foot, a breathing siphon, a tiny brain and heart, and a fleshy mantle which secretes lime for shell building. Most true mollusks have eyes, but a few are blind. Many have teeth, called redulae. Like any other animal, the mollusk generally moves about. It pushes along on the ocean floor on its foot, or it might swim a little. It lays millions of eggs and hatches countless baby mollusks. It lives its life in its shell, lugging it along, snuggling into it when alarmed, burrowing into mud, fastening itself to a rock and creating ingenious camouflage. It builds its calcareous house with a great instinctive talent for color and sculpture, and the closer it lives to the tropical zones, the more beautifully spectacular is its art. The two parts of a bivalve shell are like thin saucers, concave inside, convex outside. The inside is smooth, polished. The outside is rougher, sometimes with graceful ribs or concentric ridges or combinations of both. Univalves are conical and spiraling with a series of whorls coming down like widening steps from the tiny nucleus on top. Univalves may have spines on their shoulders. The opening, called the aperture, has a delicate right-hand rim called the lip, and a heavy left-hand edge called the columella. Figure captions. Bivalves anatomy. A. Foot. B. Adductor muscles. C. Gills. D. Hinge. E. Adductor muscles. F. Siphon. G. Stomach. H. Mantle. Oysters, clams, mussels, all have them. Univalve's anatomy, as before, A, foot, B, siphon, C, mantle, but also D, operculum. Univalves include whelks, winkles, conchs. Chambered nautilus is brother to the octopus, but he wears his castle permanently and on the outside the shell as an architect how does he do it picture a vast undersea factory with billions of shells in constant production each is made slowly and entirely of lime which the little animal inside extracts from its food almost from the first day of its life each shell builder flawlessly follows the shape and design of the species to which it belongs all these sea animals come from eggs, all different according to species, but all laid in measureless abundance, sometimes released into the open ocean, sometimes protected in homemade nests, sometimes encased in capsules strung like beads. Hatched, most baby mollusks swim freely for a while, their tiny transparent bodies almost invisible to the naked eye. Then they start building a heavier shell and sink to the bottom. Each shell's mantle contains a network of microscopic tubes. Each tube secretes a tiny amount of lime, which instantly adheres to the shell. The animal builds his shell to the proper size and thickness and determines its ridges and whorls. Some kinds of shells take two to five years to reach maturity. Others keep growing all their lives. Color tubes are space-like holes on a player piano roll, allowing pigments to tint the shell at the right spots in the growing design. Many shells are covered with a self-made brown sheath, the periostracum. 
Figure captions. Most shells don't change basic structure as they grow. Young cowries, left, however, alter greatly in maturity, right. Tough, lozenge-shaped egg cases. On this string hatch baby whelks, like ones shown. Newborn mollusks are usually free-swimming, moved by hairs. The shell is there, but transparent for a few days. Let's meet some shells. Latin abounds in conchology, as you've already noticed. Why? Well, because this is a hobby and science that spans the world. Englishmen, Frenchmen, Greeks, and Indians all have their own local names for shells. But scientists everywhere give things in nature Latin names. Shells of the same sort carry the same Latin label on every beach in every sea. Much of the fascination of shell collecting is learning these names and how they are derived. For shells have been named for almost everything. We can't catalog 100,000 species here, but let's call off the names of a few of the interesting specimens you might come across. Many shells have wonderfully descriptive names. For example, there's Arca zebra, which has stripes and looks like a miniature turkey wing and is commonly called turkey wing. Then there's a scallop called the lion's paw, Nerita peloronta, or bleeding tooth, and Cypriae cervinetta, little deer cowrie, which resembles a spotted fawn. Cowrie is a common name for a kind of shell used as money in parts of Africa and Asia. There are shells named for people. Conus juliae, Julia's cone shell. Pleurotomella, Jeffreysii, Jeffrey's pleurotomella. And Aclis walleri, Waller's Aclis. Many are named for the place they were first discovered. Eurosalpinx, Tampensis, Tampa Drill. Iphigenia Brasiliana, Brazil Clam. Some shells take their names from flowers. Fascoriolaria tulipa, tulip shell. Many get names from mammals, not always too accurately. Cyprey tigris and Cyprey zebra both have spots, not stripes. But Cyprey talpa, mole cowrie, does not look like a mole. Then there's, let's skip the Latin this time, magpie shell, model dove shell, mouse cone, horse conch, checkered pheasant, and Cuban frog shell. There's mythology, Venus, Neptunia, Pandora, Tritonis. Music, Buxinum, trumpet, Citharis, guitar, Harpa. Religion is represented too. In the genus Mitra, our species Pontificalis, Episcopalis, Papalis, and Patriarchalis. Some other fanciful names are Great Heart, Jewel, Box, Rising Sun, Checkerboard, Woodlouse, Writing Shell, Sundial, Keyhole Limpet, Red Turban, and Black Lace Murex. And that's where we stop and draw a breath. You'll find others. There are literally thousands more. You've got to be a detective. These little animals are the natural food for many of the larger undersea creatures, so one of their greatest talents is hiding. Approaching danger, whether from octopus, fish, or man, arouses caution in a small mollusk, and it becomes as inconspicuous as it can. This can be pretty inconspicuous, as the novice conchologist learns early in his search. Remember, by all means, don't be a landlubber, get into the water. No matter where you go shelling up north, down south, in the west, or in the tropics, you won't get any satisfaction, or value, from collecting dead shells washed up on a beach. To build a good collection, you should take your mollusks alive, then clean and prepare them yourself. More about that later. You won't find live ones unless you go where they live. Figure Captions 
conus spurious alphabet cone certoplura costata angel wing terebrandis locata atlantic auger murex delectus lace murex epitonium humphreysi humphreys weddell trap luropectin nodotus lion's paw fasciolaria distens banded tulip diadora cayenensis keyhole limpet anatina plicatella channel duck where to look many shells are endowed with perfect camouflage the colorful sea fans off florida are hiding places for the simnia whose long purple or yellow shells clinging to sea fans and matching perfectly in color are nearly indiscernible other shells create disguises as they go along in florida waters a pile of dead and broken shells may be worth investigating xenophora conchiliophora carrier shell might be under it it cements the old discarded shells to its own northern tide pools accommodate many kinds of litterina periwinkles these pretty little shells in shades of yellow to brown are well concealed among the dimly lit seaweed along any rocky shore limpets grow as wide as two inches but remain hard to find their turtle back shells covered with moss look just like rocks and they stick so tightly to the big rocks that even when they are seen they can scarcely be pried loose Abundant on wave-washed beaches of both the north and the south are dead shells of another perfectly camouflaged clam called Arca. When alive, the shells are covered with hairy, brown or black epidermis and look like pebbles among tufts of seaweed and marine grass. On the west coast, the abalone is a most typical species in addition to being a delicious food. The bright-hued shell is widely used for souvenirs, such as ashtrays, and is in demand for buttons and decorative purposes. Most shells of interest to the collector are found in the sea, but not all. Living forest mollusks have been found 18,000 feet high in the Himalayas. And in this country, a great variety of mollusks live in rivers, ponds, and even hot springs. Several species are peculiar to the Nile River. Also, species of mollusks live on land, for example, the common garden snail. Wherever you go, be it the South Seas, a mountain lake, or the shoals off the Gulf Coast, you'll find shells to collect and opportunities to expand your hobby. Collectors should familiarize themselves with local regulations, in some areas, such as parks and marine sanctuaries, collection of shells and other marine organisms may be restricted or prohibited. Starting a collection, here's how. Knowing where to look for shells, you probably wonder when is the best time. The answer is, any time. Mollusks know no season. Some species appear suddenly for several days, and then vanish. Others can be found almost any time. Most mollusks appear at night, and others work only in the daytime and go out of sight after dark. The tides may have something to do with it. So does the weather. It can be hot or cold, dry or rainy. While you won't find the same shell at all times, you'll find a great variety at any time. What to take? The things pictured on page 8 should be enough. If you're going out on the coral reefs along Florida, it would be wise to keep your legs covered as protection against stings or scratches. Don't forget to wear some kind of shoes in the water. Even though you're wearing a mask or goggles, take along a gig or some slender stick and feel your way along so you don't fall into a hole you can't see in the deceptive near tropical waters. If, despite precautions, you get a sea urchin's needle-like spine broken off in your skin, soak the wound in vinegar which will dissolve the fragments and stop the pain in a few minutes.
tiny shells buried in sand can be netted in your sieve clinging ones must be chiseled off rocks frail delicate clingers should be gently nudged loose with tweezers submerged sandbars are good spots to find several kinds of univalves and bivalves but the latter will dig themselves quickly out of sight as far down as several feet when you see one going underground don't dig directly over it you might break its shell instead dig to one side and break the mud or sand away with your hands after you've had a good day's haul and a rest you'll need one you must clean your shells put your tiniest most fragile ones in rubbing alcohol put the rest in a pot of fresh water and slowly bring it to a boil let them cool in the water slowly to prevent the glossy shells from cracking when cool your bivalves will be gaping open simply scrape them clean your univalves will be more difficult remove the animal with a crochet hook or other piece of bent wire turning it gently with the spiral try to get it out whole to save yourself trouble save the univalve's operculum and slice it off the muscle that holds it it will preserve indefinitely and is a valuable part of the shell clean the shell's exterior by scraping it gently with a dull knife or nail file then soaking it in a clorox solution one cup to two quarts of water for two hours some will be covered with an ugly skin scientists keep this intact and you should try too the best collections have two of each species one with and one without the epidermis after your clean shells have dried in shade not sun go over them with a rag dampened in light oil this ensures preservation and restores their natural luster every three months or so rub them with oil again their most delicate colors will remain brilliant for years don't ever use shellac lacquer or varnish get a reference book from your library and identify your shells keep an account of when and where you collect them store your shells in closed containers to protect them from sunlight and dust almost any set of small drawers or a cabinet will do match boxes or pill boxes are excellent for small specimens for display purposes glass covered cases are best to prevent handling of the shells a shell's beauty is often deceptive many unattractive and drab shells are worth hundreds of dollars while the most colorful are frequently valued at a dollar or less the rarity of a species determines its value a truly valuable shell may come from deep inaccessible waters or remote lands or it may be one of an extinct species a slit shell collected one hundred fathoms down in waters off the british west indies is valued at one thousand dollars another undersea treasure the glory of the seas was first found in seventeen seventy one and one time would bring the conchologist fifteen hundred dollars the greatest rarities however are truly valueless and are not for sale and there it is the fascinating hobby of shell collecting it's a lot of work but a lot of fun too figure captions take a sieve or an orange sack besides carrying your shells it may help you catch them a few pint bottles will hold delicate ones mask or goggles is essential for looking under water bathing suit or old clothes of course high shoes or sneakers never go barefoot heavy cloth gloves watch for sunburn gig or fish spear if you're going south to keep pesky crabs sea urchins off clam digging hoe or trowel for burrowing shells vinegar for first aid in case you're stuck by urchin spines chisel and hammer to get the clingers spatula for frail limpets you may find other hardware handy but these are the basic now let's look at rocks rocks are made of minerals rocks to begin with are made of minerals what is a mineral the definition may sound difficult a mineral is a chemical element or compound combination of elements 
occurring naturally as the result of inorganic processes. But don't be discouraged. Things will clear up soon. The world contains more than 1,100 kinds of minerals. These can be grouped in three general classes. 1. Metallic minerals. These include things most of us would think of if we are asked to name some minerals. Familiar examples are copper, silver, mercury, iron, nickel, and cobalt. Most of them are found in combination with other things, as ores. We get lead from galena, or lead sulfide. Tin comes from the ore cassiterite. Zinc from sapphilarite, and zinc blend, or blackjack. Chromium, that makes the family car shiny, comes from chromite. Many minerals yield aluminum. Uranium occurs in about 50 minerals, nearly all rare. 24 karat gold is a metallic mineral. A 14 karat gold ring contains 14 24ths, or 58% gold. An average sample of earth contains 9% aluminum, 5.5% iron, 0.1% zinc, 0.008% copper, 0.004% tin, 0.002% lead, 0.0005% uranium, and 0.0000006% gold or platinum. It would be hopelessly expensive to recover such metals from an average ton of earth. That's why metallic minerals are taken from concentrated deposits in mines. Many valuable minerals are found in veins running through rock. Veins can be formed when a. Mineral-laden groundwater seeps into cracks, evaporates, and leaves mineral grains that build up into a vein. b. Hot water from deep within the earth fills the crack, then cools and deposits much of the material in solution as minerals in a vein, sometimes including metals such as gold and silver. c. Molten gaseous material squeezes into cracks near the earth's surface, then slowly hardens into a vein. 2. Non-metallic minerals. These are of great importance to certain industries. You will find them in insulation and filters. They are used exclusively in the ceramic and chemical industries. They include sulfur, graphite, the lead in pencils, gypsum, halite, rock salt, borax, talc, asbestos, and quartz. Undoubtedly, you'll have some non-metallic minerals in your collection. Rocks containing asbestos are especially handsome and varied. 3. Rock-forming minerals. These are the building materials of the earth. They make mountains and valleys. They furnish the ingredients of soil and the salt of the sea. They are largely silicates. That is, they contain silicone and oxygen. Silicone is a non-metallic element, always found in combination with something else. It is second only to oxygen as the chief elementary constituent of the Earth's crust. Other rock-forming minerals are the large family of micas, with names like muscovite and phlogopite. There are the feldspars, including albite and orthoclase. Others are amphibioles, pyroxenes, zeolites, garnets, and many others you may never find or hear about unless you become a true mineralogist. A rock may be made almost entirely of one mineral or of more than one mineral. Rocks containing different combinations of the same minerals are different. Even two things made of the same single mineral can be quite different. Carbon may turn up as a lump of coal or a diamond. How minerals got their names. Names of most minerals end in ite. Apolite, calcite, dolomite, fluorite, but many do not. Amphibole, copper, the most common pure metal in rocks. Feldspar, galena, gypsum, hornblende, mica, quartz. Many minerals take their names from a Greek word referring to some outstanding property of the mineral. For example, hematite, an oxide of iron, 
was named about 325 B.C., from the Greek hyma, or blood, because of the color of its powder. Some minerals are named for the locality in which they were first discovered. Coloradoite was first found in Colorado. Benitoite turned up in San Benito County, California. And so with Labradorite and Brazilite. Other minerals got their names from famous people. Willemite is named in honor of Willem I, King of the Netherlands. The great German poet philosopher, Goethe, could turn up in your collections as Gothite. And there's Smithsonite, named for James Smithson, the founder of the Smithsonian Institute. Figure captions. Gold, jasper, uncut diamond, quartz, violet in color, halite, Carlsbad, New Mexico, calcite, South Dakota, copper, turquoise, brilliant color, out of this world. Some minerals come from outer space. They're meteorites, which are rock fragments. Every day, hundreds of millions of them enter the Earth's atmosphere. Most of them, however, are burned up by the heat from air friction and never reach the ground. Meteors large enough to reach the Earth are called meteorites. Most minerals found in meteorites are the same as those we have on Earth, but there are some rare minerals known only in meteorites. Two of them are coenite and scriversite. Main kinds of rocks. Rocks are the building blocks of the Earth's crust. They may be massive, as in granite ledges, or tiny. Soil, gravel, sand, and clay are rocks. There are three main types of rocks. One, igneous rocks, are those formed at very high temperatures or molten materials. They come from magmas, molten mixtures of minerals, often containing gases. They come from deep below the surface of the earth. If they cool off while below the surface, they form intrusive rocks, which may later be revealed by erosion. When magmas reach the surface red hot, they form extrusive rocks, such as volcanic rocks. Thus granite is igneous, intrusive rock. Lava is an igneous, extrusive rock. Notice how the type of rock tells its past history, if you know what to look for. 2. Sedimentary rocks are formed by the action of wind, water, or organisms. They cover about three-quarters of the Earth's surface. Most are laid down as sediments on the bottom of rivers, lakes, and seas. Many have been moved by water, wind, waves, currents, ice, or gravity. The most common sedimentary rocks are sandstones, limestones, conglomerates, and shales. Oil is found in sedimentary formations. 3. Metamorphic rocks are those that have been changed from what they were at first into something else, by heat, pressure, or chemical action. All kinds of rocks can be changed. The result is a new crystalline structure, the formation of new minerals, or a change in the rock's texture. Slate was once shale. Marble came from limestone. Nice is perhaps reworked granite. Figure captions. Igneous rocks are formed at high temperatures or from molten materials. They come from deep beneath the earth. They can be intrusive or extrusive, depending on where they cool off. Sedimentary rocks are formed by the action of wind, water, or organisms. They usually are laid down on the bottom of rivers, lakes, and seas. Most of the Earth's surface is covered by these rocks. Oil is found in sedimentary formations. Metamorphic rocks are changed from their original state into something else. Heat, pressure, chemical action change the crystalline structure, the texture, even form new minerals. All kinds of rock can be changed. A word on fossils. Perhaps you'll find rocks containing fossils, or even fossils by themselves. They should form a separate part of your collection. Fossils are the remains, or the outlines, of former plant and animal life buried in rock. The older the rock, the simpler the plant and animal life it contains. 
Thus fossils can give a clue to the age of the rock strata. Fossils can teach history. They tell us about plants and animals that are now extinct, the dinosaur, for example. They can also tell of ancient climates. Coral found in rocks in Greenland suggests it must have once been warm. Remains of fir and spruce trees have been found in the tropics. How are fossils formed? Teeth, bone, and wood don't last long in their original state. However, buried materials decompose, leaving a film of carbon as a fossil. This results in a leaf tracery, or the outlines of some simple animal. On a gigantic scale, this process of forming carbon has resulted in our great coal deposits. Sometimes the buried material is gradually replaced by silica or other substances, making petrified objects. Wood can be replaced, cell by cell, by agate or opal, from silica-bearing water. The result is petrified wood, the finest examples of which can be found in our Petrified Forest National Park in Arizona. This can happen to shells, too. How about molds and casts of footprints of ancient animals? A brontosaurus might have stomped along a soft, warm mud eons ago. The mud hardened, and later, another layer of soft earth covered the print, preserving it. Collecting If you want to collect rocks and minerals, just for the sake of having them, you can buy specimens. Many can be purchased for 25 cents to a dollar each, while a rare specimen can cost hundreds of dollars. The true pleasure is in finding your own samples. Later, when you have a good size collection, you can fill gaps by buying specimens or swapping extras with other collectors. You'll be amazed at the number of amateur collectors. Perhaps no branch of science owes more to the work of amateurs than mineralogy. Our great collection of minerals in the U.S. National Museum in Washington, D.C., was gathered almost entirely by two amateurs who devoted many years and much money to their hobby. Where to look? Look for pebbles by the roadside, in beds of streams and river banks. Go out into the country for ledges on hillsides. Every road cut, cliff, bank, excavation, or quarry shows rocks and minerals. Railroad cuts, rock pits, dump piles around mines building sites, they'll all yield specimens. Some of the best mineral specimens collected in New York City came from skyscraper and subway excavations. Help a New England farmer clear his field, and you'll have more rocks than you know what to do with. As for reference books, many states publish guides to mineral deposits. Mineralogical magazines list mineral localities. Tips for the field. Do not try to collect too much at once. Work early in the day or late in the afternoon. A hot sun on bare rock can make you sizzle, especially if you're loaded with equipment and samples. Here's the equipment to take. Newspapers for wrapping samples. Notebook and pencil. Geologist pick. Cold chisel. Magnifying glass. Compass. Heavy gloves. A knife and a knapsack. Later on, you may want a Geiger counter for spotting radioactive rocks. Be selective. Hand-sized specimens are the best. If your sample is too large, trim it to size, showing its most striking feature to best advantage. When you wrap the sample in newspaper, include a note telling when and where you found it. This information will be transcribed to a filing card when you add the specimens to your display, so make it as complete and accurate as you can. When you get home, clean specimens with soapy warm water applied with a soft brush. Soluble minerals like halite can't be washed, but should be rinsed with alcohol. A coat of clear lacquer will protect some samples against dirt. Arranging your collection. Put a spot of enamel on the specimen. Write on the spot in India ink a catalog number, and have this number refer to a card in a file drawer. The card should list date, place found, identification of specimen, etc. Group your samples. 
metallic minerals, semi-precious stones, non-metallic minerals. Display them on a shelf, or buy or build a mineral cabinet with partition drawers. For smaller samples, use a Riker mount with a glass top. Figure captions. A common rock. Here's the equipment to take. Newspapers for wrapping samples. Notebook and pencil. Geologist pick. Cold chisel. Magnifying glass. Compass. Heavy gloves. A knife and a knapsack. What do I have? How do you identify specimens? Get books and magazines on rocks and minerals. Many have colored pictures that help. But identification is best made by noting the physical characteristics of the rock or mineral. For minerals, there is a hardness scale in which a mineral of the higher number can scratch a mineral of the lower number, but not be scratched by it. The scale is 1. Talc 2. Gypsum 3. Calcite 4. Fluorite 5. Apatite 6. Orthoclase 7. Quartz 8. Topaz 9. Corundum 10. Diamond Remember it by this silly sentence. The girls can flirt and other queer things can do. When on a trip, remember that a fingernail has a hardness of 2.5, a penny 3, a knife blade 5.5, and a steel file 6.5. Use these to scratch your sample and you can get an approximate idea of its hardness. You can buy a set of hardness points. They're pointed pieces of minerals set in brass tubes, each marked with a hardness scale. The set costs about $30 half that if you assemble your own. Other tests for identifying minerals include specific gravity, weight of mineral compared to the weight of an equal volume of water, optical properties, and crystal form, color, and luster. Minerals differ in cleavage and fracture, how they come apart when cut. They leave distinctive streaks on unglazed porcelain. Some are magnetic, some have electrical properties, some glow under ultraviolet or black light. Some are radioactive. Some fuse under a low flame, while others are unaffected. Many studies with the dissolved minerals can identify it beyond doubt. But most of these are too complicated for the beginner. As you read, look at pictures and samples, talk with rock hounds or leaders of mineralogy clubs. You'll get better at identifying rocks. Museum experts and your state's geologists can help too. Figure captions, specific gravity balance, blowpipe analysis. Gems for the lucky few. If you're lucky, you'll find gems or semi-precious stones. Gems are the finer, more crystalline forms of minerals, which are ordinarily less beautiful and spectacular. True gems are diamonds, emeralds, rubies, and sapphires. All others are semi-precious and ornamental. Diamonds are pure carbon, but did you know that rubies and sapphires are corundum minerals? Rare forms of alumina. In slightly different form, they turn up on emery paper. Other stones you might find are the quartz gems. Rose quartz, amethyst, rock crystal, agate, jasper, bloodstone, or opaque gems such as jade, moonstone, lapis lazuli, obsidian, and turquoise. You don't have to find them. You can buy gems in the rough or in blanks, then cut and polish them to make your own jewelry or decorations. This takes practice, plus a cutting and polishing outfit, wood vise, maybe a diamond wheel. Or you can join a lapidary club that might already have the equipment. First learn to make cabochons, stones with round or curved surfaces. Then try cutting facets or faces in transparent gems. Learn by reading, working with an expert, trial and error. Making jewelry is fun, and collecting gems is as interesting as collecting rocks and minerals. It brings the world into your home. From the west comes agates, jaspers, petrified woods. From the east, colorful marbles, serpentines, granites. 
alaska idaho connecticut or austria will yield dark red garnets fine moonstones come from ontario quartz crystals from hot springs arkansas can be compared with similar ones from the swiss alps or brazil rock collecting is a hobby you can tailor to your taste but whether you concentrate on an area close to home or travel across whole continents you'll find that the pleasure and knowledge you gain from your collection are matched by the fun and adventure of the search figure captions drop sticks to hold stones diamond cutting wheel end of let's collect rocks and shells by the shell union oil company Essay 6 of Practical Essays. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The University Ideal, Past and Present by Alexander Bain. Gentlemen, by your flattering estimate of my services, I have been unexpectedly summoned from retirement to assume the honours and the duties of the purple, and to occupy the most historically important office in the universities of Europe. The present demands upon the rectorship somewhat resemble what we are told of the Homeric chief, who, in company with his council or senate, the boule, and the popular assembly, or agora, made up the political constitution of the tribe. The functions of the chief, it is said, were to supply wise counsel to the boule, as we might call our court, and unctuous eloquence to the agora. The second of these requirements is what weighs upon me at the present moment. Whatever may have been the practice of my predecessors, generally strangers to you, it would be altogether unbecoming in me to travel out of our university life for the materials of an address. My remarks, then, will principally bear on the university ideal. The Higher Teaching in Greece To the Greeks we are indebted for the earliest term of the university. It was with them chiefly that education took that great leap, the greatest ever made, from the traditional teaching of the home, the shop, the social surroundings, to schoolmaster teaching, properly so called nowadays we schoolmasters think so much of ourselves that we do not make full allowance for that other teaching which was for unknown ages the only teaching of mankind the greeks were the first to introduce not perhaps the primary schoolmaster for the ars but certainly the secondary or higher schoolmaster known as rhetorician or sophist who taught the higher professions while their philosophers or wise men introduced a kind of knowledge that gave scope to the intellectual faculties with or without professional applications the very idea of our faculty of arts so self-asserting were these new-born teachers of the sophist class that plato thought it necessary to recall attention to the good old perennial source of instruction the home the trade and the society he pointed out that the pretenders to teach virtue by moral lecturing were as yet completely outrivalled by the influence of the family and the social pressure of the community in like manner the arts of life were all originally handed down by apprenticeship and imitation the greatest statesmen and generals of early times had simply the education of the actual work philip of macedon could have had no other teaching his greater son was the first of the line to receive what we may call a liberal or a general education under the educator of all europe logic in the middle ages the middle age and boethius i must skip eight centuries to introduce the man that linked the ancient and the modern world and was almost the sole luminary in the west during the dark ages namely boethius minister of the gothic emperor theodoric as much of aristotle as was known between the sixth and the eleventh centuries was handed down by him 
During that time only the logical treatises existed among the Latins, and of these the best parts were neglected. Historical importance attaches to a small circle of them known as the old logic, vectus logica, which were the pabulum of abstract thought for five dreary centuries. These consisted of the two treatises or chapters of Aristotle, called the categories, and the De Interpretatione, or the theory of propositions, and of a book of Porphyry, the Neoplatonist, entitled Introduction, Isagogy, and treating of the so-called five predicables. A hundred average pages would include them all, and three weeks would suffice to master them. Boethius, however, did much more than hand on these works to the medieval students. He translated the whole of Aristotle's logical writings, the Organon, but the others were seldom taken up. It was he, too, that handled the question of universals in his first dialogue on Porphyry, and sowed the seed that was not to germinate till four centuries afterwards, but which, when the time came, was to bear fruit in no measured amount. And Boethius is the name associated with the scheme of higher education that preceded the university teaching, called the quadrivium, or quadruple group of subjects, namely arithmetic, geometry, music, and astronomy. This, together with the trivium, or preparatory group of three subjects, grammar, rhetoric, and logic, constituted what was known as the seven liberal arts. But in the darkest ages, the quadrivium was almost lost sight of, and few went beyond the trivium. Eve of the University in the seventh century, the era of deepest intellectual gloom, philosophy was at an entire standstill. Light arises with the eighth, when we are introduced to the cathedral and cloister schools of Charlemagne, and the ninth saw these schools fully established, and an educational reform completed that was to be productive of lasting good results. But the range of instruction was still narrow, scarcely proceeding beyond the old logic, and the teachers were, as formerly, the monks. The eleventh century is really the period of dawn. The East was now opened up through the Crusades, and there was frequent intercourse with the learned Saracens of Spain, and thus there were brought into the West the whole of Aristotle's works, with Arabic commentaries, chiefly in Latin translations. The effervescence was prodigious and alarming. The schools were reinforced by a higher class of teachers, lay as well as clerical. A marked advance was made in logic and dialectic, and the great controversy of realism versus nominalism, which had found its birth in the previous century, raged with extraordinary vigor. We are now on the eve of the founding of the universities. Bologna, indeed, being already in existence. Two classes of medieval churchmen. Separation of philosophy from theology. The university proper, however, can hardly be dated earlier than the twelfth century, and the important particulars in its first constitution are these. First, the separation of philosophy from theology. To expound this would be to give a chapter of medieval history. Suffice it to say that Aristotle and the awakening intellect of the eleventh century were the main causes of it. Two classes of minds at this time divided the church. The pious, devout believers, such as St. Bernard, who needed no reasons for their faith, and the polemic, speculative divines, such as Abelard, who wished to make theology rational. It was an age, too, of stirring political events, the crusading spirit was abroad, and found a certain gratification even in the war of words. The nature of universals was eagerly debated, but when this controversy came into collision with such leading theological doctrines as the Trinity and predestination, it was no longer possible for philosophy and theology to remain conjoined. A separation was effected and determined the leading feature of the university system. The foundation was philosophy, 
and the fundamental faculty, the faculty of arts. Bologna, indeed, was eminent for law or jurisprudence, and this celebrity it retained for ages. But the University of Paris, which is the prototype of our Scottish universities, as of so many others, taught nothing but philosophy. In other words, had no faculty but arts, for many years. Neither theology, medicine, nor law had existence there till the thirteenth century. Second, the system of conferring degrees, after appropriate trials. These were at first simply a license to teach. They acquired their commanding importance through the action of Pope Nicholas I, who gave to the graduates of the University of Paris the power of teaching everywhere, a power that our own countrymen were the foremost to turn to account. The Office of Rector Third, the organization of the primitive university. Europe was unsettled, even in the capitals, the civil power was often unhinged. Wherever multitudes came together there was manifested a spirit of turbulence. The universities often exemplified this fact, and it was found necessary to establish a government within themselves. The basis was popular, but while in Paris only the teaching body was incorporated, in Bologna the students had a voice. They elected the rector and his jurisdiction was very great indeed, and much more important than speechifying to his constituents. His court had the power of internal regulation, with both a civil and criminal jurisdiction. The Scotch universities on this point followed Bologna, and that fact is the remote cause of this day's meeting. Scotchmen abroad. The universities of Scotland founded. So started the university. The idea took, and in three centuries, many of the leading towns in Italy, France, the German Empire, had their universities. In England arose Oxford and Cambridge. The model was Paris or Bologna. Scotland did not at first enter the race of university founding, but worked on the plan of the cuckoo by laying its eggs in the nests of others. For two centuries Scotchmen were almost shut out of England, and so could not make for themselves a career in Oxford and Cambridge, as in later times. They had, however, at home good grammar schools, where they were grounded in Latin. They perambulated Europe and were familiar figures in the great university towns, and especially Paris. From their disputatious and metaphysical aptitude, they worked their upward way. And gladly would they learn and gladly teach. At length the nation did take up the work in good earnest. In 1411 was founded the first of the St. Andrew's Colleges. 1451 is the date of Glasgow. 1494 King's College, Aberdeen. These are the pre-Reformation Colleges but for the Reformation we might not have had any other. Their founders were ecclesiastics. Their constitution and ceremonial were ecclesiastical. They were intended, no doubt, to keep the Scotch students at home. They were also expected to serve as bulwarks to the Church against the rising heretics of the times. In this they were a disappointment. The first begotten of them became the cradle of the Reformation. In these are three eldest foundations we are to seek the primitive constitution and the teaching system of our universities. In essentials they were the same. Only between the dates of Glasgow and Old Aberdeen occurred two great events. One was the taking of Constantinople, which spread the Greek scholars with their treasures over Europe. The other was the progress of printing. In 1451, when Glasgow commenced, there was no printed textbook. In 1494, when King's College began, the ancient classics had been largely printed. The early editions of Aristotle in our library show the date of 1486. First Period The Teaching Body Our universities have three well-marked periods the first anterior to the Reformation, 
the second from the Reformation to the beginning of last century, the third the last and present centuries, confining ourselves still to the Faculty of Arts, the features of the pre-Reformation university were these. First, as regards the teaching body, the quadriennial arts course was conducted by so-called regents, who each carried the same students through all the four years, thus taking upon himself the burden of all the sciences, a walking encyclopedia. The system was in full force in spite of attempts to change it during both the first and the second periods. You, the students of arts, at the present day, encountering in your four years seven faces, seven voices, seven repositories of knowledge, need an effort to understand how your predecessors could be cheerful and happy, confined all through to one personality, sometimes juvenile, sometimes senile, often feeble at his best. Aristotle the basis of the teaching. The subjects taught. Next, as regards the subjects taught. To know these you have simply to know what are the writings of Aristotle. The little work on him by Sir Alexander Grant supplies the needful information. The records of the Glasgow University furnish the curriculum of arts soon after its foundation. The subjects are laid out in two heads, logic and philosophy. The logic comprised first the three treatises of the old logic. To these were now added the whole of the works making up Aristotle's organon. This brought in the syllogism and allied matters. There was also a selection from the work known as the topics, not now included in logical teaching, yet one of the most remarkable and distinctive of Aristotle's writings. It is a highly labored account of the whole art of disputation, laid out under his scheme of the predicables. The selection fell chiefly on two books, the second, comprising what Aristotle had to say on induction, and the sixth, on definition, together with the logical captions or fallacies. Disputation was one of the products of the Greek mind, and Aristotle was its prophet. Now for philosophy. This comprised nearly the whole of Aristotle's physical treatises, his very worst side, together with his metaphysics, some parts of which are hardly distinguishable from the physics. Next was the very difficult treatise, De Anima, on the mind or soul, and some allied psychological treatises, as that on memory. Such was the ordinary and sufficing curriculum. It was allowed to be varied with a part of the ethics, but in this age we do not find the politics, and the rhetoric is never mentioned. So also the really valuable biological works of Aristotle, including his book on animals, appear to have been neglected. Certain portions of mathematics always found a place in the curriculum, Likewise, some work on astronomy, which was one of the quadrivium subjects. All this was given in Latin. Greek was not then known. It was introduced into Scotland in 1534. No classical Latin author is given. The education in Latin was finished at the grammar school. Teaching exclusively in texts. Manner of teaching. Such was the arts faculty of the fifteenth century, a dreary, single-manned, Aristotelian quadriennium. The position is not completely before us till we understand farther the manner of working. The pupils could not, as a rule, possess the text of Aristotle. The teacher read and expounded the text for them, but a very large portion of the time was always occupied in dictating or diting notes, which the pupils were examined upon, viva voce, their best plan usually beginning to get them by heart, as any one might ask them to repeat passages literally, while perhaps few could examine well upon the meaning. The notes would be selections and abridgments from Aristotle, with the comments of modern writers. The diting system was often complained of as waste of time, 
but was not discontinued till the third or present university dynasty and not entirely then as many of us know the teaching was thus exclusively text teaching the teacher had little or nothing to say for himself at least in the earliest period he was even restricted in the remarks he might make by way of commentary he was as nearly as possible a machine but lastly to complete the view of the first period we must add the practice of disputation of which we shall have a better idea from the records of the next period this practice was coeval with the universities it was the single mode of stimulating the thought of the individual student the chief antidote to the mechanical teaching by textbooks and dictation the pre-reformation period of aberdeen university was little more than sixty years for a portion of those years it attained celebrity in fifteen forty one the town was honored by a visit from james v and the university contributed to his entertainment the somewhat penny a lining account is that there were exercises and disputations in greek latin and other languages the official records however show that the college at that very time had sunk into a convent and conventual school second period the reformation the reformation introduced the second period and made important changes first of all in the great convulsion of european thought the ascendancy of aristotle was shaken it is enough to mention two incidents in the downfall of the mighty stagyrite one was the attack on him by the renowned peter ramus in the university of paris our countryman andrew melville attended ramus's lectures and became the means of introducing his system into scotland the other incident is still more notable the reformers had to consider their attitude towards aristotle at first their opinion was condemnatory luther regarded him as a very devil he was a godless bulwark of the papists melanchthon was also hostile but he soon perceived that theology would crumble into fanatical dissolution without the cooperation of some philosophy as yet there was nothing to fall back upon except the pagan systems of these melanchthon was obliged to confess that aristotle was the least objectionable and was moreover in possession the plan therefore was to accept him as a basis and fence him round with orthodox emendations this done aristotle no longer despotic but as a limited constitutional monarch had his reign prolonged a century and a half new subjects introduced by melville the modified curriculum andrew melville the first thing after the reformation in scotland was to purge the universities of the inflexible adherence of the old faith then came the question of amending the curriculum not simply with a view to protestantism but for the sake of an enlightened teaching the right man appeared at the right moment in fifteen seventy four andrew melville then in geneva received pressing invitations to come home and take part in the needed reforms he was immediately made principal of glasgow university at that time in a state of utter collapse and ruin he had matured his plans after consultation with george buchanan and they were worthy of a great reformer he sketched a curriculum substantially the curriculum of the second university period the modifications upon the almost exclusive aristotelianism of the first period were significant the greek language was introduced and greek classical authors read the reading in the roman classics was extended a textbook on rhetoric accompanied the classical readings the dialectics of ramus made the prelude to logic instead of the three treatises of the old logic the mathematics included euclid geography and cosmography were taken up then came a course of moral philosophy on an enlarged basis with the ethics and politics of aristotle were combined cicero's ethical works 
and certain dialogues of Plato. Finally, in the physics, Melville still used Aristotle, but along with a more modern treatise. He also gave a view of universal history and chronology. This curriculum, which Melville took upon himself to teach, in order to train future teachers, was the point of departure of the courses in all the universities during the second period. With variations of time and place, the arts course may be described as made up of the Greek and Latin classics, with rhetoric, logic, and dialectics, moral philosophy or ethics, mathematics, physics, and astronomy. The little textbook of rhetoric by Talon or Talysus was made up of notes from the lectures of Peter Ramus and used in all our colleges till superseded by the better compilation of the Dutch scholar Gerard John Voss. Melville had to contend with many opponents, among them the sticklers for the infallibility of the Stagirite. Like the German reformers, he had accepted Aristotelianism as a basis, with a similar process of reconciliation. So it was that Aristotle and Calvin were brought to kiss each other. Melville defeated on the regenting. Attempt to abolish regenting. Melville's next proposal was all too revolutionary. It consisted in restricting the regents each to a special group of subjects, in fact anticipating our modern professoriate. He actually set up this plan in Glasgow. One regent took Greek and Latin, another, his nephew James Melville, took mathematics, logic, and moral philosophy, a third, physics and astronomy. The system went on, in appearance at least, for fifty years. It is only in 1642 that we find the regents given without a specific designation. Why it should have gone on so long and been then dropped, we are not informed. Melville's influence started it in the other universities, but it was defeated in every one from the very outset. After six years at Glasgow, he went to St. Andrews as principal and professor of divinity, and tried there the same reforms, but the resistance was too great. In spite of a public enactment, the division of labor among the regents was never carried out. Yet such was Melville's authority that the same enactment was extended to King's College, in a scheme having a remarkable history. The so-called new foundation of Aberdeen University, promulgated in a royal charter of about the year 1581. The Earl Marischal was a chief promoter of the plan of reform comprised in this charter. The division of labor among the regents was most expressly enjoined. The plan fell through, and there was a legal dispute fifty years afterwards as to whether it had ever any legal validity. Charles I was made to express indignation at the idea of reducing the university to a school. We now approach the foundation of Marischal College. The Earl Marischal may have been actuated by the failure of his attempt to reform King's College. At all events, his mind was made up to follow Melville in assigning separate subjects to his regents. The Charter is explicit on this head. Yet, in spite of the Charter, and in spite of his own presence, the intention was thwarted. The old regenting lasted 160 years. Aristotelian physics too long maintained. Still the curriculum reform was gained. There was indeed one great miss. The year before Marischal College was founded, Galileo had published his work on mechanics, which, taken with what had been accomplished by Archimedes and others, laid the foundations of our modern physics. Copernicus had already published his work on the heavens. It was now time that the Aristotelian physics should be clean swept away. In this whole department Aristotle had made a reign of confusion. He had thrown the subject back, being himself off the rails from first to last. Had there been in Scotland an adviser in this department, 
like Melville in general literature, or like Napier of Murchiston in pure mathematics. One-fourth of the college teaching might have been reclaimed from utter waste, and a healthy tone of thinking diffused through the remainder. A curious fascination always attached to the study of astronomy, even when there was not much to be said, apart from the unsatisfactory disquisitions of Aristotle. A little book entitled Sacrobosco on the Sphere, containing little more than what we should now teach to boys and girls, along with the globes, was a university textbook throughout Europe for centuries. I was informed by a late King's College professor that the use of the globes was, within his memory, taught in the magistrand class. This would be simply what is termed a survival. Graduation by means of disputes on thesis. System of disputation. Now as to the mode of instruction. There were viva voce examinations upon the notes, such as we can imagine, but the stress was laid on disputations and declamations in various forms. Besides disputing and declaiming on the regular class work before the regent, we find that in Edinburgh, and I suppose elsewhere, the classes were divided into companies, who met apart, and conferred and debated among themselves daily. The students were occupied altogether six hours a day. Then the higher classes were frequently pitched against each other. This was a favorite occupation on Saturdays. The doctrines espoused by the leading students became their nicknames. The pass for graduation consisted in the propuning or impugning of questions by each candidate in turn. An elaborate thesis was drawn up by the regent, giving the heads of his philosophy course. This was accepted by the candidates, signed by them and printed at their expense. Then on the day of trial, at a long sitting, each candidate stood up and propuned or impugned a portion of the thesis. All were heard in turn, and on the result the degree was conferred. A good many of these theses are preserved in our library. Some of them are very long, a hundred pages of close type. They are our best clue to the teaching of the period. We can see how far Aristotle was qualified by modern views. Regenting doomed. I said there might have been times when the students never had the relief of a second face all the four years. The exceptions are of importance. First, as regards Marischal College. Within a few years of the foundation, Dr. Duncan Liddell founded the mathematical chair, and thus withdrew from the regents the subject that most of all needed a specialist. A succession of very able mathematicians sat in this chair. King's College had not the same good fortune. From its foundation it possessed a separate functionary, the humanist or grammarian, but he had also, till 1753, to act as rector of the grammar school. Edinburgh obtained from an early date a mathematical chair, occupied by men of celebrity. There was no other innovation till near the end of the seventeenth century, when Greek was isolated both in Edinburgh and in Marischal College, but the end of regenting was then near. The old system, however, had some curious writhings. During the troubled seventeenth century, university reform could not command persistent attention. But after the 1688 revolution, opinions were strongly expressed in favor of the Melville system. The obvious argument was urged that, by division of labor, each man would be able to master a special subject, and do it justice in teaching. Yet it was replied that, by the continued intercourse, the master knew better the humors, inclinations, and talents of their scholars, to which the answer was, the humors and inclinations of scholars are not so deeply hid, but that in a few weeks they appear. Moreover, it was said the students are more respectful to a master while he is new to them. The final division of subjects took place in Edinburgh in 1708, in Glasgow in 1727 in St. Andrews, in 1747. 
in Marischal College, the change was made by a minute of 11th January, 1753. But whether from ignorance or from want of grace, the Senatus did not record its satisfaction at having, after a lapse of five generations, fulfilled the wishes of the pious founder. In King's College the old system lasted till 1798. This closes the second age of the universities, and introduces the third age, the age of the professoriate, of lecturing instead of textbooks, the end of disputation, and the use of the English language. It was now, and not till now, that the Scottish universities stood forth in several leading departments of knowledge as the teachers of the world. Age of the Professoriate The Universities and the Political Revolutions The second age of the universities was Scotland's most trying time. In a hundred and thirty years the country had passed through four revolutions and counter-revolutions, every one of which told upon the universities. The victorious party imposed its test upon the university teacher, and drove out recusants. You must all know something of the purging of the university and the ministry of Aberdeen by the covenanting General Assembly of 1640. These deposed Aberdeen doctors may have had too strong leanings to episcopacy in the church and to absolutism in the state, but they were not vicars of Bray. The first half of the century was adorned by a band of scholars who have gained renown by their cultivation of Latin poetry, a little oasis in the desert of Aristotelian dialectics. It would be needless and ungracious to inquire whether this was the best thing that could have been done for the generation of Bishop Patrick Forbes. Your reading in the history of Scotland will thus bring you face to face with the great powers that contended for the mastery from 1560, the monarchy always striving to be absolute, the church whose position made it the advocate of popular freedom, the universities fluctuating as regards political liberty, but standing up for intellectual liberty. In the seventeenth century the church ruled the universities. In the eighteenth it may be said that the universities returned the compliment. Professional teaching by apprenticeship. Universities not essential for professions. Enough for the past. A word or two on the present. What is now the need for a university system, and what must the system be to answer that need? Many things are altered since the twelfth century. First, then, universities, as I understand them, are not absolutely essential to the teaching of professions. Let me make an extreme supposition. A great naval commander, like Nelson, is sent on board ship at eleven or twelve. His previous knowledge, or general training, is what you may suppose for that age, it is in the course of actual service, and in no other way, that he acquires his professional fitness for commanding fleets. Is this right, or is it wrong? Perhaps it is wrong, but it has gone on so for a long time. Well, why may not a preacher be formed on the same plan? John Wesley was not a greater man in preaching than Nelson in seamanship. Take, then, a youth of thirteen from the school. Apprentice him to the minister of a parish. Let him make at once preparations for clerical work. Let him store his memory with sermons. Let him make abstracts of divinity systems. Master the best exegetical commentators. Then, in a year or two, he would begin to catechize the young, to give addresses in the way of exposition, exhortation, encouragement and rebuke. Practice would bring facility. Might not, I say, seven years of the actual work, in the susceptible period of life, make a preacher of no mean power, without the grammar school, without the arts classes, without the divinity hall? What, then, do we gain by taking such a roundabout approach to our professional work? The answer is twofold. 
first as regards the profession itself nearly every skilled occupation in our time involves principles and facts that have been investigated and are taught outside the profession to the medical man are given courses of chemistry physiology and so on hence to be completely equipped for your professional work you must repair to the teachers of those tributary departments of knowledge the requirement however is not absolute it admits of being evaded your professional teachers ought to master these outside subjects and give you just as much of them as you need and no more which would be an obvious economy of your valuable time thus i apprehend the strictly professional uses of general knowledge fail to justify the grammar school and the arts curriculum something indeed may still be said for the higher grades of professional excellence and for introducing improved methods into the practice of the several crafts for which wider outside studies lend their aid this however is not enough inventors are the exception in fact the ground must be widened and include secondly the life beyond the profession we are citizens of a self-governed country members of various smaller societies heads or members of families we have moreover to carve out creation and enjoyment as the alternative and the reward of our professional toil now the entire tone and character of this life outside the profession is profoundly dependent on the compass of our early studies he that leaves the school for the shop at thirteen is on one platform he that spends the years from thirteen to twenty in acquiring general knowledge is on a totally different platform he is in the best sense an aristocrat those that begin work at thirteen and those that are born not to work at all are alike his inferiors he should be able to spread light all around he it is that may stand forth before the world as the model man the graduate as such the ideal graduate all this supposes that you realize the position that you fill up the measure of the opportunities that you keep in view at once the professional life the citizen life and the life of intellectual tastes the mere professional man however prosperous cannot be a power in society as the arts graduate may become his leisure occupations are all of a lower stamp he does not participate in the march of knowledge he must be aware of his incompetence to judge for himself in the greater questions of our destiny his part is to be a follower and not a leader it is not then the name of graduate that will do all this it is not a scrape pass it is not decent mediocrity with a languid interest it is a fair and even attention throughout supplemented by auxiliaries to the classwork it is such a hold of the leading subjects such a mastery of the various alphabets as will make future references intelligible and a continuation of the study possible our curriculum is one of the completest in the country or perhaps anywhere by the happy thought of the senatus of marischal college in seventeen fifty three you have a fundamental class natural history not existing in the other colleges you have a fair representation of the three great lines of science the abstract the experimental and the classifying when it is a general education that you are thinking of every scheme of option is imperfect that does not provide for such three-sided cultivation of our reasoning powers a larger quantity of one will no more serve for the absence of the rest than a double covering of one part of the body will enable another part to be left bare voluntary extension of the basis your time in the arts curriculum is not entirely used up by the classes. You can make up for deficiencies in the course when once you have formed your ideal of completeness. For a year or two after graduating, while still rejoicing in youthful freshness, 
you can be widening your foundations. The thing, then, is to possess a good scheme and to abide by it. Now, making every allowance for the variation of tastes and of circumstances, and looking solely to what is desirable for a citizen and a man, it is impossible to refuse the claims of the Department of Historical and Social Study. One or two good representative historical periods might be thoroughly mastered in conjunction with the best theoretical compens of social philosophy. THE WELL-INSTRUCTED MAN Farther, the ideal graduate, who is to guide and not follow opinion, should be well versed in all the bearings of the spiritual philosophy of the time. The subject branches out into wide regions, but not wider than you should be capable of following it. This is not a professional study merely, it is the study of a well-instructed man. Once more, a share of attention should be bestowed early on the higher literature of the imagination, as, in after life, poetry and elegant composition are to be counted on as a pleasure and solace. They should be taken up at first as a study. The critical examination of styles and of authors, which forms an admirable basis of a student's society, should be a work of study and research. The advantages will be many and lasting. To conceive the exact scope and functions of the imagination in art, in science, in religion, and everywhere, will repay the trouble. The Arts Graduate in Literature Ever since I remember I have been accustomed to hear of the superiority of the arts graduate in various crafts, more especially as a teacher. Many of you in these days pass into another vocation, letters or the press. Here, too, almost everything you learn will pay you professionally. Still, I am careful not to rest the case for general education on professional grounds alone. I might show you that the highest work of all, original inquiry, needs a broad basis of liberal study, or at all events is vastly aided by that. Genius will work on even a narrow basis, but imperfect preparatory study leaves marks of imperfection in the product. The same considerations that determine your voluntary studies determine also the university ideal. A university, in my view, stands or falls with its arts faculty. Without debating the details, we may say that this faculty should always be representative of the needs of our intelligence, both for the professional and for the extra-professional life. It should not be of the shop, shoppy. The university exists because the professions would stagnate without it, and still more because it may be a means of enlarging knowledge at all points. Its watchword is progress. We have, at last, the division of labor in teaching. Outside the university, teachers too much resemble the regent of old, having too many subjects and too much time spent in grinding. Our teachers are exactly the reverse. Yet there cannot be progress without a sincere and single eye to the truth. The fatal sterility of the Middle Ages, and of our first and second university periods, had to do with the mistake of gagging men's mouths and dictating all their conclusions. Things came to be so arranged that contradictory views ran side by side, like opposing electric currents, the thick rapage of ingenious phraseology arresting the destructive discharge. There was, indeed, an elaborate and pretentious logic, supplied by Aristotle and amended by Bacon. What was still wanted was a taste of the logic of freedom. End of the University Ideal, Past and Present By Alexander Bain Recorded by Bev Stevens Current From The Standard Electrical Dictionary by T. O'Connor Sloan.
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Matt Perard. Current The Adjustment or Effects of a Continuous Attempt at Readjustment of Potential Difference by a Conductor QV Connecting Two Points of Different Potential A Charged Particle or Body Placed in a Field of Force Tends to Move Toward the Oppositely Charged end or portion of the field. If a series of conducting particles or a conducting body are held so as to be unable to move, then the charge of the field tends, as it were, to move through it, and a current results. It is really a redistribution of the field, and as long as such redistribution continues, a current exists. A current is assumed to flow from a positive to a negative terminal, as in the case of a battery. The current in the outer circuit is assumed to flow from the carbon to the zinc plate, and in the solution to continue from zinc to carbon. As a memoria technica, the zinc may be thought of as generating the current, delivering it through the solution to the carbon, whence it flows through the wire, connecting them. See Ohm's Law, Maxwell's Theory of Light, Conductor Intensity. Transcriber's Note Supposing electric current to be the motion of positive charge causes no practical difficulty, but the current is actually the slight motion of negative electrons. Current After A current produced by the animal tissue after it has been subjected to a current in the opposite direction for some time. The tissue acts like a secondary battery. The term is used in electrotherapeutics. Current, alternating. Usually defined and spoken of as a current flowing alternately in opposite directions, it may be considered as a succession of currents, each of short duration and of direction opposite to that of its predecessor. It is graphically represented by such a curve as shown in the cut. The horizontal line may denote a zero current that is no current at all, or may be taken to indicate zero electromotive force. The curve represents the current, or the corresponding electromotive forces. The further from the horizontal line, the greater is either. And if above the line, the direction is opposite to that corresponding to the positions below the line. Thus, the current is alternately in opposite directions, has periods of maximum intensity, first in one and then in the opposite sense, and between these, passing from one direction to the other, is of zero intensity. It is obvious that the current may rise quickly in intensity and fall slowly, or the reverse, or may rise and fall irregularly. All such phases may be shown by the curve, and a curve drawn to correctly represent these variations is called the characteristic curve of such current. It is immaterial whether the ordinance of the curve be taken as representing current strength 
or electromotive force. If interpreted as representing electromotive force, the usual interpretation and best, the ordinates above the line are taken as positive and those below as negative. Synonyms Reversed current, periodic currents. Current, atomic. A unit of current strength used in Germany, the strength of a current which will liberate in 24 hours 86,400 seconds one gram of hydrogen gas in a water voltmeter. The atomic current is equal to 1.111 1 amperes. In telegraphic work, the milliatom is used as a unit comparable to the milliampere. The latter is now displacing it. Current charge. If the external coatings of a charged and uncharged jar are placed in connection, and if the inner coatings are now connected, after separating them, they are found to be charged in the same manner. In this process, a current has been produced between the outside coatings and one between the inner ones, to which Dove has given the name charge current, and which has all the properties of the ordinary discharge current. Ganon. Current circular. A current passing through a circular conductor. A current whose path is in the shape of a circle. Current commuted. A current changed as regards direction or directions by a commutator. QV or its equivalent. Current constant, an unvarying current. A constant current system is one maintaining such a current. In electric series incandescent lighting, a constant current is employed, and the system is termed as above. In arc lighting systems, the constant current series arrangement is almost universal. Current continuous. A current of one direction only. The reverse of an alternating current. See current alternating. Current critical. The current produced by a dynamo at its critical speed at that speed when a slight difference in speed produces a great difference in electromotive force. On the characteristic curve it corresponds to the point where the curve bends sharply and where the electromotive force is about two-thirds its maximum. Current Danielle U.S. Daniel Siemens Unit, a unit of current strength used in Germany. It is the strength of a current produced by one Daniel cell in a circuit of the resistance of one Siemens unit. The current deposits 1.38 grams of copper per hour. It is the equal to 1.16 amperes. Current demarcation. In electrotherapeutics, a current which can be taken from an injured muscle, the injured portion acting electronegatively toward the uninjured portion. Current density. 
the current density per unit of cross-sectional area of the conductor. The expression is more generally used for electrolytic conduction, where the current density is referred to the mean facing areas of the electrodes, or else to the facing area of the cathode only. The quality of the deposited metal is intimately related to the current density. See burning. Proper current density for electroplating amperes per square foot of cathode Erquahart Copper acid bath 5.0 to 10.0 Copper cyanide bath 3.0 to 5.0 Silver double cyanide 2.0 to 5.0 Point zero. Gold chloride dissolved in potassium cyanide 1.0 to 2.0. Nickel double sulfate 6.6 .6 to 8.0. Brass cyanide 2.0 to 3.0. Current diacritical. A current which, passing through a helix surrounding an iron core, brings it to one-half its magnetic saturation, QV. Current, diaphragm. If a liquid is forced through a diaphragm, a potential difference between the liquid on opposite sides of the diaphragm is maintained. Electrodes or terminals of platinum may be immersed in the liquid, and a continuous current, termed a diaphragm current, may be taken as long as the liquid is forced through the diaphragm. The potential difference is proportional to the pressure, and also depends on the nature of the diaphragm and on the liquid current direct a current of unvarying direction as distinguished from an alternating current it may be pulsatory or intermittent in character but must be of constant direction current direct induced on breaking a circuit if it is susceptible of exercising self-induction, QV, an extra current, in the direction of the original, is induced, which is called direct because in the same direction as the original. The same is produced by a current in one circuit upon a parallel one altogether separated from it. See Induction Electromagnetic Electromagnetic Current Extra Synonym Break Induced Current Current Direction of the assumed direction of a current is from positively charged electrode to negatively charged one. In a galvanic battery from the carbon or copper plate through the outer circuit to the zinc plate and back through the electrolyte to the carbon or copper plate. See current. Transcribers note current is caused by the motion of negative electrons from the negative pole to the positive. The electron was discovered five years after this publication. Current displacement. The movement or current of electricity taking place in a dielectric during displacement. 
it is theoretical only and can only be assumed to be of infinitely short duration see displacement electric currents eddy displacement the analogues of Foucault currents hypothetically produced in the mass of a dielectric by the separation of the electricity or by its electrification current extra when a circuit is suddenly opened or closed a current of very brief duration in the first case in the same direction in the other case in the opposite direction is produced which exceeds the ordinary current in intensity a high potential difference is produced for an instant only these are called extra currents as they are produced by electromagnetic induction anything which strengthens the field of force increases the potential difference to which they are due thus the wire may be wound in a coil around an iron core in which case the extra currents may be very strong see induction self coil spark current faradic a term in medical electricity for the induced or secondary alternating current produced by comparatively high electromotive force such as given by an induction coil or magneto generator as distinguished from the regular battery current current focal the current produced in solid conductors and which is converted into heat cannot these currents are produced by moving the conductors through a field or by altering the strength of a field in which they are contained they are the source of much loss of energy and other derangement in dynamos and motors and to avoid them the armature cores are laminated the plane of the laminations being parallel to the lines of force see core laminated the presence of focal currents if of long duration is shown by the heating of the metal in which they are produced in dynamo armatures they are produced sometimes in the metal of the windings especially if the latter are of large diameter synonyms eddy currents local currents parasitical currents current franklinic in electrotherapeutics the current produced by a frictional electric machine current induced the current produced in a conductor by varying the conditions of a field of force in which it is placed a current produced by induction current induction induction by one current on another or by a portion of a current on another portion of itself see induction current intensity current strength dependent on or defined by the quantity of electricity 
passed by such current in a given time. The practical unit of current intensity is the ampere, equal to one coulomb of quantity per second of time. Current, inverse, induced. The current induced in a conductor when in a parallel conductor or in one having a parallel component a current is started or is increased in strength. It is opposite in direction to the inducing current and hence is termed inverse. See Induction Electromagnetic. The parallel conductors may be in one circuit or in two separate circuits. Synonyms Make induced current Reverse induced current Current Jacobi's unit of A current which will liberate one cubic centimeter of mixed gases, hydrogen and oxygen, in a water voltmeter per minute, the gases being measured at 0 centigrade, 32 Fahrenheit, and 760 millimeters, 29.92 inches, barometric pressure. It is equal to 1.0961 ampere current joint the current given by several sources acting together properly it should be restricted to sources connected in series thus if two battery cells are connected in series the current they maintain is their joint current current linear a current passing through a straight conductor, a current whose path follows a straight line. Current, make and break. A succession of currents of short duration separated by absolute cessation of current such current is produced by a telegraph key or by a microphone badly adjusted so that the circuit is broken at intervals. The U.S. courts have virtually decided that the telephone operates by the undulatory currents and not by a make-and-break current. Many attempts have been made to produce a telephone operating by a demonstrable make-and-break current on account of the above distinction in hopes of producing a telephone outside of the scope of the Bell Telephone Patent. Transcriber's Note Contemporary long-distance telephone service is digital as this item describes. Current meter, an apparatus for indicating the strength of current. See ammeter. Current, negative. In the single needle telegraph system, the current which deflects the needle to the left. Current, nerve and muscle. A current of electricity yielded by nerves or muscles. Under proper conditions, feeble currents can be taken from nerves, as the same can be taken from muscles. Current opposed. The current given by two or more sources connected in opposition to each other. Thus, a two-volt and a one-volt 
battery may be connected in opposition, giving a net voltage of only one volt, and a current due to such net voltage. Current Partial A divided or branch current A current which goes through a single conductor to a point where one or more other conductors join it in parallel, and then divides itself between the several conductors, which must join further on, produces partial currents. It produces as many partial currents as the conductors among which it divides. The point of division is termed the point of derivation. Synonym Derived Current Current Polarizing In electrotherapeutics, a constant current. Current Positive In the single needle telegraph system, the current which deflects the needle to the right. Current Pulsatory a current of constant direction, but whose strength is constantly varying, so that it is a series of pulsations of current instead of a steady flow. Current rectified. A typical alternating current is represented by a sine curve, whose undulations extend above and below the zero line. If, by a simple two-member commutator, the currents are caused to go in one direction, in place of the sine curve, a series of short convex curves following one another, and all the same side of the zero line results. The currents all in the same direction become what is known as a pulsating current. Synonym Redressed Current Current Rectilinear A current flowing through a rectilinear conductor. The action of currents depending on their distance from the points where they act. Their contour is a controlling factor. This contour is determined by the conductors through which they flow. Current Reverser A switch or other contrivance for reversing the direction of a current in a conductor. Currents Empyrean The currents of electricity assumed by Ampere's theory to circulate around a magnet as they represent the maintenance of a current or of currents without the expenditure of energy. They are often assumed to be of molecular dimensions as they all go in the same sense of rotation and are parallel to each other over the result is the same as if a single set of currents circulated around the body of the magnet. More will be found on this subject under magnetism. The Empyrean currents are purely hypothetical and are predicated on the existence of a field of force about a permanent magnet. See Magnetism, Ampere's Theory of if the observer faces the north pole of a magnet, the Empyrean currents are assumed to go in the direction opposite to that of a watch, and the reverse for the south pole. Currents Angular Currents passing through conductors which form an angle with each other. Currents Angular laws of 1. 
two rectilinear currents, the directions of which form an angle with each other, attract one another when both approach to or recede from the apex of the angle. 2. They repel one another if one approaches and the other recedes from the apex of the angle. Currents, Earth In long telegraph lines having terminal grounds or connected to Earth only at their ends Potential differences are sometimes observed that are sufficient to interfere with their working and which, of course, can produce currents. These are termed earth currents. It will be noted that they exist in the wire, not in the earth. They may be of 40 milliamperes strength, quite enough to work a telegraph line without any battery. Lines running northeast and southwest are most affected. Those running northwest and southeast very much less so. These currents only exist in lines grounded at both ends and appear in underground wires. Hence they are not attributable to atmospheric electricity. According to Wilde, they are the primary cause of magnetic storms, QV, but not of the periodical changes in the magnetic elements. See Magnetic Elements. Synonym Natural Currents Current Secondary A a current induced in one conductor by a variation in the current in a neighboring one. The current produced in the secondary circuit of an induction coil or alternating current converter. B. The current given by a secondary battery. This terminology is not to be recommended. Current secretion. In electrotherapeutics, a current due to stimulation of the secretory nerves. Current. Sheet. A. If two terminals of an active circuit are connected to two points of a thin metallic plate, the current spreads over or occupies practically a considerable area of such plate, and this portion of the current is a current sheet. The general contour of the current sheet can be laid out in lines of flux. Such lines resemble lines of force. Like the latter, they are purely an assumption, as the current is not in any sense composed of lines. b. A condition of current theoretically brought about by the Amperian currents in a magnet, each molecule having its own current, the contiguous portions of the molecules counteract each other and give a resultant zero current. All that remains is the outer sheet of electric current that surrounds the whole. Current Sinuous A current passing through a sinuous conductor. Currents Multiphase A term applied to groups of currents of alternating type which constantly differ from each other by a constant proportion of periods of alternation. They are produced on a single dynamo, the winding being so contrived that two, three, or more currents differing a constant amount in phase are collected from corresponding contact rings. There are virtually as many windings on 
the armature as there are currents to be produced. Separate conductors for the currents must be used throughout. Synonyms Polyphase currents Rotatory currents Currents of motion in electrotherapeutics, the currents produced in living muscle or nerves after sudden contraction or relaxation. Currents of rest. In electrotherapeutics, the currents traversing muscular or nervous tissue when at rest, their existence is disputed. Currents. Orders of. An intermittent current passing through a conductor will induce secondary alternating currents in a closed circuit near it. This secondary current will induce a tertiary current in a third closed circuit near it, and so on. The induced currents are termed as of the first, second, third, and other orders. The experiment is carried out by Henry's coils. See coils, Henry's. Currents, thermoelectric. These currents, as produced from existing thermoelectric batteries, are generated by low potential and are of great constancy. The opposite junctions of the plates can be kept at constant temperatures, as by melting ice and condensing steam, so that an identical current can be reproduced at will from a thermal pile. Thermoelectric currents were used by Ohm in establishing his law. See Ohm's Law. Current Swelling in electrotherapeutics, a current gradually increasing in strength. Current, undulatory. A current varying in strength without any abrupt transition from action to inaction, as in the make and break current. The current may be continually changing in direction. See current, alternate, and hence, of necessity, may pass through stages of zero intensity, but such transition must be by a graduation, not by an abrupt transition. Such current may be represented by a curve, such as the curve of signs. It is evident that the current may pass through the zero point as it crosses the line or changes direction without being a make and break current. When such a current does alternate in direction, it is sometimes called a shuttle current. The ordinary commercial telephone current and the alternating current is of this type. See current, make and break. Current, unit. Unit current is one which, in a wire of unit length, bent so as to form an arc of a circle of unit length of radius, would act upon a unit pole. See magnetic pole unit, at the center of the circle, with unit force. Unit length is the centimeter. Unit force is the dyne. Transcriber's Note The SI definition of an ampere, a current in two straight parallel conductors of infinite length and negligible cross-section one meter apart in vacuum, would produce a force equal to 2E-7 newton per meter of length. Current, 
wattless. Whenever there is a great difference in phase in an alternating current dynamo between volts and current, the true watts are much less than the product of the virtual volts and amperes, because the watts are obtained by multiplying the product of the virtual volts and amperes by the cosine of the angle of lag or lead. Any alternating current may be resolved into two components in quadrature with each other, one in phase with the volts, the other in quadrature therewith. The former is termed by S. P. Thompson the working current, the latter the wattless current. The greater the angle of lag, the greater will be the wattless current. End of Current by T. O. Connor Sloan. Selections from Northern Nut Growers Association Report of the Proceedings at the 42nd Annual Meeting, Urbana, Illinois, August 28th, 29th, and 30th. 1951. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne. Northern Nut Growers Association Report of the Proceedings at the 42nd Annual Meeting by the Northern Nut Growers Association. The Filbert and Persian Walnut in Indiana by W. B. Ward, Department of Horticulture, Purdue University. The soils and climatic conditions of Indiana are, for the most part, favorable to the growing of nut trees. There are various types of soils, ranging from light sand to heavy clay, soils high and low in organic material and natural fertility. The annual rainfall, 35 to 40 inches, is fairly well distributed throughout the year. The length of the growing season is about 150 frost-free days and, oftentimes, another 20 to 30 days of non-killing temperature. The summer and winter temperatures are average, thus providing good conditions for the development of fruit and growth to the trees. There are always exceptions to the normal conditions and a good test season broadens the experience of those who want to go to the extreme in planting nut trees. This past year, 1950-51 to 51 season, was a good test year. The temperature early in November was as high as 85 degrees. Tomatoes, peppers, beans, and sweet corn were growing in the gardens. During mid-November the temperature quickly dropped to near zero. The cold later went down to minus 20 degrees and even minus 35 degrees, as recorded at Greensburg. This cold weather not only killed much of the tender short growth and pistillate flower possibilities, but destroyed many of the catkins, the filbert and persian, including carpathian, walnuts, suffered and in some instances the plants were killed to ground level. All of the damaged plants have survived and where the top of the tree was killed, new growth came up from the root. As only seedling Persian walnut trees were under observation and included in the Purdue plantation, their sucker growth will be used to form new tops. The native walnut, hazelnut, hickory, and butternut had little or no winter injury, and many trees are very fruitful all over Indiana. The improved strains of filberts and the Persian walnut have only a few fruits this year. Seedling Persians grafted or budded on native black walnut survived, but there was some damage to the top growth due to immaturity of the wood and bud last fall. Before general planting recommendations can be made, other than for the hobbyist or homeowner with a few trees, further testing will be required. Filbert and Hazelnut the native hazelnut thickets are not as common now as in years past. 
Most of the nuts were small and of little commercial value. When hybridizers and other nut enthusiasts started improving the size and quality of the native hazelnut, and bringing in filberts from other countries, some impetus was added to the filbert planting program. Only a few took advantage of these new and promising seedlings, and aside from a few small plantings throughout the state, the filbert is placed in the ornamental grouping of plants. Several areas in Indiana are suitable for more extensive plantings. The Jones hybrids have proven satisfactory and are found growing from the northern part to the Ohio River. Several crosses were made four years ago using pollen from the rush and large fruited seedlings of the native hazel. There are thirty or forty such plants, two years old, now growing in the Purdue plot. They came through the winter in excellent condition. Many of the catkins on the older plants were killed during the early cold spell, and the nut crop this year is very spotty. The filbert does have a place around the home as an ornamental, as a fruit tree, or when used as a hedge for screening. The Carpathian Persian Walnut The Carpathian Persian Walnuts in Indiana are practically all seedlings. Many of these seedling trees show great promise, while others under observation for the past few years are being discarded because of lack of hardiness and production. Some few seedlings made vigorous growth and produced fair to good yields for the past ten years, but some weakness was evident after the 1950-51 to 51 winter. It appears now that those trees that have survived and are in production this year are worthy of further study and propagation. The oldest known Persian walnut in our state is a Hatterley seedling. A few nuts from a friend in California were planted in 1924 and ten years later fruited. This tree has produced as many as 350 pounds of nuts in a single year and has survived all test winters since planting. The nut from the Hatterley tree averages 32 nuts per pound, medium shell, good quality, and 44.6% of the total weight is edible. The nuts crack well. Several other Persian seedlings have been classified as existing prior to the general distribution of Carpathian nuts from the Wisconsin Horticultural Society in 1936 to 1938 and later. Several individuals in Indiana took advantage of the nut sale and importation from Poland during the years mentioned and about 10% of the original seedlings are now alive. Many of the trees planted 10 to 15 years ago are fruiting and classified. Outstanding groups of seedlings, which are referred to by name, such as Bolton, Fately, Eagles, Barnhart, Craning, Bear, Zolman, and others, are found from the extreme northern area to the Ohio River, and are distributed over nearly one half of the 92 counties in Indiana. The use of eastern black walnut as understock has been practiced by several orchardists and nurserymen, and a few will have trees for sale in the near future. The fruits from these trees compare with the best. The largest nut is the fatally one, with some fruits two inches in diameter and averaging 23 nuts per pound. The nut is high in quality, has an appealing taste, and a well-formed kernel. It cracks easily and has a very thin shell for such a large nut. This tree has borne 50 pounds of nuts or more annually for the past few years and has a nice crop this year after the severe test winter. The fately one seedling, as well as the numbers two, three, and four seedlings, are grown on a city lot under crowded conditions and provided with only moderate care. Several crosses have been made at Purdue with the Persian walnut, and approximately 100 seedlings have been distributed to various persons throughout a large area of the state. The trees do not seem as susceptible to insect and disease damage as the native black walnut, and growing well in sod should make good lawn trees. Some of the nut trees were sprayed with new green, 5 pounds per 100 gallons of spray material was used on the orchard crops, and great growth response was noted for the sprayed over undersprayed trees. As the homeowner is forever looking for new trees to plant and trees with clean habits, the Persian 
and particularly the Carpathian selections, may be the answer. Nut Growing in Eastern Iowa Ira Cool, Sabula, Iowa About five years ago I became very much interested in nut trees, and having hundreds of wild black walnuts and hickories, I attempted to graft, or rather topwork, the black walnuts to Persian walnuts and heart nuts, and the hickories to pecans and hecans. My favorite, of course, is the Persian walnut, and in addition to topworking them on blacks, I planted several grafted trees and several hundred seed nuts. To my surprise and pleasure, nearly every seed grew, and the seedlings are still doing very well. I now have thirty-five to forty varieties. I have had very little winter injury, except with the Broadview variety. The tops froze back a little, and I had a little trouble with the bark splitting on the larger trees. I covered the splits with tree wound dressing, and they are all doing well now. I consider the Schaefer about the best and most promising variety I have, and the grafts take very well. Most of the Carpathian varieties are also growing nicely, and especially the Illinois Number no. 10, which is a very rapid grower. In top working, I use the bark slot method, usually setting two or three grafts on a three-inch stalk, as at least one scion is almost sure to start. These scions are fitted and nailed in place with a seven-eighth or one-inch nail, and then well wrapped with a one-inch industrial adhesive tape. This seems to break or deteriorate with the growth of the graft. I then thoroughly wax the taped part as well as all of the scion, covering the buds rather lightly. After the scion has started to grow well, a one-by-one -one strip is nailed to the stalk. This extends from two to three feet above the top of the stalk. The growth is then tied to the stick with a soft cord. If growths are not tied this way, most of them are broken off by the wind. After the grafts are set, I cover with a paper milk bottle, or rather, container, and cut four small holes in it for ventilation. It shields the rain well. I use a small tack on two sides. The containers usually stay there until removed when the graft starts. This method works much better than paper bags, as they are easily water-soaked and the wind blows them against the scion which is easily loosened and therefore fails to start. I am also well pleased with the results I have had with heart nuts on black walnuts. I consider them the most rapid growing of any of the nut trees. I have had grafts bear a few nuts the next year after being set. I now have seven or eight varieties, of which I consider Fordermeyer, Aloka, Rival, Mitchell, and Wright as the most promising, along with Gothler. Squirrels seem to prefer heart nuts to all other sorts. I have eliminated this trouble by tacking a length or two of stovepipe around the trees. Last summer my attention was called to a tree about thirty miles from my home, which bore a very large crop of heart nuts. The man that owned the tree called them filberts. The tree is about forty feet tall, with a spread of forty or fifty feet, and is eighteen inches in diameter. It is perhaps twenty to twenty-five years old, and bears from three to four bushels a year, I am told. I have heard that the tree grew from a seed brought over from Germany. I have named the tree Gotler, in honor of the man bringing it to my attention. The nut seems to resemble the right, and is one of the best cracking nuts I have found. I received permission to get skyam wood from the tree, and have a few grafts growing well. Hickories are, of course, a native of this section, as is pecan, which grows wild on the Mississippi River bottoms, about as far north as the mouth of the Mokita River. The pecan grafts take off nicely on hickory stock, but the graft seems to outgrow the stock. I have found, however, that hecon, being half hickory and half pecan, works much better on hickory stock. My pecan grafts, which seem the most promising, are major, Indiana, and Green River, and of the hecongrafts, the Burlington and Wapello. Chestnuts seem to do very well here, as well as filberts and native hazels. Of the chestnut varieties I have growing, I prefer the Nanking, Kuling, and Myling. Most of my Persian walnut plantings I have interplanted with dwarf fruit trees, and have clover and alfalfa growing between the rows. This is cut twice a year and used for mulch. 
The following spring it is spaded in, and a small amount of high-test nitrogen applied at the same time, and the trees all seem to respond to this treatment very well. Dr. Rohrbacher. Any questions or remarks? Member. Mr. Kyle mentioned the Schaefer. That is one for the boys and girls in a hurry to get nuts. In three years you get nuts. I have experimented with it, and it is the only tree that will do it. Mr. Corson. I would like to ask the convention if they have had the experience of the black walnut and the Persian. Down the valley would come a good strong wind and break off the tops. I had one that grew twenty feet from a little graft. When I put this on, it had three buds. One bud threw six feet and twenty feet of wood from that one seedling. I barricaded it so the ice wouldn't break it. The ice broke through my barricade, and I have one that is growing as high as I can reach. Black walnut broke off with the wind. Sometime, the whole tree broke down. Not a twig was broken off the English walnut. The black walnuts worry me to pieces. Mr. Davidson. In connection with this rapid growth, is there any difference in the quality of the wood? We have some that grow so much more rapidly. When the wood matures, will it have the same value for furniture and so on as the slower-growing ones? Will they be more like the soft wood? Mr. Crane. Our highest-grade native woods are those which grow more slowly. We haven't made any studies on the wood in black walnut in relation to the growth rate. Dr. McDaniels. The strength and value of the wood depends on the proportion of large and small cells. In a very slow-growing tree, you have a large proportion of the big cells. In rapid-growing wood, you also have an undesirable result. It has been the very slow and very rapid that get you the best. If you get a rapid growth, the cells are thin, even though they may be small. It is the in-between condition that makes for good timber. That is based on actual strength tests and evaluation. Member. Mr. Corson wrote me about the wind damage. I never had that experience. I saw the cyclone in southeastern Iowa. Elms were uprooted and torn to pieces, and I didn't see any black walnut damage. Even the hickories were damaged, and some snapped off. I have never seen any walnut give way. Mr. McDaniel. We have wind damage in Urbana, and we can show you some places where black walnut trees were removed. Mr. Corson. Many years ago I was in a train going from Toronto to Montreal, and this is a section that is full of hickory trees. The Indians must have planted them. That is the only nut except butternut. I looked out the window and we had a six-inch ice storm, and the oaks were stripped. Most of the other soft trees were down to the ground. There wasn't even a twig killed on the hickories, the shagbark hickory. They were just as sound. Dr. Rohrbacher the ladies who want to take a little walk and end up at Mrs. Colby's home, where she is going to serve hot coffee, meet at one thirty in the main lobby. This is the regular time on which you are eating and sleeping now. The remainder of the group will meet here at one o'clock. If we go down to the cafeteria and get in before 11.40, we have a better chance. Pecans in Northern Virginia J. Russell Smith, Swarthmore, Pennsylvania Extracts from a Letter to the NNGA Secretary, November 26, 1951. Having sold my Virginia cabin and the nursery business, Sunny Ridge, I have been down to the nursery for the last month getting rid of trees. A job of digging is one thing, and that of packing and shipping is another. The man I had could do one but not both, and competent persons to pick up either job are not available, so I have been standing in the gap, getting calluses on my hands, and getting rid of sixteen thousand dollars worth of trees. Now as to facts on northern pecans. I find the Bucerum bears with regularity at Round Hill, Virginia, in a tight bluegrass sod. This pasture is not of high fertility, and has had a small amount of commercial fertilizer. It is on a hillside that has probably lost all its topsoil once or twice in the last hundred years, though not for the last twenty because it has been in grass. My neighbor, Henry B. Taylor, Hamilton, Virginia, has Buceron, Butterick, Green River, Indiana, and Major, all bearing well to heavy. Unfortunately this year the Green River hulls did not open, although the nuts were well filled. 
Ordinarily I believe they have been dropping their nuts, but not all at once. Twenty-five years ago I planted some butterick and buceron along a stream on a dairy farm on which I was born. There was no regular record of their performance, but I have observed that the butterricks have had a good crop in 1950 and also in 1951. I had previously concluded that the butterick was almost a non-fruiter and quit propagating it years ago. These especially productive butterricks are on alluvium near the barn in a permanent pasture where the cattle congregate while waiting for the gate to open to let them into the barn. It is therefore fertilized over and over again with cow drippings. Mr. Taylor's excellent yields are also produced on trees that are on unusually fertile soil. My conclusion is that the pecan is a very active feeder, and what it needs is about three times as much fertilizer as is required for any ordinary crop. It is time somebody better placed than I made a systematic experiment as follows. 1. Feed pecan trees at least five times as much plant food as the nuts and leaves use. 2. Injure the trees by hacking the bark to make them bare, and see how much they can be made to produce by this means. A buceron tree in the town of Round Hill stands in the backyard of a friend of mine, and they use it, I think, to tie clotheslines to, and maybe the boys have had a little fun driving nails into it, and it bears every year. The real find of my observations is a pecan known as Allstate, which has been wonderfully advertised by one of your fellows. On a catalogue it produces a nut two inches long. Wonderful. On Mr. Henry Taylor's tree in Hamilton, Virginia, it produces a tiny, symmetrical, pointed nut, too small to be contemptible, except for squirrel feed. They might have a time to handle the crop. Pecans in the vicinity of St. Paul, Minnesota. Carl Wyshecki. About twenty-five years ago, pecan seeds from the most northern natural habitat in Iowa were planted in garden soil here in St. Paul. Most of them were later transplanted in nursery rows at my farm seven miles east of River Falls, Wisconsin. Out of approximately three hundred trees, about forty are still living, of which twenty-five have grown well. The remainder probably have not found soil conditions to accommodate their natural vigorous growth. Where the trees are in deep soil with sufficient plant food, they have done well, the largest trees being about ten inches in diameter, and several of these have been bearing nuts for five years. The nuts were immature, however, but in the fall of 1949 about seventy of the best ones were planted in a seed bed and today about fifteen living trees of pure pecan parentage represent the second generation. This evidence is very important, for although the pecan has been almost as hardy as any native tree, such as the bitternut hickory, the butternut, and the black walnut, yet the length of season required for the maturing of nuts is a primary factor, which would have to be considered in recommending pecans for planting this far north. However, it has been my observation that these pecans have slowly cycled their way into our season, and it is gratifying to notice that this spring many leafed out at nearly the same time that the black walnut vegetated, which of course is much slower than the local butternut. This shows the tremendous adaptability of the pecan, and it is hoped that this ability to adapt itself to soil and climactic conditions will eventually cause it to produce small but edible pecans here in the north. It is my hope also that I can use our locally raised pecan seedlings on which to graft our many successful varieties of hickories, which heretofore have been limited to some extent in their usefulness because we had only the local bitternut stocks on which to graft. Whereas the bitternut is an excellent stock for some varieties of shagbark hickory, and even for shellbark, as well as pecans and hecans, there would no doubt be an increase in the scope of hickory planting if we had hardy pecan seedlings as understocks. At first, when comparing the growth of the native bitternut seedlings with that of pecans, locally raised in the same soil, it appears that the pecan was a much more vigorous grower. But experiments with different types of soil and fertilizers indicate that we can get seedlings of certain bitternut hickories to produce from two or three feet of growth in the first year. I have even found several of these same hickory seedlings of two seasons growth which, when transplanted last fall, are large enough to graft this spring. However, experiments have not proceeded far enough to verify the practical side of this new idea of hickory propagation. 
Only one variety of pecan, which was among the original seedlings, and which existed as a lawn tree for more than twenty years in St. Paul, was comparable with the bitternut hickory root systems. But enough of this variety of pecan has been grafted on local hickories to demonstrate that it is perfectly feasible, as far as the union is concerned. In fact, several of these larger grafted trees have been bearing staminate bloom for two or more years. No nuts have been produced of this hope variety as yet, and although it has been distributed on the market, it has always been classed as an ornamental rather than a fruiting variety. Of course, the pecan part overgrows the stock. In other words, there is a larger diameter above the union than in the stock below the union. So far this has not interfered with good growth and hardiness, whereas the black walnut grafted onto butternut, which is a similar combination as far as results go, more than thirty years ago in experimental work, indicates that this is a wrong procedure. Very few nuts were ever gathered from grafts of black walnut on butternut, although in most instances they continue to live and thrive. The pecan here is subject to much the same insect pests as the black walnut, but suffers less from hickory borers and types of insects which seem to be like oak pruners. This might be useful later on in maintaining healthy pecan trunks with hickory tops. Probably the early formation of rough bark, for which the pecan is noted, may be responsible for this. The nuts that have been produced so far have been extremely small, but here again the writer has observed an increase in size over the original nuts that were produced. In some seasons, at least one tree has produced nuts of sufficient size to be good enough for home purposes. They are nothing, however, to compare with any named northern pecans, such as the major and Indiana varieties. Practically all of these northern pecans have been tried in our environment, and some have lived for several years. Most of them have died because there was no congenial union of the pecan grafted on our local bitternut stalks. We do, however, have congenial grafts and good living specimens of the Norton and Burton, which are no doubt some form of hybrid. Hecons that graft well on local bitternut stalks are the Rockville, first in hardiness and forbearing nuts of the usual size for Rockville. They do not mature yet, but it is expected that favorable years will mature these nuts. Next in hardiness is the Green Bay, and next are the Burlington, Des Moines, Bixby, and McAllister. Although making good growth, these seem to have been too tender for our climate. Although we have good living specimens of them, and believe that some have begun to bear, particularly the Bixby, unless the names of grafts have been mixed up. These latter trees are mostly in the deep woods, and it is hard to get close data on their behavior and bearing. A. McQuart, which is supposed to be a lost variety of Hickon, I believe exists on my place, and I have taken it out of the deep woods, where it was grafted nearly thirty years ago from Scions, direct from J. F. Jones, and have placed scions on stalks in the vicinity of the nursery, where they can be watched. The differences between the scions freshly grafted last spring and the known varieties of Rockville, Green Bay, and Burlington are distinctive. Also the McQuart, if it is a true McQuart, last winter indicated much greater hardiness than did grafts made from the same time with Rockville and Burlington varieties. However, it is too early to say for sure whether the McQuart is represented among my varieties of hickons. The McQuart grafted on local stocks used by Jones and purchased as individual trees did not survive. It is assumed in this paper that this discussion would naturally lead to pecan hybrids, rather than staying with the pure-blooded pecan this far north, for some of the varieties do come very close to being pure pecans, but still, like Norton and Burton, probably are distinct hybrids. When some of the original seedlings from Iowa were transported from the nursery row, they were already quite large trees, and we did not get all the roots. The portions that were cut off were left in the soil. Of these roots sprouted three trees. One was subsequently moved into the orchard and marked because of its vegetative nature, and a variety of hickory known as the Weshek was grafted on it. It makes a very good growth but in most instances our native bitternut stock produces an equally good growth in unions with this particular variety. This particular performance is indicative of things to be expected for this combination in the future. In conclusion, I would say that the pecan is far from being a practical nut tree for our vicinity, and is only a very hopeful dream. But so also were the best hickory varieties thirty years ago when I first began my experiments. 
Wednesday morning session. A forester looks at the timber value of nut trees. Charles S. Walters, Forestry Department, University of Illinois. What I am going to say will apply mostly to black walnut, since it is one of our most valuable timber trees, but it will also apply to other species like hickory, pecan, persimmon. I have never seen pawpaw or hazelnut large enough for timber, but the Persian walnut has some value and the Chinese chestnut is a fair timber tree. All of these species should be commercially useful if there is sufficient quantity and volume involved to warrant a sale. What I have to say may not apply five years from now. Persimmon used to be the main source of material for golf club heads and shuttles for the textile industry. It no longer is. Today, golf clubs are being made of compreg, a wood which has been impregnated with phenolic resins and cured with heat. The resin is similar to bakelite. Thin sheets of wood are glued together to build up the head, rather than using a single solid piece, and it makes a considerably better golf club head. The developments in wood use are progressing just as in many other fields. What the wood specialists are trying to do is to take low-quality material and change it over to a form which is suitable for many uses for which high-quality expensive material is used now. The timber buyer now wants a tree of long, clean bowl with few knots, of large size, at least 16 inches in diameter at breast height. In short, he wants high-quality material. What I am saying may not apply to nut growing. Foresters grow trees for the wood crop with nuts as a by-product. The first sixteen feet of trunk, or the butt log, is his main interest. It should be completely free of limbs, knots, and other defects for at least sixteen feet. You can use the logs above the butt cut, but they usually produce lower grade material. You have two courses to follow. You can grow wood either in natural stands or in plantations, and the end product is very little different. It is probably easier to grow a high-quality tree in a plantation than in the wild. What can be easier than growing a timber tree in the woodlands? It eventually reaches a mercantile size and is harvested. Well, nature can do better if you give her help. Your chances of growing a high-quality tree to a mercantile size are better in the plantation. About ten years ago, Dr. R. W. Lawrence of our department made a study of 150 plantations growing on prairie soil in Illinois. Thirty-six were walnut, which ranged in age from twenty-two to seventy-five years. The one thing we had the most trouble with was determining their ages. One day we stopped at a farm and talked to a farmer, and we asked him when the trees were planted. This man said he could tell us the exact day. I was a young lad, and a neighbor drove by and said, Yesterday Abe Lincoln was shot so we had the historical records to determine the age of that particular plantation. These plantations ranged in number of trees per acre from 46 to 330. The number of trees per acre has a direct influence on the size or diameter growth of the timber tree. An 8 by 8 spacing, or 680 trees per acre, eventually will be thinned to 200 trees per acre. That gives each tree proper spacing for breast height and diameter growth. The trees ranged in height from about 31 feet to 85, averaging about a foot and a quarter in height each year. The average diameter ranged from about 12 inches to 15 inches. Individual trees, however, ranged up to 24 inches at breast height, four and one-half feet above ground level. Each plantation had had very little or no care. If some of them had been cared for or managed, their owners would have had a better wood crop higher quality, and higher quantity, too. Now, as to the growth in the managed plantations, we believe it is possible to grow 300 board feet per acre per year. Compared with upland oak, walnut exceeded it in almost all growth factors up to 70 years of age, and then they were about the same. Of the cultural practices, the most important is probably pruning. Sawing off limbs growing on a trunk makes all wood produced thereafter free of knots. When the trees reach about six inches in diameter, one should select those he is going to call crop trees, about two hundred of these per acre, and spend his time getting them to timber size and quality. The other trees are removed over a period of several years, so that you finally have only the two hundred high-quality crop trees left. 
the reason I suggest starting the pruning when the trees are six inches in diameter, is that the size of the veneer cord left after the veneer manufacturer has turned the log for a thin sheet of furniture veneer. Remove the limbs and improve the quality so you get a 16-foot log free of limbs and knots. That is what the buyer is looking for. I know practically nothing about growing trees for nut crop, but we seem to have something in common in growing trees both for nuts and timbers. Just a lot of it is horse sense, with a few rules of thumb based upon scientific principles. You must give the crop trees space, give them plenty of room to grow. In the woods they start to grow in a dense undergrowth. The young trees soon reach a height where they begin to dominate their neighbors. There you pick the straight, thrifty growing trees for crop trees and favor them in your thinning and pruning operations. Tree density influences diameter growth of the trees. In thick stands, trees are usually small and spindly, so plant a large number to give the crop tree good form, then thin the plantation carefully to make it grow. Grazing and fire are very harmful to tree plantations. Most of the plantations we studied were grazed. A good many of them were burned. I don't think nut growers would periodically burn their stands to improve the nut production. It is the same with growing a crop of wood. Once the livestock begin to trample or compact the soil, tree growth slows down, and when that happens it makes the trees more susceptible to attack by insects and fungi. As to marketing trees, let's assume you have some material you want to sell. The one thing you want to know is, how much is it worth? That is like me asking you what my house is worth. I understand that there are persons here not only from Illinois and Iowa, but from New York, West Virginia, Ohio, and Kentucky. Prices on wood products vary not only from state to state, but also within a state as well. The things you ought to know are the sizes and grades of the timber that you want to sell, since they determine price. Now, there are publicly employed foresters available to help you. They know your local conditions. The manufacturer's markets determine what he can afford to pay you. For example, we organized some walnut marketing pools in Illinois during the war. I suppose a half million board feet of Illinois walnut was sold for gunstock material. One company was buying most of the product of the pools. Later we found that this company had a market for a low-grade stump veneer. Most of the other companies would mark a half dozen trees for their stumps. This company would buy thirty-five to forty stumps. Every buyer looked at the same quality and quantity of material, since the trees were all marked. In this case, however, the difference in markets determined the price the manufacturer could pay. Another thing that concerns price is what we call logging chance, or how easy it is for the buyer to harvest those trees. I imagine anyone buying trees in Pennsylvania would have considerably more difficulty in getting them out than he would in Illinois. The differences in equipment and methods used to harvest the trees all have bearing on the price paid to the timber owner. Hickory is commonly sold for handle stock. Wood for striking tool handles has a definite restriction in the specification on the number of rings allowed per inch of growth. The federal government grades handles on the basis of growth rate. From 17 to 22 growth rings per inch is specified. Timber buyers don't want logs grown any slower than 22 rings per inch, and those grown a little faster than 10 rings per inch may be acceptable. Now, as to determining the trees to sell, I mentioned a 16 diameter limit. A few trees smaller than this with logs shorter than 8 feet in length may be accepted if a large quantity of wood is to be sold. It has to be economically worthwhile for the buyer to harvest and transport the wood, or he can't afford to buy it. Each buyer, of course, has a different set of specifications. You ought to measure and mark those trees you want to sell, and ask the buyers to bid only on those marked trees. Buyers like to approach the timber owner with, you have some timber I can use. I'll give you $100 for what I can use. That is the same approach as if I were to offer $100 for your entire nut crop. You would probably say, let's weigh those nuts so we will have a basis for coming to an agreement. It's the same way with timber. There are two ways you can sell your timber. You can either measure your trees and sell on a volume basis, or you can mark certain trees and state to several buyers, I have marked 25 trees for sale. What is your best offer for them? Each buyer looks at the same trees, and you have a common denominator for comparing the fairness of each bid. For example, we had a farmer in Woodford County, Illinois, who had walnut trees, wild trees, but growing in a pasture grove. 
I jotted down the bids that were made. One buyer offered two hundred dollars for twenty-seven trees. Another bid two twenty-five for thirty-five. A third bid two sixty-five for forty, or one sixty-five for thirty-five. And the last buyer offered four hundred twenty-five for twenty-five trees. The point I am trying to illustrate is that the farmer, without that extremely high bid, would have been unable to compare the bids because someone bid on twenty-seven trees and someone else on thirty-five trees. If all buyers had bid on twenty-seven marked trees, they would have had a basis for comparing the bids. Sell on contract. Farm foresters have simple contract forms which they will give you. The forms can be filled out so that they tell you what you agree to do and what the buyer agrees to do. Both parties sign the agreement, so there is less chance for disagreement later. May I have those slides? picture showing large tree in dense forest. This isn't a walnut tree, but I want to show you the kind of condition foresters like to see trees growing under. Nice tall stem, free of any limbs, good diameter. These trees show a rather wide range of age classes. When I talk to my folks about growing timber, they say, seventy years is a long time to wait for your money. Here is a tree that started seventy years ago and is ready to be harvested. The crop is sustained yield. I put this in to show you what we don't like to see, picture showing park-like stand of timber. When these one hundred or so trees are gone, there will be no others to replace them. Cattle have grazed the stand to the extent that there will be a long time before any other age classes develop to replace those you see in the picture. That is a white oak. I told you there weren't many. Good diameter all the way up clear of limbs. When the logger cuts that tree, he will have high-quality material. The same applies for walnut, hickory, or any other species. The walnut tree shows you how to mark trees for sale. One mark up here so the buyer knows which tree is designated for cutting, and one down at the bottom so you can assure yourself that the tree was to be sold. It identifies one of the trees you intended to sell. A penalty is involved for cutting any others. I wanted to show you what a good walnut stump cut looks like. These trees should be 18 inches or larger in diameter and about 2 feet above the ground to be worthwhile. The stump will be cut off when it goes to the mill and peeled for veneer. This is one of the walnut plantations cut for gunstock material. I put this in to show you how the buyers cut the trees down and measure off the logs to get the best graded material. They aren't interested so much in volume as in lumber. They want the best grade of wood and they want it in that butt log. I put these in to show poor quality logs that aren't worth taking. There is an open pasture grown tree, no care or attention given it, so the limbs stayed on and grew quite large. This shows how the logs load with a tractor and chain. This cross haul is a trick of the logger's trade. This is the improper way. The tractor was broken down so it took five or six men to load it because they didn't have the tractor. There are some good logs, and here there are some poor logs. This is a group of logs at a railway siding. Some look small, but at that time, with the market as it was, they could use the smaller logs. You see some of nice length, good form, and free of defects. I mentioned metal. Here is a man with an army mine detector. They tried them out to locate metal. This company uses a mine detector to test all logs for metal content. Here's what happens. The metal discolors or stains the wood. This tree probably grew in a fence line, and the buyers are just a little reluctant to buy them. If they do, they cut them off this high, so they are pretty sure all fence wire is left in the stump portion. In this grove of walnut, a wire is nailed to every tree. Such a practice ruins the tree. This shows wasteful practice. The small mill in southern Illinois was buying these short bolts cut from small trees. Be careful that you don't sell trees that are too small and too young. It's like, I suppose, harvesting your walnuts before the kernel develops. This is the result of a fire. That log, from outside appearance, didn't have a blemish. Loggers left this part because it was hollow. The infection developed from a fire scar and rotted out the inside. This shows the same thing, fire scarred. Bumping machines used to harvest the nut crop or any defect or injury may result in something like this and decrease the tree's value for timber. I mentioned hickory. Here are some single trees that are made out of pecan. Hickory is also used. Hickory grows to a commercial size in southern Illinois, but in most states it is too small and knotty. 
One time the Peoria office of the WPB got a release from Washington indicating that hickory was needed for axe handles. They released it to the newspapers. We answered letters for a month after that. Farmers who had hickory they wanted to sell had to be told that there wasn't enough hickory involved to make it commercially possible to market. In addition, there wasn't a single handle mill in the state at the time. This is a couple of loads of good walnut logs. They were cut in Illinois and trucked to Indiana to be manufactured into veneer and lumber. Dr. Colby asked me if I had any methods of getting rid of stumps. We have worked for five years and still haven't a method that is economical or easy. We recommend grubbing or burning them out with a small stove, or you can cut them close to the ground and let them rot out. What about the chemicals? We have worked for a good many years, and we have bored stumps until our arms ached, but we haven't found any of them to work. Discussion Member 300 board feet per acre per year Mr. Walters I said we felt that on good soil and by encouraging nature we could grow that volume. Member What are the stumpage prices? Mr. Walters Ranging from about $10 per thousand board feet to 300 there is quite a span, and each grade is different. There is prime grade, which is the best grade, which must be 16 inches in diameter at the small end at least. Each company has a little different set of grades. Even with the same grade, the prices will range according to the size of the log. Maybe a 16-inch prime log may be worth 200 feet per thousand board feet, and 24-inch will be 300. Mr. Craig. Curly walnut would be worth more. Mr. Walters. Yes. It is somewhat of a guess as to whether a tree will have a curly figure. If you let them take the bark off the tree, the buyers can tell. I know of one beautiful stump on which the buyer wanted permission to remove a part of the bark to see if it had nubby growth. If it had had the figure, it would have been very valuable. The farmer said, I don't want you cutting on that tree, because if it doesn't have the figure and you don't buy it, the tree will be spoiled. Don't let the buyers chop into trees to see whether it has figure. Mr. Craig I bought two to get grafting wood. Editor's note. Mr. Craig refers to the lamb curly black walnut. Article which appeared in NNGA 39th Annual Report. Mr. Walters. There has been some work done on grafting or stimulating growth for figure. One method was to beat the trees with a rubber hose and try and stimulate figured or curly grain. Not too much has been published on this work as yet. Member. Do you think the figure could be propagated by asexual propagation? Mr. Walters. I don't know. I will say this. In forest trees, the inherited characteristics are the things we depend on. If a tree has curly figure, and the seed carries that characteristic, you may see it in the progeny. An acquired characteristic I don't think you can depend on so much. Member. Is it thought to be acquired or hereditary? Mr. Walters. I just don't know whether it is acquired or hereditary. Dr. Rohrbacher. One thought came to me on this black walnut timber. It's a long pull, and it is one for our posterity. The thought came to be that it is for those of us who are interested in setting up something for our offspring. The plan has been brought out before of using a grafted, no-name variety of nuts. Plant those, and perhaps those trees as they grow would first give us that wonderful nut which we were looking for. End of Selections from Northern Nut Growers Association Report of the Proceedings at the 42nd Annual Meeting, Urbana, Illinois, August 28th, 29th, and 30th, 1951, by the Northern Nut Growers Association. Recording by Marianne Spiegel, Elmhurst, Illinois, August 2nd, 2011. Part 9 of 1,000 Questions in California Agriculture Answered This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sandra Luna 1,000 Questions in California Agriculture Answered by E. G. Wixon Part 9 Pests and Diseases of Plants Control of Grasshoppers This county is having trouble with the grasshoppers as are other counties. 
would you kindly inform me what I could do to exterminate them on my young orchard? The best thing for grasshoppers is to fix up a lot of poison. This is made in the proportion of forty pounds of bran, two pounds of molasses, and five of arsenic, mixed together as a mash. They will take this wherever they find it, even when nice green leaves are close by, but it has to be kept moist. Grasshoppers can also be reduced by driving a hopper dozer over ground where they are. This is made somewhat like a Fresno scraper, but is much longer, and at the bottom is covered with crude oil. When disturbed, the hoppers jump up and fall into the oil. Besides the poison, you should also protect the trunk of the tree to prevent the hoppers from climbing up it. This can be done by applying tree tanglefoot or putting on one of the tree guards that prevent climbing insects from passing up to the leaves. The combination of poison and tree guards will give you about all the protection you need. Sunburn and Boas Please state the best remedy for keeping the boar out of young fruit trees. Sunburn can be prevented in many ways. The manufactured tree protectors are good if they are light colored and are kept in place so that the sun does not scald above or below them. Wrapping spirally with narrow strips of burlap, torn from old grain sacks from the base to the forking of the branches, is also good. A very effective and widely used method is to apply a good, durable whitewash, which may be made of thirty pounds of lime, four pounds of tallow, and five pounds of salt, adding the salt to the water used in slaking the lime, stirring in the talon while the slaking is in progress and hot, and then adding water to thin the wash so that it will work well with pump or brush. Gumming of Prune Trees I write to ask for information concerning my prune trees. They are from two to six years old, and the gum is exuding from them. As I notice the branches dying, I cut them out, but this doesn't seem to save the tree. I would appreciate any information you can give me. This is a pretty hard matter to diagnose from a distance. There is a good probability that the problem is caused by sunburn, a point you could determine on inspection. Whitewash would be a protection against this, and more or less of a cure also. Furthermore, bores may be the cause, which can be determined by examining the points where the gum exudes, seeing if any wood grains are present. These bores should be dug out and whitewash applied, which later also protects against this trouble. Lastly, your ground may be drying out, which also you can determine and remedy. Borers on Olive Twigs there are quite a number of olive trees in this locality that have something wrong with them. They make a growth of five or six inches and the center twig dies back. Then it sprouts out at the sides and makes another growth in the same way. This makes a thick bush instead of the tree coming up as it should. The dying back is caused by a beetle which bores into the twigs. The twigs, 
above the point where the beetle enters dies, and then, of course, buds come out from healthy wood below. No treatment has been devised against it, though its breeding ground is limited if all dead wood and brush and litter is cleaned up, and twigs are cut off below the point of injury whenever the work of the insect is seen. Raspberry Cane Borer Can you tell me what to do for my Logan berries and raspberries? A small worm got into them in the new growth of wood last summer, right in the tips of the new growth of wood, and then worked down through the pith of the wood, and as fast as they worked down the can wilted. This is the raspberry horn tail, or the cane borer. The adults are wasp-like insects, about a half inch long and very active. They come out of the canes in spring, and the females soon lay eggs in the tender tips of the young shoots. These eggs soon hatch, and the larvae eat their way up toward the tip which causes it to wither and die. It is this injury that causes much notice. As the tip dies, the larvae turn and go down into the canes, as in the sampled scent, also injuring them greatly, though possibly not killing them for some time. The only way to attack them is to pinch the spots where the eggs were laid. Then, those that escape and cause the tips to wilt should be destroyed by cutting off the tips below the point of injury, or cutting off the canes where they show damage. Likewise, the insects work on the wild rose, and cutting all those out around the place will prevent enough adults from developing to permit little damage to be done, always provided the berries are well looked after. Control of Red Spider Can you give directions for the prevention of injury by the red spider to almond and other trees in the Sacramento Valley? The red spider on almond and prune trees is usually controlled by the thorough application of dry sulphur to the foliage. On almonds, the first sulphuring should be done as soon as the leaves appear in March. A second application is advised from the 1st to the 10th of May. A third application should be made from the 1st to the 10th of June. Prune trees should be treated as soon as the spider appears. In the Sacramento Valley, this usually occurs about the first week of July. Full-grown trees require about a pound of sulfur, which should be thoroughly distributed throughout the foliage. The old method of throwing a handful of sulfur in the branches of the tree or on the ground under the tree is valueless. The use of a blower is economical in large orchards, but a can with perforated bottom is frequently used on young trees or small orchards with good results. In normal seasons, the spider is easily controlled by dry sulfuring. When the pest does not yield to this treatment, a spray is recommended. Liquid Spray for Red Spider Is there any liquid spray I can use in my spray that will kill the red spider without injuring the foliage of the almond? A liquid spray for red spider is made by taking sulfur, 30 pounds, Lime, reduced to milk form by water, 15 pounds. Water, 200 gallons. Or use commercial lime sulfur, 
four or five gallons to two hundred gallons of water. These sprays can be applied without injuring the foliage. They are more expensive in labor cost than dry sulfuring, but are more effective. Apple Leaf Aphis I am sending herewith a small piece from one of my young apple trees. If you can, will you kindly tell me what the insects are on it, and what I had better do for them? The apple twig, which you send, is infested with the eggs of the leaf aphids, or leaf louse. These eggs are very difficult to kill. A good thorough spraying with lime sulphur might, however, get rid of many of them and would be good for the trees otherwise. Diluting according to condition of tree growth. The chief campaign against the leaf aphis, however, must be made early in the growing season, just as these pests are beginning to hatch out and to accumulate under the leaves of the new growth. They should then be attacked with properly made kerosene emulsion or tobacco extract with a nozzle suited to land the spray on the underside of the leaves. Unless these pests are attacked early in the season and repeated if necessary, your apples on bearing trees will be ruined so far as they attack them, being small, misshaped, and worthless. On young trees, the destruction of the foliage is fatal to good growth. Woolly Aphis Will you kindly inform me what you consider the best treatment for apple trees affected by woolly aphis? The best way to kill the woolly aphis on the roots is to remove the earth from around the tree to a distance of one or two feet, according to the size of the tree, digging away a few inches of the surface soil, then soak the soil around the tree with kerosene emulsion, properly made, of fifty per cent strength, and replace the earth. Be sure you get a good emulsion, for free oil is dangerous. For the insects above ground on the twigs, a good spraying while the tree is out of leaf will kill many, but some will survive for summer spraying, and for this a tobacco spray may be most convenient. Blister Mite on Walnuts I am sending you some walnut leaves with some swellings on them. They are very plentiful on some trees here. Is the trouble serious, and will it spread? This is merely erinose, or blister mite, which is a very common trouble on walnuts, but does not do enough damage to call for methods of control. These swellings are caused by numerous very small insects which live within the blisters on the underside of the leaf amongst a felt-like heavy growth which develops there. While this effect is very common, it produces no appreciable injury and needs no treatment for its control. Scale on Apricots I would like to know how to check the scale on apricot trees. The most common scale on apricots, the brown apricot scale, is usually held in check by the Comis fusca, which is as widely distributed as the scale itself. If it gets beyond the parasite, you should spray in winter with crude oil emulsion. If some scales are punctured, or have a black spot on top, the Comis fusca is busy, and you probably will be safe enough without doing anything. Fumigating for black scale I would like to know the best method 
of eradicating the black scale from my orange trees, whether by spraying or fumigation. Spraying has been given up as a suitable method for controlling the black scale on citrus trees, and the only recognized method of merit where the scale is bad is by fumigation with hydrocyanic acid gas. You should communicate with your county horticultural commissioner who, through inspectors, will see that you have a good job done at the right time and at as a moderate price as is compatible with good work. It is impossible to eradicate the black scale, but there is a great difference in the amount that can be killed, and it pays to have a job done as near perfectly as possible. Similar methods of attacking other scale insects on citrus trees are used. Finding Thrips How can the presence of pear thrips be detected in a prune orchard? Will the distillate emulsion nicotine spray control brown scale as well as thrips? You can find thrips by shaking a cluster of blossoms as soon as they open over a sheet of paper or in the palm of your hand. The thrips are very minute, transparent, somewhat louse-like insects. The spray you mention would probably have little effect on the brown scale, which would still be in the egg state and under cover, at the time the early spring spray for the thrips. Control of Pear Slug I am sending, under separate cover, some samples of cherry tree leaves that have been attacked by a small snail or slug. Kindly let me know what they are, and how to rid the trees of them. The creatures you speak of are the pear slugs, or the cherry slugs, as they are sometimes known. Although slimy, like the big yellow slug that is a pest in vegetable gardens, it is no relation thereto, but is the larva of an insect. Its olive green color slimy appearance and the way it eats the surface of the leaves make it about the easiest of all insects to identify. Parasites and predaceous insects usually keep it in fair control. Whenever artificial methods of control are needed, the slugs can best be destroyed by sprinkling dust of any kind upon them. If you can get a machine for sulfuring a vineyard and use some air-slaked lime or other fine dust, it will fix them quickly and inexpensively, though any way of applying dust may be used. Cutworms and Young Trees What method should be used to protect young fruit trees from cutworms? Oh, around the trees or vines and kill the fat, greasy grubs which you will find near the foliage. Put out a poison bait which the worms like better than the foliage, viz. bran, ten pounds, white arsenic, half a pound, molasses, half a gallon, water, two gallons. Mix the arsenic with the bran dry, add the molasses to the water, and mix into the bran, making a moist paste. Put a tablespoonful near the base of the tree or vine, and lock up the chickens. Control of Squash Bugs We are troubled with pumpkin bugs. Please tell us what to do for them. When the bugs first make their appearance in the field, they can be easily disposed of by hand-picking and dropping into a bucket containing about two inches of water. 
with about one-fourth inch of kerosene on top to kill the bugs. The picking should be done in the morning, as the bugs are apt to fly in the warm part of the day and scatter while already picked. Two persons can pick over an acre in one and a half hours, and two pickings are usually sufficient for a season, as after the vines begin to run over the ground pretty well, the bugs will not be able to hurt them much. A pair of thin old gloves will help to keep off one's hands some of the perfume from the bugs. The sooner the work starts, the fewer bugs to pick. Cleaning up of all old vines in the fall and removing litter in which the mature bugs hide for the winter will permit less eggs to be laid in the spring and there will be fewer bugs to pick as a result. The Corn Worm Last year all my ears of corn were infested with maggot, growing fat thereon. Can you help me scare them away? You have to do with the so-called corn worm, which is very abundant in this state, and one of the greatest pests to corn growing. It is the same insect which is known as the boll worm of the cotton in the southern states. No satisfactory method of controlling this has been found although a great deal of experimentation has been done. Nearly everything that could be thought of has been tried without very satisfactory results. A late planted corn has some time been free, for the insect is not in the laying state then. If it were not for this insect, the canning of corn would be an important industry in this state. Melon Lice I have in about four acres of watermelons, and there seem to be lice, and a small gnat or fly, and also some small green bugs and white worms on the under part of the leaves, which seem to be stopping the growth of the vines, making them wilt and die. They seem to be more in patches, although a few on all the vines. Can you please tell me what to do for them? Melon lice are very hard to catch up with after you have let them get a start. Spraying with oil emulsions, tobacco extracts, soap solutions, etc. will all kill the lice if you get it onto them with a good spray pump and suitable nozzles for reaching the under sides of the leaves. The gnats you speak of are the winged forms of the lice. The white worms may be eating the lice. The small green bugs may be diabroticus. If you had started in lively as soon as you saw the first lice, you could have destroyed them in the places where they started. Now, your chance lies largely in the natural multiplication of ladybirds and the occurrence of hot winds, which will burn up the lice. It is too late, probably, to undertake spraying the whole field. Wireworms Is there any way to destroy or overcome the destructive work of the wireworm? which I find in some spots takes the lion's shares of crops, such as beans, potatoes, onions, etc. We do not know any easy way with wireworms. Nitrate of soda is believed to kill or repel them, but you have to be careful with it, for too much will either overstimulate or kill the kill. About two hundred pounds per acre, well distributed, is the usual prescription for the good of the plants. Wireworms can probably be killed with carbon bisulfide, 
using a tablespoonful, poured into holes about a foot deep, three or four feet apart. The vapor would permeate the soil and kill all ground insects, but the acre cost of such treatment must be measured in its relation to the value of the crop. The most promising policy with wireworms is rotation of crops. Starving them out with a grain or grass crop, and not growing such crops as you mention continually on the same land. Bean Weevil How can I keep certain insects from getting into my dry beans? I have finished picking the crop. Every year a little short, stubby beetle gets in them before spring and makes them unfit for use. You have to do with the bean weevil. The eggs are inserted by the insect while the beans are still green in the pods. Subsequently, the eggs hatch and the worm excavates the interior of the ripened beans. The beans can be protected after ripening by heating carefully to 130 degrees Fahrenheit which will destroy the egg or the larva if already hatched. Of course, this heating must be done cautiously and with the aid of a good thermometer for fear of destroying the germinating power. The work of the insect can also be stopped by putting the beans in a barrel or other close receptacle with a saucer containing about an ounce of carbon bisulfate to vaporize. Be careful not to approach the vapor with a light. After treatment for one half hour, the cover can be removed and the vapor will entirely dissipate. This is a safer treatment than the heating. Similar methods of control can be used on other pea and bean weevils. Slugs in Garden Can you advise me how I can get rid of slugs in my garden? When barriers of lime, ashes, etc. are ineffective, traps consisting of pieces of board, sacking, and similar materials placed about the field prove inviting to the slugs. They collect under these and by going over the field in the early morning, they may be put into a salt water solution or otherwise destroyed. Arsenical sprays applied with an underspray nozzle to the lower surface of the leaves will help control the slugs. Poison bran mash consisting of 16 pounds of coarse bran, 2 quarts of cheap syrup, and enough warm water to make a coarse mash is very good for cutworms and should be equally effective for slugs. It should be placed in small heaps about the plants to be protected. Cabbage leaves dipped in greasy drippings and placed about the fields also prove attractive baits for the slugs, which may then be collected there. If a person has a taste for poultry, the keeping of a few ducks may solve the slug problem without further bother. Cultivation or irrigation methods that give a dry surface most of the time also discourage these pests. Cause of Mottle Leaf What is the cause and cure of mottle leaf of citrus trees? There are apparently a number of causes of this trouble, all more or less obscure and hard to overcome. It is generally thought that it is due to poor nutrition, whatever the reason for poor nutrition might be. The presence of a nematode or heel worm on the roots 
has found to be a cause of mottle leaf in many cases. Poor drainage, too sandy soil, and a number of other things frequently cause it. Whatever the cause, no one good method of cure has been found. Potato Scab I think most of my potatoes will have some scab. Will you please tell me if my next crop would be apt to have scab, provided I got good clean seed and planted it in the same ground? It seems demonstrated that a treatment of the seed will practically ensure against potato scab. One method is dipping the potatoes in a solution of corrosive sublimate. Dissolve one ounce in eight gallons of water and soak the seed potatoes in this solution for one and one half hours before cutting. Gopher Poison I have some alfalfa, some hogs and some gophers, also some strychnine and carrots. If I put the strychnine on the carrots and endeavor to poison the gophers, and the hogs get hold of the poison, will it kill them? You will find that hogs are liable to poison like any other animal, and the safest way to poison the gophers while the hogs are running in the field is to bury the poisoned carrots very deeply in the gopher hole, and then put a row of sticks or branches over the mouth of the hole, so that the hogs cannot root around and get at the poisoned carrots. How to Make Bordeaux Use copper sulphate, bluestone, five pounds, quick lime, good stone lime, six pounds, water, fifty gallons. Put the blue stone in a sack and hang it so it will be suspended just under the surface of a barrel of water overnight, or dissolve in hot water. Use one gallon of water to one pound of bluestone. Slake the lime in a separate barrel, using just enough water to make a smooth, clean, thin white wash. Steer this vigorously. Use wooden vessels only. Fill the spray tank half full of water. Add one gallon of bluestone solution for each pound required. Then strain in the lime and the remainder of the water and steer thoroughly. The formula may be varied according to conditions, using from three to eight pounds of blue stone to fifty gallons of water and an equal or slight excess of lime. Use the stronger mixture in rainy weather. Keep the mixture constantly agitated while applying. Formula for Lime Sulphur To make lime sulphur, take quick lime, 20 pounds, ground sulphur, 50 pounds, and water, 30 gallons. Slake the lime with hot water in a large kettle. Add the sulphur and steer well together. After the violent slaking subsides, add more water and boil the mixture over a fire for at least one hour. After boiling sufficiently strain into the spray tank and dilute with water to the proper strength. If a steam boiler is available, this mixture may be prepared more easily on a large scale by cooking in barrels into which steam pipes are introduced. This mixture cannot be applied safely except during the winter when the trees are dormant. 
a large proportion of the lime sulphur used in the state is purchased already prepared in more concentrated form. End of 1,000 Questions in California Agriculture Answered by E. G. Wixon Part 9 Pests and Diseases of Plants Recording by Sandra Luna A Comprehensive Dictionary of English Synonyms by William Carpenter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anne Boulay. Comprehensive Dictionary of English Synonyms by William Carpenter. The A's to abandon, forsake, desert, renounce, relinquish, resign, give up, abdicate, quit, forego. Abandon, profligate, corrupt, vitiated, depraved, reprobate, vicious, wicked. Abandonment, neglect, dereliction, desertion, apostasy. To abase, degrade, bring low, humble, disgrace, cast down. Abasement, humiliation, degradation, fall, meanness, servility. To abash, confuse, confound, disconcert, shame. To abate, diminish, reduce, decrease, lessen, lower, subside. Abeisance, dormancy, quiescence, expectation. To abbreviate, contract, curtail, shorten, abridge, compress, condense, reduce, epitomize. To abdicate, abandon, forsake, resign, renounce, give up. To abet, aid, assist, encourage, help, incite. A better, assistant, accessory, ally, accomplice, encourager. To abhor, detest, abominate, loathe, hate. Abhorrence, hatred, aversion, detestation. Abhorrent, odious, loathsome, hateful, abominable, revolting, detestable. To abide, dwell, remain, live, reside, keep firm to, wait. Abiding, durable, lasting, permanent, continuing, constant. Ability, capacity, faculty, talent, capability, aptness, aptitude, skill, efficiency, dexterity, address. Abject, low, mean, base, despicable, worthless, servile, vile. To abjure, forswear, recant, recall, revoke, retract, renounce. Able, competent, capable, efficient, clever, skillful, fitted, qualified, strong, powerful, effective. Ablution, washing, cleansing, purifying. To abnegate, deny, see abjure. Abnegation, denial, renunciation. Abnormal, out of order, out of rule, irregular, unnatural. Abode, residence, dwelling, habitation, domicile, home. To abolish, abrogate, annul, repeal, cancel, revoke, destroy, annihilate, put an end to. Abominable, detestable, odious, hateful. To abominate, abhor, detest, loathe, hate extremely. Abortive, fruitless, ineffectual, idle, 
vain, futile, nugative, to abound, luxuriate, exuberate, be plentiful, above, over, upon, beyond, more than, abrasion, rubbing off, detrition, attrition, to abridge, abbreviate, curtail, shorten, reduce, compress, contract, condense, epitomize, abridgment, compendium, epitome, digest, summary, abrogate, repeal, annul, set aside, abrupt, rugged, rough, sudden, broken off, unconnected, to abscond, steal away, run off, hide oneself, conceal, absent, away from, not present, distracted, inattentive, absolute, unqualified, unrestricted, positive, peremptory, arbitrary, despotic, tyrannical, unconditional, absolutely, completely, unrestrictedly, preemptorily, absolutism, despotism, autocracy, tyranny, absolution, acquittal, forgiveness, remission of sins, to absolve, clear, acquit, set free, remit, pardon, forgive, to absorb, swallow up, imbibe, engulf, engross, merge, to abstain, refrain, forbear, withhold, abstentious, abstentant, temperate, sober, moderate, abstergent, abstersive, cleansing, purgative, abstinence, forbearance, temperance, fasting, abstract, epitome, compendium, summary, digest, to abstract, disunite, take from, abstracted, absent in mind, separated, refined, abstraction, inattention, alienation, estrangement, obstrusive, profound, hidden, recontrite, difficult, absurd, foolish, irrational, ridiculous, preposterous, inconsistent, unreasonable, absurdity, folly, irrationality, inconsistency, abundance, sufficiency, plenty, competency, abundant, ample, copious, exuberant, plentiful, rich, abuse, misuse, reproach, censure, corrupt practice, to abuse, reproach, vilify, revile, deceive, misuse, abusive, reproachful, scurious, opprobrious, insolent, insulting, offensive, academy, school, college, learned institution, literary society, to accede, assent, consent, comply, agree, acquiesce, yield, to accelerate, hasten, quicken, expedite, increase, accent, intonation, tone, pronunciation, accentuation, the placing accents, the stress laid, to accept, take, receive, admit, acceptable, agreeable, grateful, welcome, delightful, acceptation, signification, meaning, reception, access, approach, admittance, admission, accessory, accomplice, assistant, a better, ally, associate, accession, coming to, addition, augmentation, increase, accident, casualty, contingency, incident, adventure, occurrence, chance, fortuity, accidental, casual, fortuitous, contingent, non-essential, acclamation, applause, plaudit, exultation, shouting, acclivity, 
ascent rising slope descent declivity to accommodate adapt adjust suit fit serve to accompany attend escort join wait on accompanying concomitant attendant going with accomplice a better accessory assistant ally associate to accomplish fulfill realize effect achieve complete execute perform accomplishment achievement feat deed acquirement qualification embellishment to accord agree harmonize tally grant admit allow accordance agreement harmony unison melody accordant consonant consistent willing consenting concurring agreeing corresponding to accost salute address greet hail account narrative description relation recital detail explanation narration reckoning bill esteem to account estimate reckon compute calculate esteem accountable amenable responsible punishable liable to accoutre dress equip arm furnish accoutrement dress equipage trappings ornaments accredited authorized empowered commissioned to accrue arise from be added to to accumulate amass collect gather heap up hoard accumulation pile mass congeries collection hoard accurate correct exact precise nice punctual accusation charge impeachment indictment to accuse charge impeach censure arraign calumniate defame detract slander to accustom habituate inure use familiarize acerbity sourness sharpness acrimony to achieve accomplish fulfill effect complete gain win achievement feat exploit deed accomplishment acquirement attainment performance acid sour tart sharp to the taste acrimonious to acknowledge avow confess own grant admit acknowledgement the art of owning concession confession acme climax height critical state to acquaint inform make known disclose communicate acquaintance familiarity intimacy fellowship friend to acquiesce accede assent consent comply agree yield to acquire obtain attain gain procure win earn acquirement acquisition qualification attainment to acquit set free clear absolve pardon forgive acquittance discharge receipt voucher acrimony asperity harshness smartness tartness acrimonious sharp sour acrid bitter stinging pungent to act do operate play perform and act action gesture gesticulation posture attitude deed feat exploit battle engagement active agile 
assiduous, alert, busy, brisk, nimble, quick, sprightly, prompt, industrious, laborious. Actor, doer, performer, player. Actual, real, positive, certain, genuine. To actuate, move, impel, induce, instigate. Acumen, sharpness, quickness, brilliancy, point. Acute, keen, shrewd, penetrating, piercing, sharp, pointed. Acuteness, penetration, ingenuity, acumen. Adage, maxim, aphorism, apothem, proverb, saying. To adapt, accommodate, adjust, suit, fit, conform. Addicted, given to, attached. Addition, accession, augmentation, increase. Additional, supplementary, superadded. Address, ability, dexterity, tact. Speech, harangue, oration. Direction, superscription. To address, speak to, accost, salute. To adduce, bring forward, advance, allege. Cite, quote. Adept, proficient, skilled, well-versed, clever. Adequate, proportionate, commensurate, equal to, suitable. To adhere, attach, stick, hold, cleave, fix, fasten. Adherent, follower, disciple, partisan, united with. Adherence, adhesion, attachment, fidelity. Adhesive, sticking, tenacious. Adieu, farewell, leave-taking, goodbye. Adjacent, adjoining, lying near, continuous, bordering upon, neighboring, approximating. To adjourn, prorogue, postpone, delay, defer. To adjudicate, adjudge, award. To adjure, beseech, conjure, entreat, implore. To adjust, accommodate, adapt, set right, suit, fit, settle. To administer, contribute, supply, serve, manage, direct. Administration, government, cabinet, the governing body. Admirable, wonderful, surprising, astonishing, striking. Admiration, amazement, astonishment, wonder, surprise. Admission, admittance, access, approach, entrance. To admit, let in, allow, concede, permit, suffer, tolerate, grant. To admonish, warn, reprove, caution, advise. Adolescence, youth, juvenility, the state of growing. To adopt, appropriate, take, choose. To adore, reverence, venerate, worship. To adorn, decorate, embellish, beautify, dress. Adroit, clever, skillful, dexterous, expert, active. Adroitness, dexterity, readiness, activity. Adulation, flattery, obsequiousness, high compliment. Adulator, parasite, sycophant, flatterer. To adulterate, corrupt, contaminate, defile, vitiate. To advance, bring forward, assign, adduce, allege, proceed, go forward, make progress. Advancement, progress, improvement, proficiency. Advantage, good, benefit, profit, superiority, utility, service advantageous, profitable, beneficial, salutary. Advent, coming, approach, the season before Christmas. 
adventure occurrence incident contingency casualty event accident hazard to adventure risk hazard go into danger adventurous bold enterprising rash foolhardy dangerous adversary antagonist opponent enemy foe adverse contrary opposite inimical repugnant opposed to unfavorable adversity affliction calamity sorrow misfortune misery to advert regard observe turn to touch on advertency attention to regard to to advertise announce give notice publish advice counsel instruction information notice intelligence deliberation consultation to advise acquaint inform notify apprise admonish counsel ask advice deliberate consult advisedly deliberately purposely prudently intentionally aerial light volatile belonging to the air aesthetic relating to taste feeling beauty affability easiness of manners courteousness urbanity courtesy politeness civility affable easy of manners courteous conciliating gentle affair business concern matter to affect influence act upon concern assume pretend to arrogate feign affectedness conceit vanity affecting pathetic touching moving affection attachment kindness fondness love feeling affectionate warm zealous fond tender kind affiance marriage contract trust confidence affianced betrothed engaged in marriage affidavit declaration or statement upon oath affirmation affinity alliance union kindred relationship by marriage to affirm assert declare assure asseverate aver protest pronounce ratify affirmation protestation asseveration declaration to affix attach subjoin connect annex to afflict distress trouble pain grieve affliction grief sorrow calamity tribulation afflicting afflictive painful grievous calamitous affluence wealth riches opulence plenty abundance affluent abundant exuberant wealthy to afford give impart yield produce bestow grant spare affray fray quarrel brawl feud altercation contention discord wrangle contest strife to affright frighten terrify appall dismay shock affront insult offense outrage afraid fearful timid timorous apprehensive afresh anew again recently age time period generation date era epoch century aged elderly old senile agency action operation management agenda notes memoranda things to be done agent substitute deputy factor to aggrandize make great enlarge exalt promote to aggravate provoke irritate exasperate tantalize 
heighten, raise, make worse. Aggregate, total, entire, integral, whole. Aggression, assault, injury, offense, encroachment. Aggressive, attacking, assailing. Aggressor, assaulter, invader, assailant. To aggrieve, vex, annoy, wrong, give pain, oppress. Agile, active, alert, brisk, vigorous, nimble, ready, lively, quick, sprightly, prompt. Agility, nimbleness, quickness, activity, promptitude. To agitate, shake, disturb, toss, move, convulse. Agitation, disturbance, emotion, trepidation, tremor. To agonize, torture, rack, excruciate, distress. Agony, anguish, pain, distress, pang, suffering. To agree, accede, assent, consent, comply, acquiesce, concur, coincide, harmonize. Agreeable, pleasant, grateful, conformable, suitable. Agreement, concord, concurrence, compact, contract, bargain, covenant. Accordance, harmony, unison. Agriculture, tillage, culture, husbandry. Aground, on the ground, stranded, hindered. Aid, support, succor, help, assistance, cooperation. To aid, assist, help, relieve, succor, support. Ailing, unwell, indisposed, ill, diseased, sickly. Aim, end, object, view, purpose, drift, scope, design, tendency. To aim, point, level, endeavor, aspire. Aimless, without aim, objectless, purposeless. Air, look, manner, mean, aspect, appearance. Alacrity, cheerfulness, sprightliness, gaiety. Alarm, terror, fright, affright, consternation, disquietude. Alarming, terrifying, awakening, surprising. Alert, active, agile, assiduous, brisk, vigorous, nimble, lively, quick, prompt, sprightly, industrious, watchful, vigilant. Algid, chill, cool, frigid. Algidity, coldness, frigidity. Alien, stranger, foreigner, opposed to, averse from. To alienate, estrange, withdraw, transfer. To alight, come down, descend, dismount. Alike, similar, uniform, resembling, in the same manner. Aliment, nourishment, nutriment, food. Alive, active, cheerful, sprightly. To allay, appease, pacify, assuage, soothe, compose, calm, tranquilize, mitigate, repress. To allege, adduce, advance, assign, declare, affirm. Allegiance, fealty, loyalty, obedience to a ruler. To alleviate, make light, mitigate, relieve, abate, diminish. Alliance, affinity, connection, confederacy, league, coalition, combination. To allot, assign, apportion, appoint, distribute. To allow, concede, permit, sanction, suffer, grant, give. Allowance, grant, stipend, pay, wages, salary, permission, concession, sanction, license, all-powerful, omnipotent, almighty, to elude, hint, refer, glance at, suggest, intimate, to allure, 
attract, decoy, entice, tempt, seduce. Allurement, enticement, temptation. Allusion, hint, implication, reference. Ally, associate, accomplice, accessory, assistant. Alms, donation, relief to the poor, benefaction. Alone, solitary, single, only. To alter, change, bury, modify. Alteration, change, modify, variation. To altercate, contend, expostulate, remonstrate, quarrel, dispute. Altercation, dispute, affray, quarrel, feud, contention, brawl. Alternate, mutual, reciprocal, every other, by turns. Altitude, elevation, height. Always, constantly, continually, incessantly, perpetually. Amain, with force, violently. To amalgamate, mix, compound, commingle. To amass, accumulate, collect, gather, pile up, heap up, hoard. Amazement, wonder, surprise, astonishment, admiration. Amazing, marvelous, wondrous, stupendous. Ambassador, envoy, plentipotentiary, deputy, diplomatist. Ambiguous, equivocal, indistinct, doubtful. To ameliorate, make better, improve, amend, reform. Amenable, accountable, answerable, responsible. To amend, correct, better, improve, reform, rectify. Amends, restitution, reparation, compensation, atonement. Amiable, lovely, charming, delightful, pleasing, engaging. Amicable, friendly, kind, conciliatory, social. Amity, friendship, sociability, kindness. Amorous, loving, fond, affectionate. Amphitheater, circus, round or oval building. Ample, spacious, capacious, abundant, plenteous, full, wide, copious, liberal. To amplify, enlarge, extend, expand. Amplification, extension, development, expansion, enlargement. Amplitude, expanse, extent, largeness. To amputate, cut off, sever, dismember, separate. Amuse, entertain, divert, beguile. Amusement, diversion, sport, recreation, pastime. To analyze, separate, decompose, resolve. Anarchy, disorder, confusion, misrule. Anathema, malediction, curse, ban. To anathematize, denounce, curse. Ancestor, progenitor, forefather, predecessor. Ancestral, hereditary, inherited. Anchorite, hermit, recluse, eremite, ascetic. Ancient, old, antique, antiquated, old-fashioned, obsolete. Ancillary, waiting on, conducive, subservient, auxiliary. Anecdote, story, tale, memoir, incident, occurrence. Anger, ire, wrath, resentment, indignation, disapprobation, displeasure, passion, rage, fury. To anger, irritate, aggravate, enrage, incite, stimulate, chafe, exasperate, inflame, vex, provoke. Angry, erasable, passionate, hasty, hot, wrathful, indignant, irritated, enraged, incensed, 
provoked, touchy. Anguish, pain, agony, distress, suffering, woe. Anility, dotage, weakness, imbecility. Anima diversion, criticism, stricture, censure. To animate, give life to, inspire, exhilarate, enliven, incite, impel, instigate, urge, cheer animated, vivacious, lively, sprightly, spirited, buoyant, animating, exhilarating, inspiring, exciting, encouraging, animation, life, vivacity, spirits, buoyancy, animosity, enmity, hostility, malignity, virulence, annals, Chronicles, memoirs, archives, records, registers. Analyst, historian, chronicler. To annex, affix, attach, subjoin. To annihilate, destroy, annul, extinguish, raise. Annotation, comment, note, observation, remark, explication, elucidation. To announce, advertise, proclaim, publish, report, notify. To annoy, molest, incommode, vex, tease. Annoyance, trouble, discomfort, uneasiness. Annually, yearly, returning every year. To annul, abolish, abrogate, repeal, cancel, revoke, destroy, annihilate, nullify. Annular, round, circular, like a ring. Anomalous, irregular, singular, uncommon, abnormal. Answer, reply, rejoiner, response, replication. To answer, reply, suit, guarantee, warrant, secure, answerable, responsible, accountable, amenable, suitable, correspondent, antagonism, opposition, hostility, antagonist, adversary, opponent, enemy, foe, antagonistic, adverse, hostile, contrary, repugnant, antecedent, anterior, Previous, prior, former, foregoing, preceding, preliminary. Antipast, anticipation, foretaste. Anthem, hymn, sacred song. To anticipate, take before, precede, prejudge, forestall. Antipathy, aversion, dislike, hatred, repugnance, opposition. Antique, old, ancient, antiquated, old-fashioned, obsolete. Anxiety, anxiousness, care, solicitude, perplexity, uneasiness, caution, attention, eagerness. Apace, swiftly, quickly, rapidly. Apartment, chamber, room, hall. Apathetic, insensitive impassive, indifferent, without feeling. Apathy, indifference, insensibility, want of feeling. To ape, imitate, mimic, mock. Aperture, opening, cavity, gape, hollow, chasm. Aphorism, apothem, adage, maxim, proverb, saying, instructive remark. Apocryphal, hidden, of uncertain authority, legendary. Apology, excuse, defense, explanation. To apologize, defend, justify, exculpate, plead. Apostasy, defection, renunciation, falling away. To appall, dismay, terrify, daunt, 
frighten. Apparatus. Tools. Instruments. Furniture. Apparel. Attire. Array. Dress. Clothing. Covering. Garment. Apparent. Visible. Obvious. Distinct. Plain. Evident. Manifest. Clear. Palpable. Self-evident. Apparently. Ostensibly. Evidently. Openly. Apparition. Ghost. Specter. Phantom. To appeal. Refer. Call upon. Invoke. To appear. Look. Seem. Appearance. Air. Look. Manner. Mean. Aspect. Phenomenon. Semblance. Probability. Speciousness. Plausibility. To appease. Pacify. Allay. Assuage. Tranquilize. Soothe. Calm. Compose. Propitiate. Quiet. Conciliate. Appellation. Name. Denomination. Title. Cognomen. To appertain. Belong. Be a part of. Or property of. To applaud. Commend. Praise. Extol. Approve. Applause. Acclamation. Clapping. Exultation. Shouting. Application. Intenseness of thought. Attention. Request. Petition. The act of applying. The thing applied. To apply. Devote. Addict. Address. Refer to. To appoint. Allot. Ordain. Depute. Order. Prescribe. Constitute. Fix. Provide. Settle. To apportion. Allot. Assign. Distribute. Appropriate. Apposite. Proper. Fit. Adapted. Suitable. To appreciate. Estimate. Note. Value. Esteem. Prize. To apprehend. Take. Seize. Catch. Hold. Conceive. Imagine. Anticipate. Fear. Dread. To apprise. Acquaint, inform, disclose, communicate. Approach, access, admittance, admission, advent. To approach, approximate, come near. Approbation, approval, concurrence, consent, assent. Appropriate, peculiar, particular, exclusive. To appropriate, assume, Arrogate, usurp, set apart. Approval, concurrence, approbation, consent. Appurtenance, adjunct, appendage. Apt, ready, fit, meet, prompt, suitable, dexterous, quick. Arbiter, arbitrator, judge, umpire. Arbitrament, will, determination, choice. Arbitrary, preemptory, imperious, domineering, tyrannical, absolute, despotic, optional, capricious. Arch, sportive, frolicsome, waggish, merry. Arched, concave, vaulted. Archetype, original pattern, model. Architect, designer, planner, builder, contriver. Archives, annals, records, chronicles, registers. Ardent, vehement, hot, eager, passionate, fervent, intense. Arduous, hard, difficult, laborious, Herculean. To argue, dispute, discuss, debate, expostulate, remonstrate. Argument, reason, proof. Dispute, controversy, aridity, dryness, sterility, barrenness, unfruitfulness. To arise, rise, mount, ascend, get up. To arm, equip, 
accoutre, provide. Armistice, truce, temporary cessation of arms. Army, host, force, number of soldiers. Aromatic, spicy, fragrant, scented. To arouse, awaken, stir up, excite. To arraign, accuse, charge, impeach, censure, criminate. To arrange, place in order, dispose, regulate, organize. Errant, flagrant, heinous, notorious, infamous, vile. Array, apparel, attire, show, exhibition, order, rank. To array, embattle, marshal, draw up, range, deck, clothe. Arrear, money due, but not paid. To arrest, seize, withhold, hinder, stop, apprehend. To arrive, reach, attain, gain. Arrogance, assumption, haughtiness, presumption, usurpation, pride, loftiness, hotter. Arrogant, haughty, supercilious, proud, overweening. To arrogate, usurp, assume, claim. Art, cunning, deceit, duplicity. Skill, aptitude, contrivance, expertness, dexterity. Artful, artificial, fictitious, cunning, crafty, sly, subtle. To articulate, speak, utter, pronounce, express. Article, condition, term, covenant, particular. Artifice, trick, finesse, stratagem, deception, cheat, deceit, imposture, delusion, fraud, guile, imposition. Artificer, artist, contriver, workman, operative. Artillery, cannon, ordnance, weapons of war. Artless, ingenuous, candid, open, frank, plain, fair, honest, unskillful, guileless, unsophisticated. To ascend, arise, rise, mount, soar, scale, climb. Ascendant, elevation, height, supremacy. Ascendancy, influence, authority, sway, predominance. Ascetic, hermit, recluse, anchorite. To ascribe, attribute, impute, charge upon. Ascribable, imputable, attributable. Ashamed, bashful, downcast, abashed, disconcerted. To ask, request, solicit, entreat, beg, claim, demand, inquire, question, invite. Aspect, appearance, air, look, mean, view. Asperity, acrimony, harshness, smartness, tartness, roughness, pungency, poignancy. To asperse, accuse falsely, calumniate, defame, detract, scandalize, slander, vilify, disparage. Aspersion, detraction, defamation, calumny, sprinkling. Aspirant, competitor, candidate. Aspiration, eager wish, strong desire. To assail, assault, attack, encounter. Assailant, aggressor, assaulter. To assassinate, kill, murder, slay. Assault, encounter, attack, onset. Assemblage, assembly, collection, group, company, congress, diet, meeting, convocation, council, audience. To assemble, collect, muster, convene, convoke, gather. To assent, 
consent, concur, approve, acquiesce. To assert, affirm, declare, asseverate, aver, protest, pronounce, maintain, vindicate. Assertion, affirmation, declaration. Assessment, tax, rate, impost. To asservate, assert, declare solemnly, avouch, affirm, aver, protest. Assiduous, vigorous, active, brisk, industrious, indefatigable, unremitting, alert. To assign, adduce, allege, advance, allot, appropriate. To assist, aid, help, relieve, succor, cooperate. Assistant, associate, helper, companion, ally, confederate, coadjutor, partner, comrade. To associate, join, unite, fraternize. Association, combination, company, assembly, partnership, union, society. To assort, place, arrange, classify. To assuage, allay, soothe, appease, calm, tranquilize, pacify, mitigate, conciliate, compose. To assume, take for granted, arrogate, usurp, affect, claim. Assuming, presumptuous, forward, haughty, arrogant. Assumption, arrogance, taking for granted, a thing supposed. Assurance, confidence, persuasion, impudence, effrontery. To assure, affirm, assert, asseverate, aver, protest, vouch. Astonishment, amazement, wonder, surprise, admiration. Astral, starry, stellar, sidereal. Astrictive, astringent, binding, styptic, strengthening. Astute, arch, cunning, penetrating, wily, crafty, artful. Astuteness, cunning, artfulness, penetration. Asunder, apart, separately. Asylum, refuge, retreat, shelter, hospital. Athletic, active, robust, belonging to a wrestler. Athwart, across, transverse, through. Atone, attune, make one, reconcile, satisfy. Atonement, satisfaction, reconciliation, appeasement. Atrocious, flagrant, flagitious, heinous, notorious, inhuman. Atrocity, enormity, heinousness. Atrophy, wasting away, decay, want of nourishment. To attach, affix, subjoin, connect, annex, adhere, stick, win, hold, gain, arrest. Attachment, affection, inclination, fondness, love, devotion, endearment, faithfulness, regard. Attack, assault, onset, aggression. To attack, assail, fall upon, encounter, impugn. To attain, reach, arrive, acquire, obtain, gain, procure, get. Attainment, qualification, acquirement, acquisition. Attaint, charge, try, disgrace, condemn. Attempt, effort, essay, trial, enterprise, undertaking. To attempt, try, endeavor, essay, undertake. To attend, accompany, escort, wait on, mind, heed, regard, hearken, listen. Attendant, accompanying, concomitant, waiter, servant. Attention, heed, care, application, study. Attentive,
careful, mindful, intent. To attest, witness, prove, certify. Attire, clothes, dress, array, apparel, garments, vestments. Attitude, posture, gesture, action, gesticulation. To attract, draw, allure, entice, invite, charm. Attractions, charms, allurements, fascination. Attractive, winning, fascinating, charming, captivating. Attribute, quality, property. To attribute, ascribe, impute, give as due. Audacity, boldness, effrontery, hardihood. Audience, act of hearing, liberty of speaking, auditory. Auditory, audience, people, assembly, place for lectures. To augment, enlarge, increase, extend, grow larger. Augmentation, accession, addition, increase, reinforcement. To augur, forebode, betoken, presage, portend, guess. August, majestic, dignified, stately, inspiring awe. Auspicious, favorable, propitious, promising, happy. Austere, rigid, severe, stern, harsh, uncompromising. Authenticity, authority, genuineness. Authoritative, commanding, imperative, imperious. Authority, ascendancy, sway, influence, dominion, force, legal power, testimony. To authorize, empower, direct, instruct, commission. Authorized, commissioned, empowered. Autocracy, absolute government, uncontrolled power. Auxiliary, helping, assisting, subservient. Avail, advantage, use, benefit, utility, service, profit. Available, profitable, advantageous, useful. Avarice, covetousness, cupidity, desire of money. To avenge, revenge, vindicate, take satisfaction. Avenger, punisher, revenger. To aver, affirm, assert, declare, assure, asserviate, protest. Averse, adverse, backward, loath, reluctant, unwilling, repugnant, hostile, unfavorable. Aversion, antipathy, dislike, repugnance, hatred, distaste. Avidity, eagerness, greediness, rapacity. Avocation, business, employment, engagement, office, trade, profession, occupation, vocation, a calling aside. To avoid, shun, elude, askew, escape. To avow, acknowledge, own, confess, recognize, declare. Avowal, confession, declaration. Avowedly, confessedly, openly. To awaken, arouse, stir up, excite, provoke, incite. To award, adjudicate, adjudge, determine, assign. Aware, apprised, on one's guard, conscious, vigilant, sensible. Awe, reverence, dread, fear. Awful, solemn, dreadful, timorous. Awkward, clumsy, uncouth, untoward, bungling. Awry, crooked, bent, oblique, twisted on one side. Axiom, self-evident truth, maxim, aphorism, saying. Axis, the line between the poles on which the earth revolves. Azure, blue, seraline. End of A Comprehensive Dictionary of English Synonyms by William Carpenter